Insurance Tax Proposal. Mr. President, um, as I think uh, everyone knows, uh, the President of the United States, President Obama, and the Republican leadership have reached an agreement on a very significant tax bill. Uh, in my view, uh, the agreement that they reached is a bad deal for the American people. I think we can do better. And I am here today to take a strong stand against this bill. And I intend to tell my colleagues and the nation exactly what, why I am in opposition to this bill. And you can call what I'm doing today whatever you want. You can call it a filibuster. You can call it a very long speech. I'm not here to set any great records uh, or to, to make a spectacle. I am simply here today to take as long as I can to explain to the American people the fact that we have got to do a lot better than this, this agreement uh, provides. Now let me just enumerate some of the reasons that I am opposed to this agreement. First, as everybody knows, this nation has a record-breaking $13.8 trillion national debt at the same time as the middle class is collapsing and poverty is increasing. And Mr. President, I think it's important that we say a word, because I'm not sure that a lot of Americans necessarily know this, about how we got to where we are today in terms of the national debt. I know there are some people who think that this all began the day that President Obama took office. Well, it's not quite the case. When President Clinton left office, this country was running, in fact, a very significant surplus, and the projections were that we were going to continue to run a surplus. During the eight years of President Bush, for a number of reasons, including the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, including huge tax breaks for the wealthiest people in this country, including a Medicare Part D prescription drug program, and including the Wall Street bailout, among other things, all of which were not paid for. Those are the primary reasons that we saw an almost doubling of the national debt during the Bush administration. And since President Obama has been in office, we have passed a stimulus package, also adding to the deficit in national debt. But here we are today with a $13.8 trillion national debt, $1.4 trillion deficit, and almost all Americans are in agreement that this is a very serious issue. So the first point that I would make is that it seems to me to be unconscionable, unconscionable for my conservative friends and for everybody else in this country to be driving up this already too high national debt by giving tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires who don't need it and in a number of cases, Mr. President, don't even want it. Here's one of the interesting ironies. There are lists of many, many very wealthy people who come forward and say, sure, I want a tax break, everybody wants a tax break, but you know what? There are other priorities in this country, I don't need it. And two of the wealthiest people in the world, uh, Bill Gates of Microsoft, Warren Buffett, Berkshire, these are billionaires, and they said it's absurd. We don't need a tax break. And all over the country, you're hearing a lot of folks who have a lot of money saying, don't drive up the deficit and force our kids to pay higher taxes to pay off the national debt in order to give tax breaks to the richest people in this country. Now, Mr. President, we have been told really not to worry too much because the extension <clears throat> of these tax breaks for the wealthy will only last two years. Not to worry. Well, maybe that's the case. Uh, but given the political reality 
that I have seen in Washington, my guess is that two years from now, these tax breaks for the wealthiest people in this country <clears throat> will be extended again. What happens around here is that the argument will be made that if you end these tax breaks, you're raising taxes. It's what we're hearing right now. I see no reason why in the middle of a presidential election those arguments will not be made again. And I see no reason not to believe that those tax breaks will be extended again. And clearly we have a number of Republicans who want to make that extension permanent. Now, whether it will ever be made permanent or not, I don't know. But the point is, when you hear folks say that it's only a two-year extension, I would suggest take that with a grain of salt. And let me just say that if, in fact, we do what the Republicans have wanted to do right now as we enter this debate, they wanted a 10-year extension, that would add $700 billion to our national debt, $700 billion. Now, I've got four kids, and I've got six grandchildren. And I think it is grossly unfair. None of them have a whole lot of money. I think it is grossly unfair to ask my kids and grandchildren and the children all over this country to be paying higher taxes in order to provide tax breaks for billionaires because we've driven up the national debt. That is just plain wrong. And, Mr. President, I think the vast majority of the American people, whether they're progressives like myself or whether they're conservatives, I think they perceive that that concept of giving tax breaks to billionaires when we have such a high national debt makes no sense at all. Furthermore, Mr. President, it is important to point out that extending income tax breaks to the top 2% is not the only unfair tax proposal in this agreement. This agreement between the President and the Republican leadership also calls for a continuation of the Bush era 15 percent tax rate on capital gains and dividends, meaning that those people who make their living off their investments will continue to pay a substantially lower tax rate than firemen, teachers, nurses, carpenters, and virtually all the other working people of this country. And I just don't think that that's fair. That's wrong. And we are continuing, if this agreement were to be passed, that unfair arrangement. Mr. President, on top of all of that, this agreement includes a horrendous proposal regarding the estate tax. And that is a Teddy Roosevelt initiative. Teddy Roosevelt was talking about this in the early years of the 20th century. It was enacted in 1916. And it was enacted for a couple of reasons. Teddy Roosevelt and the people of that era thought it was wrong that a handful of people could have a huge concentration of wealth and then just give that wealth, transmit that wealth to their children. He didn't think that that was right. Uh, furthermore, it was a source, a progressive and fair source of revenue. Under the agreement struck between the Republican leadership and the President, the estate tax rate, which was 55 percent under President Clinton, and let's all remember, we had problems with the economy under President Clinton, but very few will deny that during those years we were creating a heck of a lot more jobs than we did under President Bush. That's the fact over 20 million jobs under President Clinton. We lost 600,000 private sector jobs under President Bush. During the Clinton era, the tax rate on the estate tax was 55 percent. What this arrangement would do is lower that tax rate to 35 percent <clears throat> with an exemption on the first $5 million of an individual's estate. 10 million for couples. Now, here's the important point, Mr. President, that I think many people don't know, because I have to confess, my Republican friends and their pollsters and their language people have done a very good job. This is the so-called death tax. And I think all over America, people are saying, oh, this is terrible. I have $50,000 in the bank, and I want to leave that to my kids. 
and, and, and the government is going to take 55% of that, 35% of that, what an outrage. So let us be very, very clear. This tax applies only, only, only to the top three-tenths of 1% of American families. 99.7% of American families will not pay one nickel in an estate tax. This is not a tax on the rich. This is a tax on the very, very, very rich. And if my Republican friends had been successful in doing what they want to do, which is eliminating this estate tax completely, it would have cost, Mr. President, our Treasury, raise the national debt by a trillion dollars over a 10-year period. Families like the Walton family of Walmart fame would have received as one family about a $30 billion tax break. So I find it hard to believe that when we are talking about massive cuts in programs for working families, when we have this huge national debt, that anybody would be agreeing to lowering the estate tax rate to 35 percent. That is what this agreement does, and I think that that is a very, very bad idea. And once again, while the agreement on the estate tax is for two years, once again, there is very little doubt in my mind that the Republicans will continue to push for lower and lower estate tax rates because what they want, and I think Senator Kyle has been pretty clear about this, they want to permanently repeal that tax. That is a trillion dollars in tax breaks to the top three-tenths of one percent. So I think we're down a bad path there, and that's another reason why this agreement does not make a whole lot of sense. Mr. President, I would say thirdly, and here's a very important point that I think has uh, not yet gotten the attention that it deserves, and that is this agreement contains a payroll tax holiday, which would cut $120 billion from Social Security payroll taxes for workers. And I think there are a lot of folks out there who say, well, this is pretty good. You know, I'm a worker. My contribution will go from 6.2 percent today down to 4.2 percent. I'll have more money in my paycheck. It's a good idea. But let's take a deep breath and let's think about it for a second. Let's understand what this whole thing is about. This payroll tax holiday concept, as I understand it, originally started with conservative Republicans. And I know the Vice President recently made the point this was originally a Republican idea. Now, why did the Republicans come up with this idea? Well, these are exactly the same people who don't believe in Social Security. These are the same people who either want to make significant cuts in Social Security or else they want to privatize Social Security entirely. And here's the point. They understand that if we divert funding, that is supposed to go into the Social Security Trust Fund, which is what this payroll tax holiday does. This is money that goes into the Social Security Trust Fund is now being diverted, cut back, in order to provide financial support for workers. But that is a lot of money not going into the Trust Fund. Now, what the President and others are saying, well, not to worry, because that money will be covered by the General Fund. That is a very, very bad and dangerous precedent, because up until now, what Social Security has been about is 100 percent funding from payroll contributions, not from the general tax base. Now, once again, this is a one-year program. The loss of revenue going into Social Security can be covered by the general fund. But we have a $13 trillion national debt. How much longer will the general fund put money into Social Security? Is it a good idea for the general fund to be doing that? So I would argue, uh, Mr. President, that uh, this is not a good idea. This is a very dangerous step forward for those of us who believe in Social Security. But this is not just Bernie Sanders saying this. Mr. President, one of the uh, more effective and, I think, important uh, senior groups in America is called the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. 
Uh, they have, I don't know exactly how many, but they have many, many members all over this country. I know they're active in the state of Vermont. And I want to read to you from a press release that they just sent out the other day. And this is the headline on it, from the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Cutting contributions to Social Security signals the beginning of the end. Payroll tax holiday is anything but. And this is what they say. This comes from now Barbara Kennelly. Barbara used to serve in the House of Representatives. I've known Barbara for years. She's now the President and CEO of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security, one of the strong senior groups in America. And this is what Barbara says, and I quote, even though Social Security contributed nothing to the current economic crisis, it has been bartered, bartered in a deal that provides deficit-busting tax cuts for the wealthy, diverting $120 billion in Social Security contributions for a so-called tax holiday may sound like a good deal for workers now, but it's bad business for the program that a majority of middle-class seniors will rely upon in the future. And that's what the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare says about that agreement, and I agree with them. So for all of us who understand that Social Security is life and death for tens of millions of Americans today and will be vitally important for working people as they reach retirement age, that we understand that Social Security has done a great job. You know, Mr. President, a few minutes ago you were on the floor talking about the strong work that our federal employees do, and you're absolutely right. Sometimes we also take for granted that Social Security has been an enormous success. It has done exactly what those people who created it wanted it to do. Nothing more, nothing less. It succeeded. It has taken millions and millions of seniors out of poverty, given them an element of security. It has also helped people with disabilities maintain their dis dignity. Widows and orphans are also getting help. For 75 years, it has worked well. It has a $2.6 trillion surplus today, and it can pay out benefits for the next 29 years. It is strong. We want to make it stronger. This payroll tax holiday, I'm afraid, is a step very much in the wrong direction, and that is one of the important reasons why this agreement between the President and the Republicans uh, should be defeated. Mr. President, uh, included in the agreement are a number of business tax cuts. And I'm not going to be here to say that some of them may not work. Some of them may work. Some of them will work better than others, the whole list of them. But this is what I will say. Economists on both ends of the political spectrum believe that if we are serious about addressing the horrendous economic crisis that we're in now, 9.8 percent unemployment, that there are far more effective ways of creating the jobs that we have to create than those tax proposals. With corporate America already sitting on close to $2 trillion cash on hand, it's not that our friends in corporate America don't have any money, we've got to help them. They've got $2, million, $2 trillion cash on hand. The problem is not, in my view, that corporate taxes are too high. It is that the middle class simply doesn't have the money to purchase the goods and products that make our economy go and create jobs. So I think that if our goal is to create the millions and millions of jobs that we need, and if our goal is to make our country stronger internationally in a, in a very tough global economy, I would much prefer it. I think most economists would agree with me that a better way to do that, to create the millions of jobs we've got to create, is to invest heavily in our infrastructure. Now, the truth is, and I don't think anyone disputes this, the infrastructure in the United States is crumbling. And I'll go into more detail about that later. Got some very good information on it. But, you know, you don't have to be uh, a, a, a civil engineer to know that. All you have to do is get in your car today and drive someplace, 
And in my state and all over this country, uh, what you are going to see are roads that are in disrepair. Uh, you are going to see bridges that in some cases have actually been shut down. Uh, you're going to see water systems. I remember, Mr. President, I was in Rutland, Vermont, the second or third largest city in the state of Vermont. And the mayor there showed me a piece of pipe. It's very funny. It's an old pipe. And he said, you know, the engineer who helped develop this water system and laid this pipe, he went off after he did this work for Rutland. He went off to fight in the war. And he, he knew there was, I knew there was a catch line coming. I said, well, what war was that? And he said it was the Civil War. So you're talking about water pipe being laid in Rutland, Vermont, and this is, it, it, this is true all over the United States, laid in the Civil War. And the result is we lose an enormous amount of clean water every day through leaks, water pipes bursting every day, all over the United States of America. Well, we can put people to work improving our water system, our wastewater plants, very expensive proposition to develop good wastewater plants. I was a mayor, you were a governor. It is an expensive proposition. Roads, bridges. Furthermore, Mr. President, I don't have to tell anybody here, our rail system, which used to be the greatest rail system in the world, is now falling way behind every other major country on Earth. Uh, in Vermont, as a result of the stimulus package, which did a whole lot of very good things in the state of Vermont, one of the things we're able to do is use $50 million of federal fund, private money, to make major repairs on one of our important railways uh, in, in the state. Uh, but we remain far behind most of the countries around the industrialized world. China is exploding in terms of the number of high-speed uh, rail lines that they have. Uh, we have got to do better. Our airports need work. Uh, our air controllers need to be updated in terms of the technology uh, they have, they use, to make our flights safe. And the point here is that what most economists would tell you is, A, when you invest in infrastructure, you create, you got a bigger bang for the buck, you create more jobs for your investment than in most instances giving a variety of tax breaks uh, to uh, the corporate world. And second of all, and not unimportantly, when you invest in infrastructure, you are improving the future of this country. You're making us more productive. It's not just creating jobs, it's creating jobs for a very specific purpose, which makes our nation more productive uh, and efficient. And thirdly, let me tell you something as a former mayor, um, infrastructure does not get better if you ignore it. You know, you can turn your back if you're a mayor or a governor on the roads and on the highways because you don't have the money to fill, fix them today, they ain't going to get better next year. At some point, they're going to have to be repaired and fixed, and we may as well do that right now. So I believe that the money, the very substantial sums of money in this agreement between the President and the Republicans, uh, which goes into uh, tax breaks for corporate America, could be much better spent, more effectively spent uh, on the uh, infrastructure. Point I want to make in opposition to this agreement is that um, what we have heard from the President and others is that, look, this is a compromise. You can't get everything you want. Well, you can't get everything what you want around here. That's true. But one of the examples of the compromise is uh, an extension of unemployment benefits for 13 months. Well, let me be very, very clear. In the midst of a serious and major recession, at a time when um, millions of our fellow Americans are not only out of work through no fault of their own, but they have been out of work for a very, very long time. It would be, in my view, immoral and wrong to turn our backs on uh, those workers. Uh, their unemployment uh, benefits are going to be running out soon, and it is absolutely imperative uh, that we extend those unemployment benefits for the two million workers who would lose them. But here's the point that I want to make, Mr. President. Some people say that this is a compromise. Well, the Republicans gave on unemployment, the President gave on extending tax breaks for the rich, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the point. I don't believe, honestly, 
that the Republican support now for extending unemployment benefits really constitutes much of a compromise. Because the truth of the matter is that for the past 40 years, past 40 years, under both Democratic and Republican administrations, under the leadership in the Senate and the House of Democrats or Republicans, it has been bipartisan policy that whenever the unemployment rate has been above 7.2 percent, unemployment insurance has always been extended. So what you have had is long-standing bipartisan policy. That's what we have always done. That is what we should be doing in the future. I do not regard that Republicans now supporting what their party has always supported, extending unemployment benefits when unemployment becomes very high. I don't see that as a, comp as a compromise. I see that as what has been going on in this country and in the Senate for four decades. Now, Mr. President, I've talked about the negative aspects of this proposal, but I am going to be the first to admit that, of course, there are positive and good agreements uh, in this. And what are they? What are some of the positive aspects of this agreement? Let me just tick them off. Uh, number one, I believe very strongly, and I know the President does, that it is absolutely imperative that we extend middle-class tax cuts for 98 percent of the American people. I don't think there's been any debate about that. When median family income has gone down by over $2,000 during the Bush years, when millions of our people today are working longer hours for low wages, when people can't afford to send their kids to college or, or take care of childcare, I think it makes absolute sense, and I don't think anyone denies that it is absolutely imperative that we extend middle-class tax cuts, and that's what this provision does, and that's the right thing. Furthermore, in this agreement, we have an extension of the earned income tax credit for working Americans, and the child and college tax credits are also in there. Every one of these agreements is very, very important. Uh, these programs will keep millions of Americans from slipping out of the middle class and into poverty, and they will allow millions of Americans to send their kids to college. So I'm not here to say that there is not anything of value in this agreement between the President and the Republicans. They are. And we have got to fight to make sure that all of those programs remain in the final package uh, when it is passed, when the final package is passed. But when we look at the overall agreement, we must put it in a broader context, and that is what will the passage of this legislation mean for the future of our country? And in that area, if you look at it in that context, I think the evidence is pretty strong that it is just not a good agreement and not something that should be passed. Mr. So President, passage of this agreement would mean that we would continue the Bush policy of trickle-down economics for at least two more years. And that is not a good thing to do, because I think, as most Americans know, that philosophy, that economic approach, simply did not work. The evidence is quite overwhelming. I don't think there's much debate. When median family income during Bush's eight years goes down by $2,200, when we end up losing over 600,000 private sector jobs, and all of the job growth was in the federal level, I don't see how anybody would want to continue that philosophy. But that, in essence, is what will happen if this agreement uh, is uh, passed. Now, I want to say another, make another point here about what happens if, if, and I will do my best to prevent this from happening, but what would happen if this agreement would pass? Does anybody seriously believe uh, that our Republican colleagues would then say, oh, okay, well, we've got an extension of tax breaks for the very richest people. We've lowered the tax rate on the estate tax. Those are good victories for millionaires and billionaires, and we're going to go home now. We're not going to continue the fight. I don't think so. I don't think so at all. And we're already hearing uh, soundings about where our Republican friends want to go. Uh, the President put together what I thought was a very poor 
uh, Deficit Reduction Commission. Uh, I thought that the folks on it were not reflective of the American people. I thought there was a very much big business, uh, corporate uh, partiality there. Uh, and the initiatives that came out of that commission, which fortunately did not get the 14 votes they needed, suggest to me that those of us who are concerned about protecting the needs of the middle class and working families, we are going to have to be pushing back pretty, pretty hard for what's coming down the pike. Uh, I think that what we will be seeing is that if this proposal negotiated between the President and the Republicans is passed, what you will be seeing within a few months are folks coming here on the floor of the Senate, and this is what they'll say. They'll say, you know what? Deficit is high, national debt is too high, and yes, oh yes, we drove the national debt up by giving tax breaks to billionaires, but that's the way it goes, but we're going to have to deal with that national debt. And then the Republicans will tell us we have a great way to deal with it. We've given tax breaks to billionaires, but now what we're going to have to do is start making deep cuts in Social Security. And that Deficit Reduction Commission started paving the way for that. Very substantial cuts in Social Security. Maybe we'll raise, have to raise the retirement age in Social Security to 69 or 70. Maybe we'll have to make cuts in Medicare. Maybe we'll have to make cuts in Medicaid, and I think we're beginning to see in the state of Arizona now what goes on when you make deep, deep cuts in Arizona, in, in Medicaid. In Arizona right now, there are people who are in line who need transplants, who will die if they don't get transplants. And in Arizona, as a result of legislation that they passed there, they're saying to people, young people, sorry, we can't afford to give you the transplant, and you're going to have to die. Well, is that what we're looking forward to seeing all over America? I certainly uh, will do everything I can uh, to prevent that. We're certainly going to see attacks on environmental protection, on education. Some of us believe that if this country is going to prosper, succeed in the global economy, we've got to have the best educational system in the world, from child care through college. Right now, it is extremely difficult for middle-class families to send their kids to college. Does anyone have any doubt whatsoever that our Republican friends are not going to come back here and say, oh, we can't afford to raise Pell Grants as we have in recent years. We can't afford to support working families who are having their kids in charge. Cut, 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 cut. That is in fairness to them. They've been pretty honest about it. So I would suggest, Mr. President, that if their argument is that we have a high deficit and a high national debt, that if we pass this agreement, and the national debt goes higher, it only gives them more impetus to go forward to cut programs that benefit working families uh, and the middle class. And let me also say that there is no doubt in my mind what many of, not all, but many of my Republican colleagues want to do. And that is they want to move this country back into the 1920s when essentially we had an economic and political system which was controlled by big money interests, uh, where working people in the middle class had no programs to sustain them when things got bad, when they got old, when they got sick, when labor unions were very hard to come by because of anti-worker legislation. And that's what they want. They don't believe in things like the Environmental Protection Agency, they don't believe in things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, federal aid to education. And that is the fight that we will be waging. And I think to surrender on this issue is simply to say that we're going to be waging fight after fight starting within a couple of months. Now, Mr. Mr. President, uh, President Obama has said that he fought as hard as he could against the Republican tax breaks for the wealthy and for an extension in unemployment? Well, maybe, but the reality is that that fight cannot simply be waged inside the Beltway. What our job is, is to appeal to the vast majority of the American people to stand up and to say, wait a minute, I don't want to see our national debt explode 
I don't want to see my kids and grandchildren paying higher taxes in order to give tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires. The vast majority of the American people do not support that agreement in terms of giving tax breaks to the very rich. And our job is to rally those people. And I would like very much to see the American people saying to our Republican colleagues, some Democratic colleagues, excuse me, don't force my kids to have a lower standard of living in order to give tax breaks to the richest people in this country. And what the President and all of us should be doing is going out and saying to those people, call up the members of the Senate, call up the members of the House and say, excuse me, how about representing the middle class and working families for a change rather than the wealthiest people in this country? That's what democracy is about. This fight is not going to be won inside the Beltway here in a Senate debate. It is going to be won when the American people stand up and say, wait a second. We cannot continue to give tax breaks to people who are doing phenomenally well right now. We can't give tax breaks to the rich when we already have the most unequal distribution of income of any major country on earth. Top 1% earns 23% of all income in America, more than the bottom 50%. They don't need more tax breaks to be paid for by our kids and our grandchildren. In my view, Mr. President, vast majority of people are behind us on this issue. But they have got to make their voices heard to their senators, to their congressmen. And when they do, I believe we can come forward with an agreement which protects the middle class and working families and not as a boondoggle uh, for the wealthiest people in this country. It is important to put the agreement that the President struck with the Republicans uh, in a broader context. You can't just look at an agreement uh, unto itself. You have to look at it within the context of what's going on in this country today, both economically and politically. And in my view, and I think I speak for millions and millions of Americans on this. Uh, there is a war going on in this country, and I'm not referring to the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan. I'm talking about a war being waged by some of the wealthiest, the most powerful people in this country against the working families of the United States, against the disappearing and shrinking middle class of our country. The billionaires of America are on the warpath. They want more and more and more. And that has everything to do with this agreement reached between the Republicans and the President. Mr. President, in 2007, the top 1% of all income earners in the United States made 23.5% of all income. Let me repeat that. Top 1% earned over 23% of all income. That is more than the bottom 50%. 1% here, 50% here. But for the very, very wealthy in this country, that's apparently not enough. The percentage of income going to the top 1% nearly tripled since the 1970s. Now, all over this country, people are angry, they're frustrated. It's true in Vermont, I'm sure it's true in Virginia, it's true all over America. But one of the reasons that people are angry and frustrated is they're working incredibly hard. In the state of Vermont, which I represent, I can tell you, there are people who don't work one job, they don't work two jobs, there are people who are working three jobs and four jobs trying to cobble together an income in order to support 
their families. And I suspect that goes on all across the country. But people are working harder and harder. In many cases, their income is going down. And the fact is that 80%, 80% of all new income earned from 1980 to 2005 has gone to the top 1%. Let me repeat that because that's an important fact. And I think that explains why the American people are feeling as angry as they are right now. They're working hard. They're not going anyplace. In some cases, of their standard of living, many cases, actually going down. 80% of all income in recent years has gone to the top 1%. Richest people become much richer. Middle class shrinks. Millions of Americans fall out of the middle class into poverty. But, but, that is not apparently enough. Our friends at the top who have a religious ferocity in terms of greed, they need more and they need more. It's like an addiction. 50 million is not enough. They need 100 million. 100 million is not enough. They need a billion. Billion is not enough. I'm not quite sure how much they need. When will it stop? Today, in terms of wealth as opposed to income, the top 1% now owns more wealth than the bottom 90%. You know, Mr. President, we went to school and we used to read in the textbooks about Latin America, for example, and they used to refer to some of the countries there as what they called banana republics, countries in which a handful of families control the economic and political life of the nation. Well, I don't want to get the American people too upset, but we are not all that far away from that reality today. Top 1% has seen a tripling of the percentage of income they earn since 1970s. Top 1% owning 23% of all income, more than the bottom 50%. Top 1% now owns more wealth than the bottom 90%. That's not the foundation of a democratic society. That's the foundation for an oligarchic society. But, hey, rich get richer. Middle class shrinks, poverty increases. Apparently, that is not good enough yet for some of the richest people in this country. And I say some of the richest, because there are a lot of folks there who have a lot of money who do love this country, who do want to do the right thing. They're not into greed, but there are some who are. More, more, more. That's what they need. For example, and this I think galls me and I think galls many of the people in this country, the horrendous recession that we're in right now where millions and millions of people have lost their jobs, they've lost their savings, they've lost their homes. This recession is caused by the greed and recklessness and illegal behavior. Let me underline it, and I'll talk about more of this later. The illegal behavior on Wall Street. So these guys, through their greed, resulted in the most severe economic recession since the Great Depression. The American people bailed them out and now, two years after the bailout, guess what? They are giving themselves more compensation than they ever have. So they're saying to the American people, sorry we caused this recession because of our greed. Sorry you're unemployed. Sorry you lost your house. But you know what? That's not really all that important. What's important is that I on Wall Street continue to get tens and millions of dollars in compensation and in bonuses, that I have big parties. How can I get by on one house? I need five houses, ten houses. I need three jet planes to take me all over the world. Sorry, the American people. We've got the money. We've got the power. We've got the lobbyists here on Wall Street. Tough luck. That's the world. Get used to it. Rich get richer. Middle class shrinks. Not enough. Not enough. The very rich seem to want more and more and more, and they are prepared to dismantle the existing political and social order in order to get it. So you got economics and distribution of income and wealth is one thing, but then we're talking about politics. And what happened last year, as I think most Americans know, is the Supreme Court made a very strange decision. The Supreme Court decided that corporations are people. 
their people, and they have the right of free speech, and they have the right without disclosure. All of this is through the Citizens United Supreme Court decision that corporate, corporate heads can put as much money as they want into campaigns all over the country. In the last campaign, that's what we saw. Billionaires in secret just pouring money into campaigns all over this country. Now, does that sound like democracy to anybody in America? They got a handful of billionaires probably dividing up the country. Oh, put this amount of money into Virginia and Vermont, California, wherever. But that's what they were able to do. So the rich get richer, and they don't sit on this money. What they then do is use it to elect people who support them, to unelect people who oppose their agenda, and they use their political power to get legislation passed which makes the wealthy even wealthier. Mr. President, one of the manifestations of that is, in fact, the agreement reached between the President and the Republican leadership. The wealthy contribute huge sums of money into campaign. The wealthy have all kinds of lobbyists around here, as do corporate America. And what they are going to get out of this agreement are huge, huge tax breaks that benefit themselves. And that is not what we should be supporting. As I mentioned earlier, we should understand that this legislation, this agreement, is really just the beginning of an assault on legislation and programs that have benefited the American people for 70 or 80 years. Mark my words, there will be an intensive effort to privatize Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. Furthermore, as part of the Republican agenda, they want to expand, and it's not only Republicans here, I must say, some Democrats as well. They want to expand our disastrous trade policies so that large companies in this country can continue their efforts to outsource American jobs to China and other low-wage countries. I think any objective analysis of our trade policies have shown that it has been a grotesque failure for ordinary Americans. Hard to calculate exactly, but I think it is fair to say that we have lost millions of decent paying jobs. During the Bush years alone, some 48,000 factories in this country shut down. We went from 19 million manufacturing jobs to 12 million manufacturing jobs. And in this country, historically, manufacturing jobs were the backbone of the working class of this country. That's how people made it into the middle class. That's how they had decent health care benefits, decent pensions. And every day, we're seeing those jobs disappear because corporate America would prefer to do business in China or other low-wage countries. I returned from a trip to Vietnam last year, a beautiful country. People there work for 25, 30 cents an hour. Sometimes when you go to a store, you may see a shirt made in Bangladesh. That shirt, in all likelihood, is made by a young girl who came in from the countryside into the city, one of the factories there. Now, the good news is that in Bangladesh, the minimum wage a number of months ago was doubled. Minimum wage in Bangladesh was doubled. It went from 11 cents an hour to 23 cents an hour. Are American workers going to be able to compete against desperate people who make 23 cents an hour? So my view, and I think it reflects the views of the American people, is that of course we want to see the people of Bangladesh and the people of China do well. But they don't have to do well at the expense of the American middle class. We do not have to engage in a race to the bottom. Our goal is to bring them up, not us down. But one of the results of our disastrous trade policies is that in many instances, wages in the United States have gone down. I believe that in the coming months, you're going to see an intensification of efforts to expand unfettered free trade. I think that will be a continuation of a disastrous policy for American workers.
Let me just um, personalize this a, a little bit. Uh, this gentleman, no personal animus to him at all. I think I met him once in a large room. His name is uh, Jamie Dimon. He is the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. Over the past five years, uh, Mr. Dimon, who is the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, received $89 million in total compensation. A bank that we now know received hundreds of billions in low interest loans and other financial assistance from the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department. All right. So Mr. Diamond received $89 million in total compensation. His bank was bailed out big time by the taxpayers. But under the legislation that the President negotiated with the Republicans, Mr. Diamond, and I use him just as one example for thousands, nothing personal to Mr. Diamond here, will receive $1.1 million in tax breaks. $1.1 million in tax breaks for a major CEO on Wall Street who over the last five years received $89 million in total compensation. Meanwhile, there is, and just to contrast what's going on here, two days ago, Mr. President, I brought before the Senate legislation which would provide a $250 one-time check to over 50 million seniors and disabled veterans who for the last two years have not received a COLA on their Social Security. Many of those seniors and disabled vets are trying to get by on $14,000, $18,000 a year. The total package for that bill was approximately $14 billion that would go out to over 50 million seniors and disabled vets. We won that vote on the floor of the Senate, 53 to 45. But just because you get 53 votes in the Senate doesn't really mean you win, because the Republicans filibustered, I needed 60 votes. I could not get 60 votes. I could not get one Republican vote to provide a $250 check to a disabled veteran trying to get by on fifteen dollars or $16,000 a year. But Mr. Diamond, who made $89 million in the last five years, will get a $1 million tax deduction if this agreement is passed. Now, that may make sense to some people. It does not it does not make a lot of sense to me. And again, there are uh, no particular knowledge, animus. I don't know that I've ever met John Mack in my life. He is the CEO of Morgan Stanley. Uh, in 2006, he received a $40 million bonus which at the time was the largest bonus ever given to a Wall Street executive. Two years after receiving this bonus, Morgan Stanley received some $2 trillion in low interest loans and billions from the Treasury Department. Instead of losing his job under this agreement, Mr. Mack will be receiving an estimated $926,000 tax break next year. Congratulations, Mr. Mack. You're doing just fine. Couldn't get 250 bucks for a disabled vet. Mr. President, okay. over the past five years, Ken Lewis, the former CEO of Bank of America, received over 165 million in total compensation. In 2008, Bank of America received hundreds of billions in taxpayer-backed loans from the Fed, and a 45 billion dollar bailout from the Treasury Department. What will Mr. Lewis receive if the agreement negotiated between the President and the Republicans goes forth? He will get a $713,000 tax cut. 
And on and on it goes. I didn't mean to specifically uh, pick on these guys. There will be some of the wealthiest people uh, in the country will be receiving um, a um, million dollar plus uh, tax break. And so we as a nation have got to decide uh, whether or not that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think it doesn't. Uh, Mr. President, let me mention that just a couple of weeks ago, uh, a, the Fed, Federal Reserve, published on their website some 21,000 transactions uh, that took place during the Wall Street meltdown period. And uh, that disclosure uh, was made possible as part of a provision that I put into the uh, financial reform bill uh, because I thought it was important that the American people, for the first time, lift the veil of secrecy at the Fed and get a sense of the kind of money that was lent out by the Fed and who received that money. Now, what's very interesting is that the American people and the media have focused on the $700 billion Wall Street bailout, now known as TARP. Now, I happen to have voted against that agreement, but in fairness, that agreement was pretty transparent. The Treasury Department put up on their website uh, all of those people who received all of those uh, banks and financial institutions who received the money. If you want to know where the money went, it's right up there on the Treasury Department's uh, website. But at the same time, a bigger transaction was taking place than TARP, which got relatively little attention, and that was the role that the Fed was playing in terms of the Wall Street bailout. While the top issue was being debated during that period, Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Tim Geithner, who was then the president of the New York Fed, and a handful of other very powerful people were sitting behind closed doors getting ready to lend out trillions, underlying trillions, of taxpayer dollars to large financial institutions and corporations with no debate going on in Congress, no debate whatsoever. Now, on March 3rd, 2009, and I'm a member of the Budget Committee, the Senate Budget Committee, I asked the Fed Chairman, Mr. Bernanke, to tell the American people the names of the financial institutions that received this unprecedented backdoor bailout from the Fed, how much they received, and the exact terms of this assistance. And I will never forget that. I asked Mr. Bernanke for that information. He said, Senator, nope, not going to give it to you, not going to make it public. Well, on that day, I introduced legislation to make that information public, working with a number of members of the House and the Senate. Some strange bedfellows, very conservatives, progressives came together on this issue. We managed to get into the Wall Street uh, reform bill a disclosure provision. And just uh, on December 1st, last week, that information was made uh, public. And let me talk uh, a little bit about what was in that information made public by the uh, Fed. After years of stonewalling, the American people have learned the incredible and jaw-dropping details of the Fed's multi-trillion dollar bailout of Wall Street and corporate America, not just Wall Street, one of the things that we learned. As a result of this disclosure, in my view, and we're going to get into what was in what we learned, Congress has got to take a very extensive look at all aspects of how the Federal Reserve functions and how we can make our financial institutions more responsive to the needs of ordinary Americans and small businesses. Now, what have we learned from the disclosure of December 1st? 
And this is based on an examination of over 21,000 separate Federal Reserve transactions. More work, more research needs to be done. But this is what we have learned so far. As it turns out, while small business owners in the state of Vermont and throughout this country were being turned down for loans, not only did large financial institutions, and I'm talking about every major financial institution, receive substantial help from the Fed, but also some of the largest corporations in this country, not financial institutions, also received help in terms of very, very low interest loans. So you got every major financial institution, you got some of our largest private corporations, but here's something that we also learned, and that is that this bailout impacted not just American banks and corporations, but also foreign banks and foreign corporations as well, to the tune of many, many billions of dollars. And then on top of that, a number of the wealthiest individuals in this country also received a major bailout from the Fed. The emergency response, which is what the Fed described their action as during the Wall Street collapse, appears to any objective observer to have been the clearest case that I can imagine of socialism for the very rich and rugged free market capitalism for everybody else. In other words, if you are a huge financial institution whose recklessness and greed caused this great recession, no problem you are going to receive a substantial amount of help from the taxpayers of this country. If you are a major American corporation, like General Electric, or McDonald's, or Caterpillar, or Harley-Davidson, or Verizon, no problem. You are going to receive a major handout from the United States government. But if you are a small business in Vermont, or in California or Virginia, well, guess what? You're on your own. Because right now, we know that one of the real impediments to the kind of job creation that we need in this country is that small businesses are not getting the loans they need. Furthermore, what we now know is the extent of the bailout for the large financial corporations. Goldman Sachs received nearly $600 billion. Morgan Stanley received nearly $2 trillion. Citigroup received $1.8 trillion. Bear Stearns received nearly a trillion. And Merrill Lynch received some $1.5 trillion in short-term loans from the Fed. But I think what is most surprising for the American people is not just the bailout of Wall Street and the financial institutions and the bailout of large American corporations like General Electric, but I think the American people would find it very strange that at a time when the American automobile sector was on the verge of collapse, and goodness only knows how many thousands and thousands of jobs we have lost in automobile manufacturing in this country, that the Federal Reserve was also bailing out Toyota and Mitsubishi, two Japanese car makers, by purchasing nearly $5 billion worth of their commercial paper from November 5, 2008 through January 30, 2009. While virtually no American-made cars or products of any kind are bought in Japan, I think the American people would be shocked to learn that the Fed extended over $380 billion to the Central Bank of Japan to bail out banks in that country. Furthermore, I think the American people are interested to know that the Fed bailed out the Korea Development Bank 
the wholly owned state-owned bank of South Korea by purchasing over $2 billion of its commercial paper. The sole purpose of the Korea Development Bank is to finance and manage major industrial projects to enhance the national economy, not of the United States of America, but of South Korea. I'm not against South Korea. I wish the South Koreans all the luck in the world. But it should not be the taxpayers of the United States lending their banks money to create jobs in South Korea. I would suggest that maybe we want to create jobs in the United States of America. At the same time, the Fed also extended over $40 billion to the Central Bank of South Korea so that it had enough money to bail out its own banks. Now, Mr. President, at a time when small businesses all over this country, in Vermont, all over this country, cannot get the loans they need to expand their businesses, I think the American people would find it extremely, I don't know what the word is, maybe amusing that the Fed bailed out the state-owned bank of Bavaria. Bavaria, it's not Pennsylvania, not California, Bavaria, by purchasing over $2.2 billion of its commercial paper. Furthermore, when we cannot get support on the floor of this Senate to extend unemployment benefits to millions of Americans who are on the verge of seeing them expire, I think the American people would find it incomprehensible that the Fed chose to bail out the Arab Banking Corporation based in Bahrain by providing them with over $23 billion in loans with an interest rate as low as one quarter of one percent. So small businessmen all over America, maybe you better run to Bahrain and work with the uh, Arab Banking Corporation there, you get some pretty good loans. But it would be a nice thing, I think, if maybe the Fed would start, pay attention, start to pay attention to banks uh, in this country. Furthermore, the Fed extended over $9.6 billion to the Central Bank of Mexico. Now, what's interesting about all of this, Mr. President, is that we had a very, very vigorous debate here in the Senate and in the House over the $700 billion TARP program. Every person in America could turn on C-SPAN and hear that debate, hear what President Bush had to say, hear what then-Senator Obama had to say, Senator McCain had to say. It was all pretty public. But what took place at the Fed, which in fact amounted to a larger bailout, was done behind closed doors. Over $3 trillion was lent out with zero transparency. In fact, as a result of this recent disclosure, this is the first time, first time we have gotten a glimpse of the magnitude and the particulars, the specificities of where that money was lent out. And I think this is not a good thing for this country. Again, I voted against the bailout of Wall Street, but the debate was open, it was public, people wrote to their senators, called their senators, that's called democracy. After the top bailout took place, all of the loans were put up on the website. Transparency, the American people knew who got the money. But the actions of the Fed were done behind closed doors, and in my view, that's an issue we're studying right now, I think that there were significant conflicts of interest. I think you had people sitting there at the New York Fed who were beneficiaries of this bailout, and that is just an issue that we've got to explore. And I should tell you, uh, Mr. President, that um, as part of the provision we got into the uh, financial reform bill, the GAO is in fact doing just that, investigating possible conflicts of interest uh, at the Fed uh, with regard to this uh, bailout. But I think the question that the American people are asking as they read about uh, what the Fed did during the financial crisis is whether or not uh, the Fed has now become the central bank of the world uh, without any debate on the floor of the United States Senate or the Congress and without the knowledge 
of the American people. And I think that that is wrong. So I would hope that out of this effort in bringing disclosure and transparency to the Fed, that one of the things that will come will be more transparency uh, at the Fed. Mr. President, as I indicated a moment ago, uh, the Fed said that this bailout was necessary uh, in order to prevent the world economy from going over a cliff. But three years after the start of the recession, millions of Americans remain unemployed and have lost their homes, their life savings, and their ability to send their kids to college. Meanwhile, huge banks, large corporations, have returned to making incredible profits and paying their executives record-breaking compensation packages as if the financial crisis they started never occurred. What this recent disclosure tells us, among many other things, is that despite this huge taxpayer bailout, the Fed did not make the appropriate demands on these financial institutions, which would have been necessary to rebuild our economy and protect the needs of ordinary Americans. In other words, what they simply did is give out billions and billions of dollars which were used in the self-interests of these financial institutions rather than saying the American people who are hurting are bailing you out and now that we've bailed you out, your responsibility is to do what you can do to create jobs and to improve the standard of living of the people, many of whom, whose lives you have severely impacted. And let me just give you a few examples of what could have been done and what should be done. At a time when big banks have nearly $1 trillion in excess reserves parked at the Fed, the Fed has not required these institutions to increase lending to small and medium-sized businesses as the condition of the bailout. In other words, instead of just giving money to the Fed, instead of the Fed just giving money to these financial institutions, the Fed should have said, we're giving you this money in order to get it into the economy. Start providing affordable loans to small businesses. Mr. President, at a time when large corporations are more profitable than ever. The Fed did not demand that corporations that received this backdoor bailout create jobs and expand the economy once they return to profitability. So what's going on in America, unemployment officially at 9.8, in real sense probably at 15, 16 percent. Wall Street is now doing fine a few years ago. Wall Street earned some 40% of all profits in America. They're doing great. But what the Fed should have done and should do now is to tell Wall Street you're part of the economy. You're not an isolated area just living for yourselves. You've got to be part of the productive economy. You've got to lend out money to small businesses to start creating jobs. Mr. President, my office intends to investigate whether these secret Fed loans in some cases, turned out to be direct corporate welfare to big banks that may have used those loans not to reinvest in the economy, but rather to lend back to the federal government at a higher rate of interest by purchasing Treasury securities. Now, we don't know that. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not true. But we'll take a look at it. In other words, did the Fed give one half of 1 percent loans to a bank and that bank then purchased a Treasury security at 2 or 3 percent. If so, you got a 2 percent profit margin. And that is nothing but corporate welfare. The goal of the bailout was not to make Wall Street richer. The goal was to expand our economy and put people to work. Furthermore, Mr. President, you know as part of the TARP agreement, there was an effort to say to the financial institutions that we're not bailing you out in order 
for you to get huge compensation packages. We're not going to give you federal money so that you can make all kinds of money. Uh, we put limitations on executive compensation. Did the Fed play the role of allowing some of the large financial institutions to pay back the top money, use the Fed money, and then continue with their very, very high executive compensation? Don't know that. It is worth investigating. Furthermore, Mr. President, and this is an issue that I have worked on for a number of years. You know, every major religion on earth, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, you name it, has always felt that usury was immoral, usury. And what we mean by usury is that when somebody doesn't have a whole lot of money and you lend them money, you don't take blood out of a stone. You don't ask for outrageously high interest rates when somebody is hurting. That's immoral. Every major religion, all of great philosophers have written about this. And yet today, Mr. President, we have millions of people in our country, and I hear from Vermonters every week on this issue, who are paying 25 or 30 percent, and in some cases even higher interest rates on their credit cards. 25, 30 percent interest rates. That is getting blood out of a stone. And yet, many of the credit card companies were bailed out by the taxpayers of this country. What the Fed must do is say to those companies, sorry, you can't continue to rip off the American people and charge them 25 or 30 percent interest rates. Now, as it happens, the four largest banks in this country, which are Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup issue half of all mortgages in this country. Four huge financial institutions issue half of all mortgages in this country. Now that unto itself is a huge problem. They issue half of all mortgages, two-thirds of all credit cards. And that speaks to another issue about the need to start breaking up these financial institutions. But when you have a handful of banks who have received huge bailouts from the federal government who are issuing two-thirds of the credit cards in this country, it seems to me to be somewhat absurd, somewhat absurd that the Fed did not say to them, sorry, you can't charge people 25 or 30 percent interest rates on their credit cards. And the same principle applies to the mortgages. I don't have to tell anybody in this country that we have seen millions of folks lose their homes through foreclosure. And once again, we see the four largest banks in this country, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup, issue half of all mortgages in this country. Four banks issue two-thirds of the credit cards half of the mortgages. We bail these financial institutions out. Don't they have some responsibility, some responsibility to the American people? How many more Americans could have remained in their homes if the Fed required those bailed out banks to, redu to reduce mortgage payments as a condition of receiving these secret loans? In terms of the interest rates on credit cards, a lot of people uh, don't know this, uh, but right now uh, the banks are able to charge as much as they want to charge, but in fact uh, credit unions are not. Uh, right now uh, we are looking at a situation where over one quarter of all credit card holders in this country are now paying interest rates above 20 percent and in some cases as high as 79 uh, percent. And in my view, Mr. President, when credit card companies charge over 20 percent interest, they are not 
engage in the business of making credit available to their customers, they are involved in extortion and loan sharking. Nothing essentially different than gangsters who charge outrageously high prices for their loans and who break kneecaps when their victims can't afford to pay them. So that's where we are right now. I get calls, and I'm sure every other senator gets calls, from constituents who are really upset. They're going deeper and deeper into debt because they can't pay 25 or 30 percent interest rates on their credit cards. We bailed out the credit card companies. There was no provision that said, stop ripping off the American people. Stop these companies from committing usury. And uh, we are working on legislation which would say to these private banks uh, not to charge any more money uh, for the credit that they provide uh, than do the credit unions. It's going to be a tough fight uh, because the lobbyists from Wall Street are all over this place. Wall Street spends huge amounts of money in campaign uh, contributions, and uh, it's going to be tough. But I think we need to pass that. I think the Fed needs to be much more active uh, in terms of what uh, kind of interest rates uh, credit card companies should be paying. Mr. President, today I'm going to focus a lot, obviously, on a, an agreement reached between the President and the Republican leadership that I think does not serve the American people well. And one of the areas, as I mentioned earlier, where I think we could do a lot better in addressing the crisis of high unemployment in this nation is by investing the kinds of money we need in our infrastructure. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, they graded America's roads, public transit, and aviation with a D and said that we must invest $2.2 trillion over the next five years simply to get a passable condition. Passable. Unfortunately, in the agreement struck between the President and the Republican leadership, to the best of my knowledge, not one nickel is going into investing in our infrastructure. And let me tell you why we need to invest in infrastructure. A, that's where you can create the millions of jobs that we desperately need in order to get us out of this recession. But second of all, we need to invest in infrastructure because if we don't, we will become less and less competitive internationally. According to the National Service Transportation Policy and Revenue Study Commission, $225 billion is needed annually for the next 50 years to upgrade our surface transportation system to a state of good repair and create a more advanced system. The Federal Highway Administration reports that $130 billion must be invested annually for a 20-year period to improve our bridges and the operational performance of our highways. At present, Mr. President, one in four of the nation's bridges are either structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. One in four of our bridges are either structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. And yet, in this agreement struck by the President and the Republican leadership, to the, mess, the best of my knowledge, not one nickel is going into our infrastructure. We need to invest in our infrastructure. We need to improve our infrastructure. And when we do that, we can create millions of jobs. Mr. President, the Federal Transit Administration says that $22 billion must be invested annually, annually, for a 20-year period to improve conditions and performances for our major transit systems. In my state of Vermont, the situation is no different than in the rest of the country. 35% of Vermont's 2,700 bridges, nearly 1,000 bridges, 
are functionally obsolete. In recent years, we've had to shut down bridges, which caused a lot of inconvenience to people who lived in those areas, to workers who had to get to work using a bridge. Nearly half of the bridges in the state of Vermont have structural deficiencies. Rural transit options are few and far between, making rural low-income Vermonters especially vulnerable to spikes in gas prices. In other words, in Vermont and in other areas of rural America, you have one choice in the vast majority of cases as to how you get to work. And that one choice is you get in your car, you pay three bucks for a gallon of gas, and that is it. And that's because rural transportation in this country is very, very weak. We can create jobs building the buses, building the vans that we need, making it easier, cheaper, for workers in rural America to get to work. Urban area, not different. Subways, New York City, Chicago, right here in Washington, D.C., are in disrepair. Let's improve, let's expand. Our public transportation system makes America run better, makes us more efficient, makes us more productive, more competitive, and it creates jobs now. Not one nickel, as far as I can understand, has been invested in our infrastructure in this agreement. Mr. President, the United States invests just 2.4 percent of GDP in infrastructure. 2.4 percent, whereas Europe invests twice that amount. And here is something that I think every American should be keenly aware of and very worried about. I don't have to tell anybody that the Chinese economy is exploding every single day in almost every way. In China, they are investing almost four times our rate, or 9 percent of their GDP annually in their infrastructure. Years ago, I was in Shanghai, in China, and I was coming from the airport to downtown as part of a congressional delegation. And while we were on the bus coming in, my wife noticed something. She said, what was that? There was a blur that went right by the window. I, of course, didn't notice it. She did. Turned out that that blur was an experimental train that they were working on, high-speed rail, which is now operational there, but is similar prototypes are being developed all over China. So here we are, the United States of America, which so many years, for so many years, has led the world in so many ways. And now you're seeing a newly developing country like China, high-speed rail all over their country, making their country more productive and efficient. And in our cities, our subways are breaking down. Amtrak is going 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, and the Chinese and the Europeans have trains that are going hundreds of miles an hour. This is the United States of America. Maybe I'm old-fashioned. I think we could do it, too. I think we could rebuild our rail system, make our country more efficient, and create jobs. Mr. President, China invested $186 billion in rail from 2006 through 2009, and according to the New York Times, within two years, they will open 42 new high-speed rail lines with trains reaching speeds of 200 miles an hour. That's China. So I think, Mr. President, if China can do it, the United States of America can do it. That's the way to rebuild America make us stronger and create jobs. By 2020, China plans to add 26,000 additional miles of tracks for freight and travel, as well as 230,000 miles <coughs> of new or improved roads and 97 new airports. 97 new airports. Anybody in America have the same problem that I have when you go to the airport? and you're waiting on lines, and you have to deal with all of the problems of older airports, China's building 97 new ones. We're not. We're not. And if we are going to be effective in the international economy, if our kids are going to have decent jobs, it's high time that we woke up and began investing in our infrastructure. So that is not only to improve the long-term strength of America, 
our economic prowess, but it is also to create jobs right now when we desperately need to do that. But unfortunately, uh, in this bill, uh, this ta tax agreement between the President uh, and the Republican leadership, there are many, many billions of dollars going into tax breaks for corporations, but there is uh, not a whole lot of money. In fact, there's zero dollars going into rebuilding uh, our uh, infrastructure. And similarly, and I know there's been debate just yesterday on this issue, there may be a, a small breakthrough here, a small breakthrough. But I don't have to, again, tell Americans, least of all the people in the state of Vermont, about what happens when the weather gets cold and you're forced to pay very high prices for heating oil. The time is long overdue for us to make the investments that we need uh, to transform our energy system away from coal, away from oil. We are spending as a nation, and everybody in America has got to appreciate this, we're spending $350 billion every single year, a billion a day roughly, importing oil from Saudi Arabia and from other foreign countries in order to make our economy go and in order to keep people warm. $350 billion a year. And let me be very clear. The royal family of Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia is our major source of oil, they are doing just fine. Don't worry about the royal family of Saudi Arabia. They got zillions and zillions of dollars. Maybe it's a good idea that we move to energy independence, that we broke our dependence on fossil fuel, that we became far more energy efficient, which, by the way, investing in public transportation certainly will do and we move to such sustainable energies as wind, solar, geothermal, and biomass. And by the way, guess what? That's what China is doing. Many of the solar, the, uh, solar panels that are coming into this country, not made in the United States of America, made in China. They're big in wind turbines. So I think, uh, Mr. President, uh, that the time is now uh, for us to rebuild our infrastructure and create the jobs uh, that we desperately do. And again, uh, unfortunately, uh, despite the enormous needs, uh, infrastructural needs in this country, this uh, agreement signed by the uh, President and the uh, Republican leadership does not do that. And when we talk about transforming our energy system and moving away from fossil fuels and making our homes more energy efficient and building solar panels moving toward solar thermal power in the southwest of this country, in New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada. We have some of the best solar exposure in the entire world. There are estimates that just in the, solar, in the southwest of this country, on federal land, we can provide 30 percent of the electricity that American homes need if we move toward solar thermal, need to invest in our transmission lines. So, Mr. President, what we are talking about here is massive investments to create jobs, make us energy independent, clean up the environment, deal with the huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions which are contributing to global warming. That's a win-win-win situation. And yet, uh, we are not seeing that uh, in this bill. Let's get back to the original. You got the original um, and I will want to tell you something, Mr. President, I'm going to get into this at greater length uh, later. And that is when we talk about our good friends uh, in the oil industry, and I'm not here to make a long speech about BP and, and what they've done in Louisiana, etc. But I want everybody to know this. I'm going to get into this at greater length later. Uh, last year, uh, our friends at ExxonMobil, and ExxonMobil has historically been the most profitable uh, corporation in the history of the world. Uh, last year, uh, ExxonMobil had a, for them, a very bad year. Uh, they only made $19 billion in profit. Uh, Mr. President, uh, based on $19 billion, uh, you might be surprised to know that ExxonMobil uh, not only paid nothing in taxes, they got a $156 million uh, return from the IRS. Now, how's that? For those of you who are working in an office, you're working in a factory, 
You're earning your thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year. You pay taxes. Uh, but if you are Exxon Mobil uh, and you made nineteen billion dollars in taxes in, in profits last year, not only did you not pay any taxes this year, you got a hundred and fifty-six uh, million dollar uh, return. That's pretty good, I think. Mr. President, uh, it's not just uh, the large oil companies uh, who do not pay their fair share of taxes. I'm getting into this a little bit later. But when we understand or try to understand why we have such a huge national debt <clears throat> and a $1.3 or $4 trillion deficit, it's also important to understand that many large and profitable corporations avoid virtually all of their tax responsibility. In August 2008, uh, the General Accounting Accountability Office here issued a report. And according to this report, two out of every three corporations in the United States paid no federal income taxes between 1998 and 2005. Well, we got a $13.7 trillion national debt, and according to a GAO report published in August of 2008, two out of every three corporations in the United States paid no federal income taxes between 1998 and 2005. Amazingly, these corporations had a combined $2.5 trillion in sales, but paid no income taxes to the IRS. Furthermore, according to a report from Citizens for Tax Justice, 82 Fortune 500 companies in America, I guess that's 82 out of 500, paid zero or less in federal income taxes in at least one year from 2001 to 2003. That's a report from Citizens for Tax Justice. And the Citizens for Tax Justice report goes on to say, and I quote, in the years they paid no income tax, these companies earned $102 billion in U.S. profits. But instead of paying $35.6 billion in income taxes, as the statutory 35% corporate tax rate seems to require, these companies generated so many excess tax breaks that they received outright tax rebate checks from the U.S. Treasury, totally $12.6 billion. That's from the Citizens for Tax Justice. So, Mr. President, when we take a comprehensive look at what is going on in this country, why we have a $13.7 trillion national debt, it is terribly important to understand that while the middle class pays its share of taxes, there are many, many, many large corporations that not only are paying nothing in taxes, they are getting rebates from the federal government. I'm going to go on to this at greater length later on. Uh, but there, as a member of the Budget Committee, I can tell you, uh, we discuss quite often about how every single year, every single year, corporate interests and wealthy individuals stash away huge amounts of money in tax havens in the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, <clears throat> and other countries in order to avoid paying their taxes in the United States of America. These are American corporations turning their backs on the American people, saying, as Mrs. Helmsley said so many years ago, I guess, many of you remember, only small people pay taxes. Only the working stiffs out there pay taxes. If you're a large corporation, you've got a good lawyer, you know what you do, good accountant. Invest your money in the Cayman Islands, and in Bermuda, you don't have to pay American taxes. But by the way, as the disclosure report of last week indicated, no problem, you get bailed out. When things go bad, <clears throat> you will be bailed out by American uh, taxpayers. 
So, Mr. President, on and on and on it goes. The rich and large corporations get richer. The CEOs earn huge compensation packages. When things get bad, don't worry. Uncle Sam and the American taxpayers are here to bail you out. But when you are in trouble, <clears throat> well, we just can't afford to help you if you're in the working class or the middle class of this country. Mr. President, I want to return for a moment to the agreement that the President and the Republican leadership negotiated. Because I think that is the issue that all of America is now talking about. President, Republican leadership says it's a good deal. Democrats in the House yesterday said, wait, wait a second. It doesn't look to us like it's a good deal. In fact, we don't even want to bring it up to the floor of the House. And I could tell you that here in the Senate, there are a number of us, I don't know how many, who say, wait a second, this ain't a good deal for the middle class, not a good deal for our kids, not a good deal for workers. We can negotiate a better deal. And the reason we are trying to delay passage of this agreement, and I hope very much it doesn't have the votes here, is we want the American people to stand up and say, wait a second, it makes no sense to us to be giving huge tax breaks to the richest people in this country, literally millionaires and billionaires, driving up the national debt <clears throat> so that our kids could pay more in taxes in order to pay that debt off. This is a transfer of wealth. It's Robin Hood in reverse. We're taking from the middle class and working families, and we're giving it to the wealthiest people in this country. So, Mr. President, I believe that the agreement struck between the President and the Republican leadership is a bad deal, some good parts to it, but by and large, it is not a good deal. We can do better. And if the American people stand up and work with us, if they get on the phones, if they call up their senators, they call up their congressmen, if they make their voices heard and said enough is enough, the rich have got it all right now, top 1% earns 23.5% of all income, more than the bottom 50%, that it is absurd that we continue to bail out people who do not need any help, who are doing just fine. So, Mr. President, I am here to take a stand against this bill, and I'm going to do everything I can to defeat this bill, and I'm going to tell my colleagues and the American people exactly why, in my view, this is not good legislation. And let me just tick off some of the reasons why I think that this bill does not serve the best interest of the disappearing middle class of this country. And I should tell you, Mr. President, I don't know what kind of <clears throat> telephone calls <clears throat> you're getting from Colorado, but I can tell you that in the last three days alone, uh, according to my front desk staff, both here in Washington and Vermont, I think we're over 5,000 telephone calls and emails, and well over 98 percent of those messages are against this agreement. And I don't know to what degree that's indicative of what's going on all over this country, but I suspect it is not radically different in other states. I think the American people are saying $13.8 trillion national debt, let's not give tax breaks to billionaires, drive up that national debt, force our kids to pay more in taxes, and at the same time have Republicans come forward and start slashing Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security because of this large debt that we are making larger. And I appeal to my conservative friends, I'm not a conservative, but many conservatives have spent their entire political careers saying we cannot afford to drive up the national debt. It's unsustainable. I agree with that. So vote against this agreement because it is driving up the national debt. And in a significant way, it is doing that by giving tax breaks to people who absolutely don't need it. Once again, for those people who are earning a million a year or more, they on average, on average, will be getting about $100,000 a year tax break. People earning 100 million a year, that number is gonna be a lot higher. Who believes that that makes any sense at all? 
Mr. President, let me give you some other reasons why I think this agreement is a bad agreement. The President says, well, yes, we are going to extend tax breaks for all, including the top 2 percent, but don't worry. It's only going to be for two years. Not to worry, only going to be for two years. Well, maybe that will be the case, but you know what? I doubt that very much. I've been here in Congress long enough to know that if you extend a tax break, it is very, very hard to undo that extension. Because if we can't do it now, if we can't tell our Republican colleagues that it is absurd to continue giving tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires, if we can't do it now, what makes you think we're going to do it in the midst of a presidential election? And I have to say that as, some, as somebody who admires and likes the president, the president is a friend of mine, his credibility has been severely damaged. He's going to go forward, and if he's the Democratic nominee, I suspect that he will say, well, yeah, I extended it for two years against my will, but don't worry. I'm going to repeal him after two years. Mr. President, you tell me who's going to believe him. His credibility has been severely damaged. We're caving in on this issue. We should not be. The polls show us the American people do not believe millionaires and billionaires need more tax breaks. If the calls to my office are indicative of what's going on in this country, overwhelming opposition to that agreement. So what I'm saying here is that while the president says, don't worry, this is only temporary, yeah, I don't like it, says the president, he's been, don't like it, but it's only two years, I have my doubts. I expect that in two years, if this agreement goes forward, it will be extended again. As you know, Mr. President, they wanted 10 years of an extension of tax breaks for the rich. I have my strong suspicion that that is exactly what will happen if not made permanent. And this country cannot afford to give tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires and have the middle class pay higher taxes to pay them off. And I want to say also, Mr. President, that while a lot of tension has attention has been fo focused on the personal income tax issue, that is not the only unfair tax proposal uh, in this agreement. This agreement continues the Bush era 15 percent tax rate on capital gains and dividends, meaning, let's be very clear about what this means, meaning that those people who make their living off of their investments, if you invest, if you earn dividends, will continue to pay a substantially lower tax rate than the average American worker, person in the working class, middle class, our firemen, our teachers, our nurses. Those people are not going to get pay 15 percent. They pay a higher rate than folks who have capital gains and dividends. I think that that's wrong. This agreement extends those provisions. Furthermore, Mr. President, and this is a point that has got to be made over and over and over again, this agreement between the President and the Republicans lowers the estate tax rate to 35 percent. Under this agreement, the estate, estate tax will decline to 35 percent. Under President Clinton, when the economy was much stronger, the estate tax was 55 percent. Now, I know, Mr. President, that the Republicans have done a very good job in trying to convince the American people that this is a so-called death tax, that every, in every family in America, when a loved one dies, the family is going to have to pay 35 percent, 45 percent, 55 percent. I have had people in Burlington, Vermont, coming up to me and say, what are you doing? I got $30,000 in the bank. I want to leave it to my kids. Why are you caught forcing my kids to pay such a large tax? So let us be very, very clear. The Republicans have done a very good job in totally distorting this issue. The estate tax is paid only by the top three-tenths of one percent of families in America. If you are in the middle class, even if you're modestly wealthy, even if you're wealthy, if you're poor, if you're lower middle class, you don't pay a nickel 
in estate tax if somebody in your family were to die and leave you wealth. Not a nickel. This applies not just to the rich, but the very, very, very rich. So what the Republicans have been arguing for several years now is they want to repeal the estate tax entirely. If they were successful in doing that, Mr. President, that would mean increasing the national debt by $1 trillion over a 10-year period. How's that? And all of the benefits, not some, all of the benefits go to the top three-tenths of 1%. 99.7% of the people do not gain one nickel. Now, what's in this agreement is not what the Republicans ideally want, which is a repeal of the tax entirely, but what they do get is a reduction to 35% with an exemption on the first $5 million of an individual's estate. And here, Mr. President, is a chart which indicates just what I said a moment ago. Repealing the estate tax would add more than $1 trillion to the deficit over 10 years. Over a trillion dollars, and the beneficiaries of it are just the very, very wealthy. Do you have the one on your So, Mr. President, Mr. President, let me give you an example of what the repeal of the estate tax would be. I'll read it right off of this chart right here. Sam Walton's family, and those are the heirs to the Walmart fortune, are worth an estimated $86.8 billion. The Walton family, one family, would receive an estimated $32.7 billion tax break if the estate tax was completely repealed. And this is what our Republican friends want. Now, this agreement uh, between the President and the Republicans certainly does not repeal the estate tax, but it does significantly lower the rates that the richest people very richest people in this country would have to pay. Mr. President, uh, two days ago, two days ago, I brought to the floor of this Senate a very simple piece of legislation. And I think how that legislation was treated speaks volumes about the debate that we're having now. This legislation said that with over 50 million senior citizens on Social Security and disabled vets, for the second year in a row not getting a cost of living adjustment, a COLA, over 50 million seniors on Social Security, disabled vets, not getting any COLA at all, despite the fact that their prescription drug costs are going up, their health care costs are going up, they got no COLA. And I said, you know, I think in these tough times, it is appropriate for those folks, if we can't get them a COLA, 2% COLA, $250 check to all of our seniors, disabled vets. That's what we did, by the way, in the stimulus package. That's all. Over 50 million people, $250 check, cost the government about $14 billion. $14 billion. And yet, I could not get one Republican vote in support of that. Republicans say, my goodness, imagine a senior or disabled vet living on $15,000, $20,000 a year getting a $250 check. What an outrage. We have different priorities, they say. We want to give a million-dollar tax break to somebody who earns $50 million a year. And that about says it, it says it all. If you are very, very rich, good news is you're going to get more tax breaks. But if you're a senior or a disabled vet, we can't get you a $250 check. Now, I will say, Mr. President, that the vote here on the floor of the Senate was 53 people in favor of providing that one-time check, 45 against. 53 to 45, we won. But here in the Senate, majority does not rule. Republicans filibuster almost everything. 
and it required 60 votes. We didn't get the 60 votes. Seniors didn't get that check. I'm going to do my best to see that they do get it. We're going to bring that issue back and back and back again. So I raise that issue, Mr. President, to tell you that one of the very weakest proposals in this agreement, totally outrageous, is the uh, decrease in the uh, taxes uh, for the estate tax. Now, there's another issue I want to uh, touch on, and I'm going to spend a long time on this issue because it hasn't gotten the coverage and the attention that I think it deserves. Let me have Bob McAnally's statement. Uh, and this agreement deals with um, the so-called uh, this agreement deals with uh, the payroll tax holiday. And I know the President and the Vice President and others have been touting this, and they're saying, well, you know, this is really a good thing because we're going to put more money into the pockets of working people. What will happen is if you're a worker right now, you're paying 6.2 percent uh, in a payroll tax for Social Security. It's going to be reduced for one year to 4.2 percent. You get the difference. And this is really a good thing. Well, all of us want to see working people have more, po more, well more money in their pockets. That's what we're doing. That's what we're fighting for. But let me be very clear that while on the surface, this so-called payroll tax holiday sounds like a good idea for working people, it is actually a very bad idea. And what the American people should understand is that this payroll tax holiday originated from right-wing Republicans whose ultimate goal, trust me, is not to put more money into the pockets of working families, it's the ultimate destruction of Social Security. And what they understand is that if we divert funding that is supposed to go into the Social Security Trust Fund, this will ultimately weaken the long-term financial viability of Social Security. So in other words, what we are doing is, for the very first time, diverting money which is supposed to go into the Social Security Trust Fund. We're giving it to workers today. It's like eating our seed. Rather than going into Social Security, the President says, don't worry, this is going to be covered this year by the federal government. Well, we've never seen that before. I don't want Social Security to be dependent on the federal government because the federal government has a $13.7 trillion national debt. And what I worry about is this is not just a one-year provision. This also could be extended. Let me just quote uh, Barbara Kennelly, and I'm glad to see that I am joined uh, here on the floor by one of the strongest fighters in the United States Senate for Working Families. Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio, um, and I just want to say this uh, before I ask him a question, or before he asks me a question, or whatever the protocol is, and that is I want to quote what Barbara Kennelly, the President and CEO of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, said. This is one of the largest senior groups of America, and this is what she says, and I quote, even though Social Security contributed nothing to the current economic crisis, it has been bartered in a deal that provides deficit-busting tax cuts for the wealthy. Here's the key point. Diverting $120 billion in Social Security contributions for a so-called tax holiday may sound like a good deal for workers now, but it's bad business for the program that a majority of middle-class seniors will rely upon in the future. End of quote. Barbara Canelli, President and CEO of the National Committee to preserve Social Security and Medicare. Let me, I'm joined now by my very good friend from Ohio, and I wanted to ask him his sense of this overall agreement. Well, I, my sense is, is similar to yours in that I was just, on a, I was just on, a, on a TV show a minute ago, and I was um, asked, you know, that the, the, the liberals or the conservatives, what they think about this. And this really isn't a, a, a liberal conservative issue. This is, first of all, the tax cuts overwhelmingly go to the wealthiest taxpayers. Uh, we're seeing the kinds of tax cuts that, that millionaires and billionaires get uh, from the income tax and from the estate tax. But it's also 
I, it, equally importantly, it blows a hole in our, in our, in our budget deficit. I, I, in some sense, we're borrowing tens of billions of dollars every year now, if this agreement becomes, becomes law, we're borrowing tens of billions of dollars every year from the Chinese. We're putting it in our children's and our grandchildren's credit cards for them to pay off who knows when, and then we're giving these tax cuts to millionaires and billionaires. I mean, just in those simple terms, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in our relationship with China. It doesn't make sense in the lost jobs that come from that China trade policy. It doesn't make sense in undermining the middle class. It doesn't make sense in terms of fairness in the tax system. And it doesn't make sense for our children and grandchildren and what the, the, the burden they're going to have to bear to pay off this debt. I mean, when you, giving, a, giving a millionaire a tax cut and charging it to our kids who are paying taxes on on, unfortunately, in the last few years, declining wages is just morally reprehensible. And, you know, when I, when I think of the, 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 I know Senator Sanders has been on the floor two hours now on a, you know, ta talking about this and how important, and really analyzing it and educating and all that, I, I think about the economic policy, too, that this, that this um, embodies. Uh, Ten years ago, nine years ago, Senator Sanders and uh, the presiding officer, when he was a member of the House, Senator Udall from uh, Colorado, and I and others voted against the Bush tax cuts of 2001 and 2003, principally because those tax cuts overwhelmingly went to the wealthy and ended up adding to our national debt. We had a surplus then. We sure don't now. We had the largest surplus we'd ever had in 2001. Um, blew a hole in that. But we passed those, those tax cuts under the belief, those who supported it, President Bush and uh, Senator McConnell and so many others, under the belief that that, would, uh, that kind of trickle-down economics would grow our economy. Well, in the eight years, and this isn't, this isn't partisan, this isn't opinion, this is fact, from January 1, 2001 to January 1, 2009, President Bush's eight years, we actually had private sector job loss in this country. Contrast that with a different economic policy January 1, 1993 to January 1, 2001, the Clinton eight years, again, this isn't partisan, this isn't, this isn't opinion, this is fact. During the Clinton eight years, we had 21 million private sector jobs created. 21 million private sector jobs created, eight, zero, literally, job loss, private sector jobs created in the Bush eight years because of trickle-down economics. So, so why would we blow a hole in the budget, which this bill does, why would we, for our, for our kids to pay off, and why would we pass an econ would continue an economic policy that clearly didn't work for this country, didn't work for the middle class, we saw the middle class, we saw wages, not only no job increase during those eight years, except for the people at the very top, we saw actual wage stagnation or worse. People didn't, most Americans didn't get a raise during the eight Bush years. Uh, most Americans simply saw their wages flat, or in many cases declined. The super wealthy saw a big increase in their incomes and in their net assets, and, and, and now we're going to give a tax break to them? I mean, I, I, this isn't class warfare. I don't, I have lots of people I know that have a lot of money. I'm not, I don't aim ill will at them, but why would we help those people who have done so very well and then have our children pay for it. Now, Senator Sanders had just mentioned the letter from Barbara Canelli, the Social Security, one of, the, one of the largest seniors organizations in the country, and what this will mean for Social Security. And here's, here's my fear, Mr. President, that, that if this is passed, we're going to see our budget deficit increase, according to the Congressional Budget Office, about $900 billion because of this package, $800-some billion over the next couple of years. As soon as it's signed by President Obama, even though it was negotiated with the Republican Senate leadership and overwhelming numbers of Republicans in the Senate and the House, I assume we're going to vote for it, they're going to say, look at the huge budget deficit that President Obama created. From that day on, they're going to go after ways to cut the budget. Um, that's okay. I agree we need to deal with spending and taxes and the whole picture. But I also know from watching Republicans, I saw them in the House when they moved towards Medicare privatization in 2003 and 4 and 5. Uh, they had some success. Fortunately, we were able to beat back most of it. I remember in 2005, after President Bush was reelected in a very, very close race, uh, he spoke 
repeatedly about privatizing Social Security. I know that's what they want to do. In the 1990s, Speaker Gingrich, fortunately beat back by President Clinton, but Speaker Gingrich tried to privatize Medicare. And that's the way they cut the budget. They go after Medicare and Social Security. So this, this vote on this package, and to me, it's, you know, we, we need to, we need to, we need to call the president, to write the president, to work with the president, to say no deal, and that this has got to be something very different from what it is now, because it can, it will, it will cause huge deficits that the that the, our children and grandchildren will have to bear. It will not help the economy appreciably because we saw what what the um, trickle down economic policies of the Bush years did, uh, and it and it doesn't help the middle class enough. So it's pretty clear to me how this jeopardizes Social Security, it jeopardizes Medicare, it will force more cuts and more pressure on those programs that have lifted so many people into the middle class. I, in 1965, when Medicare was um, first passed, half of senior citizens in this country had no health insurance. Half of seniors had no health insurance. Today, 99% um, of seniors have health insurance, something like that. And I know that, that, that we're, we're a country now that has created a strong middle class. Uh, we've seen that middle class because of these tax cuts for the wealthy, trickle down kind of economic policy. We've seen the, seen the middle class shrink in the last few years. Uh, I don't want that to keep happening. That's why I'm very concerned about this. That's why um, I am working with the president to say no deal, that we need to, to much more seriously focus on not running up a huge debt, on making sure that Social Security is protected, on an economic policy that works for the middle class, and on a tax policy that's fair to the middle class. That's why Senator Sanders' work is so important on the floor today, taking the floor for a longer period than anybody I've seen since I've been in the Senate, uh, in a filibuster kind of setting where he is um, you know, he is raising these questions, asking these questions, educating the public, talking to people all over the country in this chamber and outside uh, to change this policy. If and I say could no interrupt deal. my friend Senator from Ohio and, and ask him a question. This is an issue that he dealt with last night. Talk about the kind of priorities uh, that we have seen in the Senate recently, where just a couple of days ago, you and I worked very hard to try to make sure that seniors on Social Security and disabled vets were able to get a $250 check at a cost of $14 billion, and we couldn't get one Republican vote for that, while at the same time, the Republicans are pushing tax breaks of over a million dollars a year for the richest people in this country. Does that seem... Well, it, yeah, it tells a story, and I, I, I'm still... I came to the floor right after that vote. I had, I had supported it all along. I co-sponsored Senator Sanders' um, his, his, uh, his effort to, to bring that to the floor for the $250 check for all seniors and all disabled veterans, I might add, uh, not just Social Security beneficiaries. Uh, and, but I came to the floor right afterwards because I was, I was pretty amazed. I, 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 know that, I know there's partisanship here. I know that some people think that their whole view of the world is if you give tax cuts to the richest people in the country, it'll all trickle down and we'll all do better. It'll all lift all boats. And that's a pretty good economic theory. You might have learned at Harvard or you might have learned it at um, you know, Johns Hopkins near here or wherever, but it just doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's nice theory, but it doesn't work to lift all boats. So Senator Sanders' effort was to provide a $250 check one time, the cost of $14 billion, uh, but one time, not continued $14 billion, one time for seniors who had, had not, who had not had a cost of living adjustment in two years. And it just seemed to make so much sense when the average senior in this country lives, gets about a $14,000 a year Social Security check. I guess that's about $1,200 a month. Uh, that's not their entire income for most seniors, but it's a big, big part of it. Many seniors live only on that. Many more seniors live on that, but only another couple, three, four hundred dollars a month. So um, when you see the cost of, you know, there's not inflation maybe for uh, people my age so much in this country, but if you're, if you're older and you've got a lot of health care costs, there is inflation um, because that's where health, that's what, that's, health care costs seem to go up higher than maybe anything but higher education and maybe as much as that. So it was important that that $250 be provided, we think, to every senior in the, in the country and every disabled vet. Now, the, what, was, what made me, so, what was so amazing about it was that 42 Republican senators have signed a letter saying they will do nothing, nothing in the Senate until uh, the tax cuts for the rich are approved, till they're signed into law. Now, 
it's almost, I've never seen the United States senators engage in a work stoppage or a strike. I mean, it wasn't really quite a strike. It was probably illegal for us to strike. I don't know, maybe, but it really was a work stoppage. They were saying, we're not doing anything until you give tax cuts to my rich friends. And I might say also to many people in the House and Senate whose income is in that bracket too. I'm not accusing them of that to be sure. But they were there for their rich friends and their biggest contributors and the wealthiest people in this country. But they weren't there for a senior citizen living on $1,200 a month that could use that extra $250. I, I've met too many seniors, and I know that the presiding officer, when he, when, he travels, uh, when, he, when he travels to Colorado Springs or he goes to Cimarron or he goes to Denver, I, I know that, that he hears seniors say, I cut my medicine, I cut my pills in half because I need my prescription to run for two months rather than one because I can't afford it, or I skip my medicine today because I, my house is too cold and I don't, or I don't have enough to eat. I mean, we, we know seniors make those choices. And we make choices here. And the choice we made is 42 Republicans made it and blocked because you need 60 votes. You know, we had a majority of voters, for, of, of senators, an easy majority for, for Senator Sanders' effort on the 53 votes, efforts to do this, the $250, but you need 60 votes. So 42 Republican senators engaged in their work stoppage, saying we're not doing anything until we get these tax cuts for the rich, said no to seniors. And I, I, I just am amazed by that, the, the, the callousness. I guess I'm even more amazed when you consider What's today, the 10th or 11th? When you consider in two weeks, um, it's Christmas Day, and that doesn't seem to bother them. Doesn't seem to bother them on unemployment benefits. 85,000 Ohioans a week and a half ago lost their unemployment benefits. 85,000. Their holiday season's ruined, but I guess all of us will go home, and I want to go home and be with Connie and my kids and you know, on Christmas. I, my children are grown. Uh, we have one grandchild. I want to be with them as much of Christmas as I can. But we have a job to do today and this, this week and next week and this month and this year, and that is to extend unemployment benefits to people who have lost them, who are looking for jobs as hard as they can in the great majority of cases, and extending the tax cuts for the middle class and doing the right thing. And, and so far, uh, we, we haven't done that, and I, I, I need, to, need to go to the airport, but I want to uh, yield back to Senator Sanders for his work today. Um, I hope next week when we come back on Monday, we're prepared to do whatever it takes um, to say no deal on this one um, and to make this work for the middle class, make it work for Social Security beneficiaries, make it work uh, for unemployed workers. I, I just I want to thank my good friend from Ohio, one of the real fighters for working families here in the Senate. Uh, not only for coming down here, but for his years of efforts. But he makes a very important point. You know, we have a job to do. And the job is, I know it's, some people don't believe it, rather radical concept, but our job is to represent working families in the middle class and not the wealthiest people in this country. Uh, I've got four kids, six grandchildren. I look forward to spending the holidays with them. But you know what? We have a job to do. And if it means staying here through Christmas Eve, through New Year's, that is our job, and let's pass a proposal that works well for ordinary families and not just for the wealthiest people in this country. Uh, I wanted to thank Senator Sherrod Brown for, for coming down, and what I want to say now uh, is when you look at this agreement, uh, we've talked now about uh, the absurdity of in the middle of uh, a, a time when we have a $13.7 trillion national debt, giving tax breaks to people who don't need it. Uh, Senator Brown and I have talked about the dangers inherent in this uh, payroll uh, tax holiday and what it might mean for the future of Social Security. Uh, but I also uh, wanted to uh, make another point, and that is that there are many, many billions of dollars in this proposal uh, going to a variety of business tax cuts. Uh, some of them, in fact, might work. Some of them, in fact, might not work. But what is very, very clear is that if your goal is to create as many jobs as possible for every dollar of investment, this particular approach is not very effective. Uh, when we talk about tax breaks uh, for corporations and companies, what we should be aware of is that corporate America today, today, is sitting on close to $2 trillion in cash. They have that cash on hand. 
And the problem is not that they don't have the money. The problem is that working people, working people don't have the money to buy the products that these guys are producing. And I believe, and not just me, but I think a variety of, of economists from across the board believe that it makes a lot more sense if we're serious about creating jobs to invest in our infrastructure. And I say that for a number of reasons. When you put money into roads and bridges and public transportation, you are creating for every dollar that you spent far more jobs than giving a variety of tax breaks. That's just what is an economic fact. Second of all, when you are investing in our infrastructure, not only are you creating jobs short term, you are leaving the country with a long-term improvement that increases our competitiveness in a very tough global economy. I, I mentioned a moment ago, and we'll get back to it later. China is investing huge amounts of money into high-speed rail, uh, into their roads, into their bridges, and yet if you drive around certain parts of America, you think we are a third world nation. You got roads with all kinds of potholes, you have bridges which you can't go across, you got rail systems where trains are going slower. There's a study out there, and I'm going to get to it later, where somebody said that decades and decades ago, it took less time to go from various parts of this country to the other on train than it does today, because our rail beds are in such bad shape. So if we're going to make our country competitive, you've got to invest in infrastructure, it creates jobs, it adds long-term value to this country. Unfortunately, in this uh, agreement, uh, there is, to the best of my knowledge, not one nickel going into infrastructure. And uh, it is important that we, in fact, uh, add provisions which do invest in our infrastructure and create jobs. Another point, uh, Mr. President, that should be made when we look at this uh, so-called compromise uh, agreement established by the President and the Republican leadership is uh, that uh, in the agreement there is an extension of unemployed benefits uh, for 13 months. Now, there is zero question in my mind that that is something that absolutely has to be done. Right now, uh, Senator Brown made this point, we have millions of Americans who have, through no fault of their own, uh, lost their jobs. Maybe their plants went to China, uh, maybe their companies couldn't, couldn't get the loans they needed to stay in business. Small businesses going under, big businesses shutting down plants. Uh, no question that we have got to extend unemployment benefits. But what bothers me is that this provision in this agreement, which is a good provision, suggests that this is a hard-won compromise, that the Republicans really conceded something and they agreed to a 13-month extension of unemployment benefits. But here's the fact. The fact is that for the last 40 years, when unemployment rates have gone above 7.2 percent, Republicans and Democrats, in a nonpartisan way, have come together to say, of course we're going to extend unemployment benefits. This is America. We're not going to let working families who are suffering hard times because they're no fault of their own, they've lost their jobs, we're not going to let them lose their homes or not enable them to feed their families. This is America. We're not going to do that. And Republicans have said that 40 years. Democrats have said that 40 years. Democratic and Republican presidents, leaders here in the House and the Senate have said that. So to say, oh my goodness, the Republicans made a major concession, they're going to allow the extension of unemployment benefits for 13 months, that's not a concession. That has been bipartisan public policy for the last 40 years. Now, Mr. President, uh, I've been expressing to you and to the American people why I think this is not a good agreement, why I think this agreement should be defeated, and why I think we can put together a much better agreement. Uh, but I do want to be very clear that there are positive aspects to this agreement which should be maintained in a, an improved uh, proposal. And let me just mention some of them. Uh, this proposal, of course, in addition to extending uh, unemployment benefits uh, for 13 months, extends the middle class tax cuts 
And that is obviously, obviously, obviously something that we have to do. Uh, the reality is that the middle class in this country is collapsing during the Bush years. We saw a $2,200 decline uh, per year in median family income. Uh, and working families are hurting, no question about it. And to not to extend that tax cut for 98% of America would be a travesty. So we have got to maintain those tax cuts, and that is a positive thing in that agreement, which obviously any future agreement must maintain. Also in this agreement is the earned income tax credit for working Americans, a very important provision, and the child and college tax credits are also in this agreement. And these proposals will keep millions of Americans from slipping out of the middle class and into poverty, and they will allow millions of Americans to send their kids to college. So I'm not here to say to the president or the vice president that there aren't any good proposals and parts of this agreement. There are. But we can do much, much better. Now, what the president says, and he makes a valid point, he says, well, OK, show me the votes. Show me the votes. He's good at counting. We've tried a proposal here. Mr. President, as you well know, was it last week, where we only got 53 votes which said that we're going to extend the tax breaks for the middle class and not the very, very rich. And the president knows, as everybody else knows, that around here, Republicans filibuster everything. You need 60 votes. And he says, show me the votes. Well, this is what I would say. What our job right now is about is reaching out to the American people from one end of this country to the other, from California to Vermont, including a lot of our very conservative states. Because frankly, it is not a conservative approach to substantially increase the national debt by giving tax breaks to billionaires. Mr. President, how many times have you been here on the floor hearing our Republican colleagues give long, long speeches about the danger and the unsustainability of a $13.7 trillion national debt and a $1.4 trillion deficit. You've heard it day after day after day. That's their mantra. Well, if they believe that, why are they voting for a proposal that substantially increases the national debt for the very unproductive reason of giving tax breaks to the richest people in this country who don't <clears throat> need it. And I would hope, and the reason why we have to defeat this proposal and fight for a much better one, is I would hope that people throughout this country, in Vermont and Colorado, <clears throat> in many of our conservative states, that they come forward and they say, wait a second, I do not want to see my kids and grandchildren pay more in taxes because we borrowed money from China to increase the national debt in order to give tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires who have done extraordinarily well in recent years and, by the way, have seen a significant decline in their effective tax rate. Mr. President, I know you have heard uh, people like Warren Buffett, one of the richest guys in America. He's made the point over and over again that his effective, what he really pays in taxes, his effective tax rate is lower than his secretaries. And all over this country, you have examples where very, very rich people were able to stash their money in the Cayman Islands, take advantage of all type of loopholes, uh, are paying rather low effective tax rates, in many cases lower than police officers or firemen or, 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 or teachers or nurses. So I think that this is, in fact, opposition to this agreement should be uh, tripartisan. You should have conservative Republicans, liberal Democrats. I'm an independent progressive. Uh, I can tell you, Mr. Mr. President, that in the last uh, three days, my office has received probably close to 3,000 phone calls, 98% uh, of them against this agreement, probably higher than 98%, and just a huge number of emails uh, also overwhelmingly against this agreement. I suspect, I don't know this for a fact, uh, that this is the kind of message that the American people are sending us uh, all over America. But I think they've got to, stay, they are, got to continue to do that. They have got to make it clear 
so that we can win over at least a handful of Republicans and some wavering Democrats and say, wait a second, we are not going to hold hostage extending middle class tax breaks in order to give tax breaks to billionaires. We're not going to hold hostage extending unemployment for workers who have lost their jobs by giving tax breaks to people who don't need it. And I think, Mr. President, if the American people give voice to what they are feeling, which uh, this is not a good agreement, <clears throat> that we can do a lot better, I think, Mr. President, we can defeat this proposal and we can come back with a much, much better proposal which protects the unemployed, extends unemployment benefits, protects the middle class, extends the Bush tax cuts for 98 percent of the population and protects a lot of important programs, making college more affordable, making child care more affordable, and, and helping us transform our energy system. There's a lot that we can do if we defeat this proposal and if the American people, we're not going to do it inside the Beltway. That I am absolutely sure of. Republicans are very united, uh, but what we have to do is win at least a handful of them, a handful of them, and some wavering Democrats uh, to say, Mr. President, Republican leadership, uh, you guys have got to involve Congress in this discussion. I was very pleased uh, yesterday that the uh, Democratic caucus said, sorry, we're not bringing that proposal onto the floor. And I applaud Speaker Pelosi and the Democratic uh, caucus for saying that. It took a lot of courage. A uh, congressman from the state of Vermont, Peter Welch, played an important role. And I applaud uh, Congressman Welch. Congressman Peter DeFazio played an important role. Congratulate him. But I congratulate mostly the caucus from saying, we can do better. We can do better than we are doing. But let me be very frank. We're not going to do better unless the American people uh, stand up and help us. We're going to need a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, a lot of messages so that our, all of our colleagues in the House and the Senate understand the American people do not want to see their kids having to pay off the debt incurred by giving tax breaks uh, to billionaires. Mr. President, um, this agreement, you know, doesn't come out of the blue. It comes within a context that I think frightens uh, many people in this country. I think uh, many Americans have a sinking feeling that there is something very, very wrong uh, in our country today. Uh, I know that my father uh, came to this country at the age of 17 uh, without a penny in his pocket uh, and became the proudest American that you can ever see. He didn't have much of an education. But he knew that this country gave him a great opportunity, and that is a story. That's the American story. That's what it's all about. And millions and millions of families, whether they came from other countries, whether they, you know, just made it on their own. I know we have heard uh, a majority leader, Senator Harry Reid, talking about his experience growing up in a desperately poor family. That's what America is about. But I think there are a lot of folks out there who believe, and the facts back them up, there's something wrong. And what's going on in this country is the middle class is collapsing, poverty is increasing, and I think what people worry about, you know, and I've got four kids and I've got six grandchildren, I'm not worried about me, I'm worrying about what happens to my kids and my grandchildren. And we have some wonderful young pages here, and, and we're sitting on the floor, and, and we worry about their futures as well. And we don't want to see our kids and our grandchildren be the first generation in the modern history of America to have a lower standard of living than their parents. We don't want to see this country economy, the economy of this country, move in the wrong way. We don't want to race to the bottom. We want to see our kids live healthier and better lives than we do. Not have to work longer hours, not getting a lower quality of education or less education. That is not the history of this great country. And I want to spend a minute now in talking about one aspect of what's going on in this country that does not get the kind of attention that it deserves. And, and there are obvious reasons why, having to do with who owns the media and corporate control over the media, having to do with who pays, uh, who provides the campaign contributions that elect members of the House and the Senate, having to do with all the lobbyists that surround this institution that, you know, Wall Street and the oil companies spend, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, lobbyist campaign contributions. We don't talk about an issue. 
And the very simple issue that I want to talk about for a moment is who is winning and who's losing in the economy. You know, I come from New England. Everybody follows the Celtics, and we follow the Red Sox, and we follow the Patriots. And when everyone says, okay, who won the game? Patriots win or they lose? That's what you want to know. Who's winning? Who's losing? <clears throat> and in fact, in America, it's pretty clear in the economy who's winning and losing. Vast majority of people, working people, middle class people, low income people are losing. That's who's losing. And it is very clear who is winning. The wealthiest people in this country are doing phenomenally well. They are winning the economic struggle. In America today, Mr. President, and again, we don't talk about this too much. We don't talk about it too much, but it's time we did. In America today, we have the most unequal distribution of wealth and income in the industrialized world. Now, I haven't heard too many people, Mr. President, talk about that issue. Why not? Our Republicans want, for Republican colleagues, want huge tax breaks for the richest people in this country. But the reality is, is that the top 1% already today owns more wealth than the bottom 90%. How much more do they want? When is enough enough? Do you want it all? We already have millions of families today that have zero wealth. They own less, they owe more than they own. Millions of families have zero, below zero wealth. We are living in a situation where the top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 90%. Top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 90%. And Mr. President, that is simply unacceptable. Today in our country, and this is something we must be absolutely ashamed about and have got to address that instead of giving tax breaks to billionaires, maybe we should appreciate the fact that about 25% of our children are dependent on food stamps. We should understand that in the industrialized world, the United States of America has the, as this chart shows, the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world. Is this America? Is this America? The United States today has over 20 percent of its kids living in poverty. In Finland, the number is about 2 or 3 percent. Norway, maybe 4 percent. Sweden, maybe 4.5 percent. Switzerland, 6 percent, whatever it may be. But here we are. If you're watching on television, what you're seeing is the red line. Here's the United States, well over 20 percent. Here's the Netherlands in second place. Looks to me like about 7 percent. This is the future of America. So we are sitting here talking about an agreement which says let's give huge tax breaks to billionaires, and here's the reality. We have a rate of childhood poverty far, far surpassing any other country on earth. And let me tell you something else. I don't know that we have a chart for this, but it is the other half of the equation. What do you think happens when you have millions and millions of kids living in poverty? What do you think happens when you have kids who are dropping out of school when they're 13 or 14? I will tell you what happens. Because I talked to a fellow in Vermont who runs one of our jails. And he said that about half the kids who drop out of school end up in the penal system. That's what happens. So the result is the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world. And then what we end up with is more people behind bars than any other country on earth. You got that? China is a communist totalitarian society, much, much larger than the United States of America, which is a democratic society. We have more people in jail than China and more people in jail than any other country. So what we end up doing, which seems to me not to be terribly bright, is we end up spending perhaps $50,000 a year keeping people in jail 
because they dropped out of school, they never found a job, they got hooked up on drugs or whatever, and we pay to put them in jail rather than investing in childcare, in education, in sustaining their families. So, Mr. President, when we look at the context in which this agreement was reached, we have got to see that it takes place at a time when the rich are already doing phenomenally well, while we have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world. Mr. President, during the uh, eight years of President Bush, the wealthiest 400 Americans, that's not a lot of people, 400 families, saw their income more than double while their income tax rates dropped almost in half. So you got 400 families, all of whom are already multi, multi millionaires. During the eight years of President Bush, their income more than doubled while their income tax rates dropped almost in half. I would say to my colleagues here in the Senate, we don't have to worry about these guys. They're doing just fine. They don't need an extension of tax breaks. Mr. President, the wealthiest 400 Americans now earn on average $345 million a year, and they pay an effective tax rate of 16.6 percent. How's that? All right. Top 400 wealthiest people in this country earn $345 million a year, and they pay an effective tax rate of 16.6 percent. They do not need an extension of tax breaks. And by the way, for the United States of America, this effective tax rate of 16.6 percent on average is the lowest tax rate for the very rich in America that has ever been. It's ever been. So we've already given the wealthiest people in this country the lowest effective, effective tax rates in the history of our country. That's what we've done. On record, at least since they've been keeping records. So the idea of giving these guys who are doing phenomenally well, who already own more wealth than the bottom 90 percent, more tax breaks is totally absurd. Mr. President, under uh, the eight years of President uh, Bush, the wealthiest 400 Americans, now we talked about how they doubled their incomes. Incomes is what happens in one year. Under the eight years of Bush, the wealthiest 400 Americans increased their wealth by more than $380 billion. 400 families increased their wealth by $380 billion. That averages to almost a billion dollars a family. A billion dollars in eight years. That's the average. Some obviously are more. Collectively, and I know this is not an issue that we talk about too much, collectively the 400 richest Americans have accumulated $1.27 trillion in wealth. If any of them die this year, their heirs can receive, right now, all of this money tax-free because the inheritance tax has been eliminated in 2010 as part of the Bush tax uh, estate tax uh, repeal this year. Uh, Mr. President, the top 25 hedge fund managers last year made a combined $25 billion in income, a combined $1 billion per person. Okay? So if you are a hedge fund manager, you're doing pretty, pretty good. And I mentioned a moment ago, we tried just the other day to get checks of $250 out for disabled vets and senior citizens on Social Security who haven't had a COLA in two years, couldn't get them that check. But the top 25 hedge fund managers last year made a combined $25 billion in income, a billion dollars per person, and our Republican friends say, oh, my word, my word, we have got to lower their taxes. Last year, Mr. President, ExxonMobil, the Bank of America, and other large profitable corporations paid no federal income taxes. 
So what you got is a tax system which is totally distorted in the sense that it allows large profitable corporations to pay in some cases and in many cases zero. And in fact last year, <laughs> you know, it, it, it would be funny if it really wasn't pathetic. Uh, and here you have, as I understand it, last year ExxonMobil, which made 19 billion, paid nothing in taxes. Bank of America, Bank of America, huge bailout for the American taxpayer, paying their executives all kinds of fancy, huge compensation packages. They got a refund check from the IRS. That's how absurd the situation is. And people say, oh my word, in order to, to, to deal with our deficit, we're going to have to cut back on Medicare and Medicaid and education. We can't afford it. I guess we can afford to allow ExxonMobil, the most profitable corporation in the history of the world, to make huge sums of money and pay nothing in taxes. We can afford to do that, but we can't afford to protect working families and the middle class. Uh, Mr. President, in the year 2005, one out of every four large corporations in the United States paid no federal income taxes on revenue of $1.1 trillion. Now, what do you think? Maybe before we start cutting Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and veterans programs, maybe we want to ask some of these very large and profitable corporations to pay at least something in taxes. From 1998 to 2005, two out of every three corporations in the United States paid no federal income taxes according to the GAO report. Sadly, the economic pain that millions of people are experiencing didn't even begin as a result of the Wall Street bailout. The middle class was collapsing long before that. It's wrong to blame Bush for all of the problems. He contributed a lot to it, but not all. That trend has been going on for many, many years. As the Washington Post reported last January, and let me quote from an article because, again, I want to put the economic reality facing the middle class in contrast to the economic reality facing the very rich in that broad context of this agreement signed by the President and the Republican leadership. As the Washington Post reported last January, and I quote, the past decade, the Bush eight years plus two years, was the worst for the U.S. economy in modern times. It was, according to a wide range of data, a lost decade for American workers. A lost decade for American workers. Do you know why people are furious? Do you know why they're angry at Washington and everybody else? The last decade was, according to the Washington Post, a lost decade for American workers. There has been zero net job creation since December 1999. 12 years, zero job creation, which is why unemployment is so high, not only for the general population, but even worse for our young people, kids getting out of high school, young people graduating college. According to the Washington Post, um, this came from the Washington Post in January, middle-income households made less in 2008 when adjusted for inflation than they did in 1999. In other words, the American economy has turned into a nightmare for tens of millions of families. Imagine that. Middle income households made less in 2008 when adjusted for inflation than they did in 1999. And the number is sure to have declined further during a difficult 2009. That's, they, didn't get all, they didn't have those numbers, but because of the Wall Street collapse, that certainly is the case. So what are we talking about? You're talking about, as I've just demonstrated, the people on top seeing a doubling of their income while their effective tax rates are going down. You're seeing the middle class collapsing. And what this agreement says is, we're gonna provide huge tax breaks 
for millionaires and billionaires. That is insane. And only within the Beltway could an agreement like that be negotiated. As I mentioned earlier, we have in the last three days received thousands and thousands and thousands of phone calls and emails to my office. And over 98%, I dare say 99%, say this is not a good agreement. Don't support it. Uh, Mr. President, I've been joined on the floor by the very distinguished senator from the state of Louisiana. Uh, and I am, uh, I ask unanimous consent that I be, be permitted to enter into a, a colloquy uh, with Senator Landry. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Well, Senator Landry, I, I, I thank you very much for joining us here. And I just wondered if you could uh, give the American people your thought about this agreement and, and what's been going on. I thank the senator. Um, I thank the senator from. I thank the senator from Vermont for his um, eloquent and passionate presentation for hours this morning, and he clearly has presented to this chamber and to the American people some stark realities that are unpleasant. Um, some people might even find them hard to believe, but he has done his homework. He has documented what he has said, and in that backdrop, it does make this agreement made between the Republican leadership and the President of the United States even harder for some of us to understand. And I want to acknowledge, as the Senator said, I know there are pressures on all sides and their time is running out. We've got to make a decision about <clears throat> tax cuts in a short period of time. We don't have the benefit of several months or even a half a year. I understand the pressures of time. But as the senator from Vermont pointed out, how about the pressures of the middle class? What about these pressures? What about this pain? And I was wondering, because I wanted to ask the senator from Vermont, I was not able to follow his entire presentation this morning, did he quote from the income and inequity and the Great Recession, the report done by the U.S. Uh, Congress Joint Economic Committee, uh, represented by uh, or led by Charles Schumer, did Senator Schumer, did you quote from this? We quoted from a number of studies, but not that one, Senator. Well, I'd like to add in our colloquy um, if he was aware that according to this report that just came out September of this year, it says income inequality has skyrocketed skyrocketed. Economists concur that income equality has risen dramatically over the past three decades. Middle class income stagnated under President Bush during the recovery of the 1990s under President Clinton. Middle class incomes grew at a healthy pace. However, during the jobless recovery of the 2000s under President Bush, that trend has reversed course. Middle class incomes continue to fall well into the recovery, never regained their highs of 2001. The report goes on to say, which is frightening, which is why I have been raising my voice in opposition so strongly to some parts of this package, is that this report says, Senator, high levels of income inequity may precipitate economic crisis. In other words, if the middle class can't see light at the end of the tunnel, and if the economy itself can't grasp a way for the middle class to grow, Senator, this recession may never end no matter how much money you give to the very wealthy. I mean, this is the reality that we're facing at this moment, how to end this recession. Now, Republicans weren't completely to blame for it. Democrats weren't completely, you know, innocent or vice versa, but the, the, it's not about who to blame, it's about how to fix it. And we're about to pick up a $980 billion hammer next week and attempt to fix it. A, are we hitting the nail right? <laughs> you don't have many $980 billion hammers to pick up. I mean, we're borrowing this one. 
So let's hit it right. This is an important issue before our country. I think that's what the senator is saying. Am I putting words into your mouth, Senator? Is this what you're trying to explain? No, exactly. And the point cannot be understated. What Senator Landrieu is saying is that if you have a collapsing middle class and people are unable to purchase anything, it impacts the entire economy. The economy can't grow. We can't grow jobs if people don't have enough money to buy products made by other people. And if all of the, or a substantial part of the wealth of this nation accrues in the hands of a few, I mean, they can get three yachts and eight airplanes, I guess, but there is a limit to what they can purchase. And what there's a limit to what they can consume. And what the senator is saying, and what I'm saying, and I want to be very clear, because the senator and I don't agree on every uh, piece of legislation. He tends to be a little bit more liberal and progressive in his politics than I am, but on this subject, we are both equally concerned about the shrinking of the middle class. And I want to say, from my perspective, the senator may have a different view. I'm talking about the broad middle class. Incomes of 50000 to 500000 Now, in my state, $500,000 of income, I'm not talking about net worth, I'm talking about income, is a huge amount of money. In fact, I brought a graph that I'm going to, here, it's right here, to show here that 84% of the households in Louisiana, so when I talk about middle class, 84% of the households in Louisiana make less than 75,000. 84%. Now, most people in Louisiana, most, believe they're in the middle class. But 84% make below 75,000. So when I use the term middle class, and we all have a different view, I, I try to say the broad middle class between 50,000 and 500. If you have 500,000 in income, you're quite wealthy in Louisiana. But I realize that we're not New York. We're D Connecticut, California. Maybe if you make 300 or $400,000 in income in some of these places, you don't consider yourself very wealthy or rich. I think by Louisiana standards you would be. But this is a big nation, so I want to be as broad as I can possibly be here. I'm not talking about the wealthy being 400 or 500,000. That may not be the case in California. But what we're talking about in this tax bill is borrowing $50 billion to give tax breaks to families earning over a million. So as the senator from Vermont said, whether you put your mark at 250000 or 100000 or 500000 we could uh, disagree about how broad the middle class is. But is there anyone, anyone, anyone in this chamber, on any side of the aisle, from any state, that believes seriously, given what the senator from Vermont just outlined, which is really not debatable. I mean, these economic studies are not just from one side of the aisle or another, that we should actually, next week, provide $50 billion in extended benefits for the families in America who are making more than a million dollars a year. When the inequities are so great, when the needs of the middle class are so great, when there is no evidence to suggest that even after this tax cut that I've seen that's convincing <clears throat> that the recession will end. And we're doing this for two years. What happens, Mr. President, if the recession doesn't end? <laughs> We've borrowed all of this money to provide the extension of these tax cuts and in addition given the $50 billion to the million dollar earners in this country. What do we do then? Go borrow another trillion and try it again? I think we have to try something different. <laughs> now, I don't know if the senator has another point before I go into just a few um, thoughts that I have. I wanted to ask him if he... Yes. Thank you very much and, and, and agree with what she has been saying. I was mentioning earlier, uh, Senator, that uh, the calls that are coming in and the emails that are coming into my office are overwhelmingly, like 99% against I don't know what's going on in your office. Are you getting calls in? I'm getting calls, actually, and I checked this morning, uh, about 50% for, 50% against. Now, the state of Louisiana is a little different than the state of, of Vermont. Many of the calls coming in from around the country um, are against um, giving... Uh, well, actually, let me say this. Most of the calls coming in are absolutely against giving 
tax cuts to people over a million dollars. No, okay. That's what yeah, I'm that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, overwhelmingly, people are calling in saying, "Is that really happening?" And geez, and in fact, my office told me today that actually ten people called that had incomes over a million dollars, which I found very interesting. <laughs> To say they supported my position. Tell Senator Landrew I make a million dollars a year and I agree with her. So I, I know people are listening. So I thank those callers. <clears throat> you know, they make a million dollars over a year. They said, please use the money for somebody else or something else. I'm doing fine. I'm counting my blessings. I survived the recession. They know that 33,000 people are getting ready to run out of unemployment benefits in Louisiana alone if we don't extend it. They know that middle class families making under $75,000 in income or $200,000 in income or even $300,000. You can have $300,000 of income in Louisiana, be a very strong business person and be doing very well and have eight children. You know, you have large families out in the West. We have very large families in the South. No one ever gives us credit enough, I think, for that. The fact that people work very hard, sometimes a mother and a father. Their income might be 200, 250,000. But with six children, that doesn't go that far these days, Senator. And with eight children, I grew up in a neighborhood where we routinely had 12 children in a house. How much money do you think you have to make to feed and clothe and send to college 12 children? My, my father sent nine of us to college. We never made anywhere near that money. I still think it was a miracle any of us ever got there. But nonetheless, the issue is next week we're going to debate this agreement. And I want to say I support extending tax cuts to the middle class, to the broad middle class. But there is something terribly wrong here in Denmark. Something is not right in Denmark. If we're spending or borrowing $50 billion, which is about what it cost to extend income tax rates, the lower rates, and the dividend rates, and the capital gains rates to people making over a million dollars. Someone on the radio today said, well, Senator, don't you think that uh, giving tax cuts, that will stimulate the economy? I said, no. I'm not an economist, but every economist that I've read on this tax package says that's one of the least stimulative, am I correct, Senator? One of the least stimulative provisions of the bill. So I want to know next week when we're debating this, I'd like at least one Republican, just one. It could be the minority leader, Mitch McConnell. It could be the budget director, Judd Gregg. It could be just one Republican to give a passionate argument for why they insisted this be in the package. I'd just like to listen to it. I'd like to hear it with my own ears. What was it about it that they thought was so important that they had to have it in the package? Because I know as angry as I am with the president right now about some matters, I know the president did not insist this be in the package. I know enough about him to know that he didn't call everybody in the room and say, oh, we forgot something. Let's make sure that this tax extension includes people over a million dollars. So I know he didn't give that speech. I want to know who did. Who did give it? because your constituents should know about it. And the American people have a right to know. That's one thing about our democracy. It's open. It could be more open. We could be like Britain, where they all stand up and talk at one another in one of the rooms. It's very interesting. I find it very interesting to watch sometimes. We don't do that. But at least if the people of Britain want to know what their people are saying, they can hear them. Somebody said this. I'd like to know who, and where, and when. Was it in the Oval Office? Was it in the cloakroom? Because I am going to be forced to vote, because now I think the Senator understands we aren't going to have any amendments. So I'm going to be forced to vote and have to choose, which is going to be a very tough choice, between extending tax cuts for 84% of the people in my state <clears throat> that make less than $75,000, which of course I want to do, 
even though we have to borrow the money to do it, we can't not do it. I mean, the economic circumstances are such why we have to do it. But now, in order to get them help, I've got to say yes to something that I've talked about, and I want to be serious about this. I'm very serious about it. For me, borders on moral recklessness. I've been criticized on both sides of this debate. How can you use words like this? <laughs> I don't know. I went to Catholic school. We went to Mass almost every week. Every week. Every week. The priest would say, don't take more than you need. Don't be greedy. Share with others. I mean, did I go to the wrong school? So I'd like to know. Maybe those lessons were missed on the other side. And I don't normally speak like this. I've been criticized for it. I, I'm very, very torn. Because I like to be part of a team. I understand, the senator from Vermont, that we can't have every package exactly the way we believe. And I understand that. I've had to vote for some things that were hard for me to stomach. And I've done it because there were other good things in the bill. That's the way the process works. But I actually cannot remember a time on either an appropriations bill of this magnitude or a tax bill of this magnitude that we've been asked to cast a vote for something that on its face is so, so reckless, so unnecessary, so sort of in your face to the poor, in your face to the middle class. We're going to take our money. Don't you say a word about it. Who said that? Did Warren Buffett come down here and ask for it? Did Boone Pickens come down here and ask for it? Did the Gates come down here and ask for it? Who asked for it? Why do you think you deserve it? And what senator put their name on it? Now, I have a few more things to say. I don't want to keep the senator from Vermont tied up. Is it appropriate? The senator from Louisiana is making some very, very important points, and, and I appreciate it, and I, I, listen, I look forward to hearing what she has to say. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, I wanted just to say a few other things about this whole situation, because the senator from Vermont and I agree on some things of parts of this, obviously this one. But we had a, a, a big difference, and I wanted to show uh, this just from my perspective. Uh, I voted for the original tax cuts. I, I'm not sure that the, the senator from Vermont did. So I, and there were very good reasons on both sides. But I'd like to take a minute, because I've got, as I said, critics on both sides here, and I want to explain, not explain, but share some thoughts about that and make something very clear. I was one of 12 Democrats, there are only seven of us left in the chamber today, that voted for the Bush tax cuts. They were for the middle class and the poor and the wealthy. Everybody got income tax relief, capital gains tax relief, dividend tax relief. Senator Lincoln and I and others worked very hard to make sure that in that package, even though I would have designed it differently if I could have done it myself, but there are no czars around here. This is democracy. I understand it. I've been doing it for 30 years. We worked hard to shape that package the best we could to direct it and target it to the middle class. There are many critics of that that say, you didn't do it well enough. You didn't send it to the middle class. You sent it to the wealthy. I disagree. I think that we did as well as we could to send it to the middle class, although the higher brackets were lowered as well. But I'll tell you, the big difference was it was paid for when we voted for it. There was a $128 billion annual surplus. In other words, we were spending $128 billion less than we were taking in. What a happy time that was. We were paying for our Pell Grants. We were paying for education. We were paying for health care. We had surpluses in Social Security, Senator will remember. And we had a $128 billion surplus that year alone. And surpluses as far as the eye can see. This is before 9-11. So the 12 of us, let me speak just for myself, thought, 
what a situation this is. Democrats had taken the tough vote. Not one Republican had voted for this budget reconciliation that, as you know, you were in. I think the, uh, the senator was then in the House and took a tough vote along with many Democrats to put us on that path. Middle class was expanding. Jobs were being created at unprecedented levels. And yes, we were creating millionaires. I'd like to say this. I love creating more millionaires. It's why I got into politics. One of the reasons I like when people are successful. I love to hear stories about my constituents who came from poor families, whose mothers were household servants, whose fathers never went to high school. I love to hear about these smart little girls from Girt Town who got straight A's in school, went down the street to Xavier University, got their pre-med degrees, went to become a doctor, became a doctor, and now they're millionaires. I don't decry that. I celebrate it. I'm the one that fought for them to get their scholarships. Not individually, but generally. It's what I do. It's what senators do. It's what House members do. I am so mad at people saying to me as a Democrat, we don't like people that are rich. We have something against them. Nothing could be further from the truth. I love the book, The Millionaire Next Door. It talks about how it's a myth that most millionaires in America have inherited the money. The fact of the matter is, we've created such a great country over 250 years, we've actually found the way for poor people to go from nothing to huge wealth and to create a life-changing opportunity for their children and grandchildren. We, we celebrate it. We write movies about it. Our libraries are full of books about it. There's nothing wrong with that. So when we had a surplus, I thought we should give tax breaks and use some of that money. But today we're being asked to provide tax cuts when the deficit is, and I want to get this number because it's shocking actually, it is 10 times greater than the surplus. It is 1.294 trillion. That is what the annual deficit is this year. So I'm going to go back. When we did the tax cuts, we were generating $128 billion surplus every year. Surplus is as far as the eye could see. We thought, well, maybe we should give a third of this bounty in tax cuts. We had made investments in other things. But today, after what the Senator of Vermont has described as the economic inequality in the country, when we have no surplus in sight, the biggest, the largest, most ferocious recession since the Great Depression, and we're running an annual deficit of $1.29 trillion, someone had the nerve on the other side of the aisle to say, wait, before you close the deal, before you shut the door, before you stop the printing press, please put in the people in America that make over a million dollars. Now, for that $50 billion, there are lots of ways that we could save if we could correct this deal. I don't think we can. But if we could, as the senator knows, do we have men and women in the military? Do you know what their COLA is going to be this year, Senator from Vermont? Because it's about, I think it's, what, only 1.4 percent? I, I, uh, that's what my understanding is. And it's I about? And a lot of the folks in the military are very upset about that. Every person in uniform is making, only getting a COLA this year of 1.4 percent. Did anyone over there, when they raised their hand to say, let's put the millionaires in, did you all not think about this? We could have taken that money and given it to them for one year bonus. They most certainly deserve it. They're coming back without eyes, legs, leaving some of their limbs in Iraq and Afghanistan. Did anybody over there think about that? The senior citizens that Senator has been such an advocate for, they're not seeing the kind of COLA that they normally get. Talk about stimulus. Every dollar I think you give to a senior citizen, Senator, would you say, it gets right away spent. 
They have to buy food for it. They're not going out and perusing, you know, a yacht or an airplane that they could or could not buy. They don't really need it. They need to eat. They go to the corner drugstore or they need to get their medicine. They spend it. I mean, yes, we give money to the poor on the Democratic side and to the middle class because it's the right thing to do, but it actually happens to be also the smart thing to do for the economy and for jobs. So when people say, oh, the senators flip-flopped, you know, on taxes, I don't understand how to say something. I voted for tax cuts when we had a surplus. I am challenged about how to address this package, most certainly want to extend it for the middle class, most certainly want to extend unemployment. People are unemployed not because they're lazy, for heaven's sakes. They're unemployed because there are no jobs for them. It's some of the longest-term unemployment that we've had in our nation's history. So the other side is making us feel they say to us, well, we gave you the unemployment, so surely you should give us the tax breaks for millionaires. Is that really an equal trade? And if somebody believes that, actually, I've heard commentators say it, you know, on different networks. They've, I've been on these news programs, and they say, but you've got the unemployment, so that's a fair trade. If there's a senator that thinks that, I'd love for them to say that next week, because I think that would be great to have on the record. So this situation is what the Louisiana uh, families in my state are facing. So obviously, I would like to provide tax relief for these families. Um, <clears throat> We have less than 1.8% are making over $200,000. And I'm checking right now to find out how many families in Louisiana actually make over a million. I was told it was 3,200. That number might be too high. The senator from West Virginia told me in his state it's 599 people in West Virginia make over a million dollars a year. But yet it looks like that is the package. So we're going to be in a tough situation without amendments, having to vote for it. I'm going to see what my constituents are saying over the weekend. But I want to say one more thing about this inequity and then turn it back over to the senator from Vermont. Besides the other things that have been put into the record about the inequality, <clears throat> the challenges before the, our country right now, I came across some data, and I'd like the senator to, if he had just one more minute, to, uh, to be on the floor to listen to this, because it's very, very, it was very startling. Senator Landry, I'm not going anywhere. Okay. So take as much time as thank, you want. I thank the senator. I wasn't sure of what his time well, I'm was. Here. But I'm here. I'm the chair of the Small Business Committee, and I had a hearing. Uh, I have many hearings, but one in the last three months. And some of the testimony was startling to me. I wanted to share this with the senator. It's in the census data of the 2000 census data. Someone was testifying about why this recession was taking so long to get over, and they were giving just some figures about the status of the economy and the wealth or incomes of broad sections of, of the population. And they said, sort of off the cuff, just like, and ho-hum, and today is Monday, they said, and, by the way, uh, the average net worth, sorry, the median net worth of households in America, the average median net worth, not income, net worth of households is 67,000. So that's very interesting. I thought it would be higher than that. I mean, that's taking everything that you own minus everything you owe, and the difference is your net worth. I thought people might have more than that. I mean, in terms of equity in their homes, you know, a couple of hundred thousand, 67,000. It was concerning to me. So I said, well, do you have that broken down by race by any chance? Oh, yes, ma'am, we have that. So would you share it? They did, and I'm going to share it with you because I have not recovered from what I heard. The gentleman says to me, well, for white families in America, the average median, not average, median, which is 50% more, 50% less, the median 
For white households, Senator, is 87,000. 87,000. For Hispanic families, it is 8,000. And for African American families, it is 5,000. Now, I want to repeat that again. 50% of all families in America who are Caucasian, their net worth is 67,000 or less. For Hispanic families in America, 50% of all Hispanic households, their net worth is 8,000. And for African American families today, 2010, you know, 40 years after the peak of the civil rights movement and 150 years or so after the Civil War and all the things we think we've done to try to get people in a more equal position in our society is $5,000. That's including home equity. That's including home ownership, I mean. Without home ownership, without home ownership, that net worth for African American families falls to $1,000. So when people say people are in pain and suffering and anxious and they can't buy anything, well, you wonder why. There's no cushion in a recession like this. How brutal is a recession to people that have so little cushion for a middle class family of any race if you lose your job, you can get unemployment, you've got some equity in your home, maybe you have some savings, you can fall back, there's a cushion, you can land, you can bounce back up. How brutal is this recession to millions of families in America that have no cushion? They're just hitting hard rock. They're just hitting steel. There's no cushion there. And you wonder why people are angry? You wonder why this Tea Party movement is festering. You wonder why people want to, you know, people are so angry that call. I understand that anger. I'm so angry myself. I don't know what to do. If, if I could interrupt. My good friend, and I, and I thank her very much. And, and she is right. No great secret to anybody here. Her politics and mine are not the same on many issues. But she's down here speaking from her heart, coming from a state of Louisiana, and not radically different in Vermont. We've got a lot of struggling families. And I want to just reiterate a point, because she, she's been talking, I, I think, so effectively about the stress on the middle class and working families in her state and around the country. I want to reiterate this point, Senator, if I might. And I'm not here to pick on George W. Bush, but during the presidency, his eight years, the wealthiest 400 Americans, those are pretty high up guys, that ain't in the middle class, though, how to, no matter how broadly you define that, their income more than doubled. Got that? While their income tax rates, their income tax rates dropped almost in half. The wealthiest 400 Americans now earn on average 345 million a year and pay an effective tax rate of 16.6 percent on average. That's the lowest tax rate for wealthy individuals on record. So the point is, Senator Landrieu is talking about, and I'm talking about, that people out in the real world are working longer hours for low wages. Median family income has declined. People are scared to death that for the first time in our modern history, their kids are going to have a lower standard of living than they do. You're hearing that in Louisiana? I am. All right. And the people on top are doing well. And Senator Landry is asking a very simple question. Millions of people are asking the same question. The wealthiest people are becoming much richer. Middle class is declining. Poverty is increasing. Who decided? Who are the people who said that billionaires really need an extended tax break and a reduction in the estate tax? It is a very simple question that she's asking. It's a very profound question because it speaks to what this country is all about. And I, I didn't mean to interrupt the senator. No, and I, I thank the, um, the senator from Vermont, and I want to submit to the record this income inequality um, and Great Recession report from Senator Schumer and um, uh, the Joint Economic uh, committee. Without objection. Thank you. But I want to go back to a uh, point about this so that I'm not misunderstood. I guess no matter what I say, 
critics will take it and, and do what they will with it. But I am not against tax cuts. I voted for them in many times in my life when we had surpluses. I've even been pressured to vote for things and have done so even when we didn't have the surpluses we had when they were targeted and focused and there actually had been some rational thought attached to well we might need to borrow some money like we did in the stimulus package and spend it because if we don't get some spending going we could slip further into a recession even conservative economists counseled us on parts of the stimulus package which by the way contrary to popular myth was about the same size as this package. It's, this package is actually larger. This package is going to be 900 billion. The stimulus was 800 something. It's going to be less. But in that stimulus package, there was about a third of it were tax cuts. Do you remember that, Senator, Mr. President? A third of it were tax cuts. It wasn't all just spending. But every economist, re re Republican, I mean conservative, liberal, said the government's got to step up and spend in this economy because this place is shutting down, meaning the country. And so we did. People will still argue on the other side that was the wrong thing to do and we shouldn't have done it. But I'm here to say that for the $2.8 billion that was spent in Louisiana through that stimulus package, tax cuts and spending, I'd like to ask my legislature who's struggling to balance the budget as I speak They've been in budget committee over the last couple of weeks. Where would you be today without the $2.8 billion? I don't know how much went to Vermont or went to California or went to Colorado. But, you know, people say it was a failure. Let me say that $2.8 billion went to our state and it warded off some draconian cuts that our cities and counties and parishes would have had to take. And it warded off tax increases so that governors didn't have to raise taxes and mayors didn't have to raise taxes all over this country. Some of them have done that, but they've tried to limit it because they know how fragile this middle class is. I am not unmindful of the importance of providing tax cuts when we can. But when we're asked to vote on a package that has a provision like this, that borders on moral recklessness, I have to catch my breath and say, whose idea was this? I'd like to know. So it's going to be a long weekend. It's going to be a long 30 hours of debate. I am glad that the senator from Vermont is going to make sure that we take every one of those 30 hours post-cloture, if we even get to cloture on this bill, because I think the American people are going to be waiting around to find out whose idea was this. The Senator for Louisiana, she makes a very important point, and that is ultimately we are a democracy and it's the American people who make the decisions. And I know she shares with me the belief that the American people have got to become engaged in this debate, this very, very important debate, which has a lot to do with the future of this country. And Senator Landrieu asked a very, very simple question, which I would like and I think the American people would like an answer to. Whose brilliant idea was it that in a time when we have seen an explosion in income and wealth to the people on top, while their tax rates have already gone down, whose brilliant idea was it that we drive up the national debt, ask our kids to pay higher taxes to pay off that debt in order to give tax breaks to people who don't need it? That's the question Senator Landrieu was asking. I think the American people need an answer to that. And my hope is that millions of Americans start calling their senators to ask that question. Idea. <laughs> Whose, Whose idea, idea was it? it? And I would like to know, I don't think, you know, in the irony here, I think Senator Landrieu made this point as well, there are millionaires out there who say, thank you, I don't need it. I am more worried about the kids of this country or our crumbling infrastructure than giving me a tax break that I don't need. I can't spend it. Thanks very much. That's what Warren Buffett has said, right? That's what Bill Gates has said. I know Ben Cohen of Ben and Jerry's has said it. You got many millionaires are saying it. We are giving some of these guys something they don't even want. So I just want to, you know, thank Senator Landrieu very much, uh, not only for her being here today, and please continue, uh, but for raising these important issues.
Just one more point, and I'm going to uh, turn this back over to the senator. Um, I was on the Greta Van Susken show last night, and I said Greta's always a tough, tough interviewer, but she's fair, so I'm happy to go on her program. It was a tough interview, but, you know, we debated these things, and I think that's important. Didn't debate them here, debate them on television, debate them on town hall meetings. That's what a democracy is about. She asked me a question I'd like to answer. She said, Senator, we're so frustrated. Nobody ever hears anybody say they want to cut spending, they want to eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse. So let me concede this point that, for me, I don't think we do talk enough about eliminating the waste eliminating the fraud and eliminating the abuse. I think we should spend more time, and I am going to commit myself, because I know the American people say, every time we ask for a tax cut, you say we can't afford it. Why don't you cut some spending, et cetera? Now, let me correct. I've voted for tax cuts. I'm for tax cuts. I've even given tax cuts to people that do make higher than the 75,000 or 100,000 or 250. When we had a surplus, when I thought it was the fiscally responsible thing to do, other people could disagree. This is the first time I'm being asked to provide a tax cut for people that earn over a million dollars with a deficit. But I'll say this, I'm gonna commit myself to trying to find places that we can cut. I support the freeze, the federal freeze. I support it in appropriations this year, Senator Inouye's uh, taking down on the appropriations level eight billion below the president's budget and if we need to go even further perhaps we can but we have to be careful where we cut and I ask people to be rational about this do you want to cut Pell Grants which now are valued in 1970 I looked at this the other day and the senator from Vermont is particularly because of Claiborne Pell when the Pell Grants went in, it was a grant to help kids go to school. That still is what it does. But in the 1970s, Mr. President, the Pell Grant paid 100% of the average, you know, two-year college. It only pays 50% of that today. I think that I remember it paid almost 60 or 40% of a four-year college a public college. It only pays like 40% or less of that today. The value, because we have not kept up with a program like Pell Grants, which is a powerful tool to lift the middle class or lift the poor out of poverty and expand the middle class. So when we cut programs, let's be careful to cut the waste, cut the abuse, but let's not cut the heart out of what we're arguing for, tools, effective I, I could tools, just add to, what to expand the middle class or we will never get out of this recession. Because I promise you, the few thousand people in this country, or few tens of thousands, I don't know how many, that make more than a million dollars a year are not going to lift this country out of a recession. It is going to be the middle class. And if we don't help them get ahead, if we don't help them get training, this recession is going to go on for a long time. Well, I just wanted to add to that. The idea that one would think about cutting back on education, whether it's child care, primary school, or college, is simply cutting off our noses to spite our faces. The senator is aware that we're at one time in this country, we used to lead the world in the number of our people who graduated college we are now falling very significantly. How do you become a great economy if you don't have the scientists, the engineers, the teachers, the professionals out there? That many other countries around the world are having a higher percentage of their grad high school graduates going to college is something that we've got to address. And anyone who comes forward and says, cut education, is just moving us in exactly the wrong direction. Exactly, and I'm for more accountability. If, we, if some people on the other side of the aisle think that some of that money is being wasted or we're not getting our bang for the buck, then don't come with an across-the-board cut to Pell Grants. Come with a plan to change it and say these are the requirements for our universities. You have to graduate 65% of the kids that start, or you've got to have certain benchmarks before you can apply for, uh, for these loans or for these grants. But I'll tell you, this country is at a crossroads. And I, I know that the president and his advisors understand the extraordinary challenges before this country. I hope the members understand, 
you know, the economic danger, the, the minefield that we're in here. We, we can't make too many mistakes here. We, we just don't have, there's no cushion left. There's no surplus left. We are down to below bottom. So when we do big things like this, this is a big thing. This is a $980 billion big package. It's almost a trillion dollars. Do it the best you can do it. Don't do it recklessly. Don't do it frivolously. Don't do it for ideology. For gosh almighty sakes. And I just wish we could have fought harder for a better package. I have not yet decided how I'm going to vote, but I said if I vote, I'm not voting quietly. I may vote yes, I may vote no, but I'm going to vote with a loud voice about what I'm concerned about, what I believe my constituents are concerned about, and try to do my best to help them, uh, to support them, and to make the best decisions we can next week. But it was troubling to me. I wanted to come to the floor and speak about it, and I thank the senator from Vermont, and I yield the floor. I, I thank Senator Landrieu very much for coming, and, and I thank her because I think everybody knows that on many issues, her views and my views are different. But on this issue, I think we are speaking for the overwhelming majority of the people, not just in Louisiana and Vermont, but all over this country, who cannot understand why we give tax breaks to billionaires to drive up the deficit and the national debt at a time when the deficit and the debt are so high. So I just want to thank Senator Landrieu very much for her very articulate and heartfelt statement. I appreciate that uh, very much. Um, Mr. President, I was mentioning a moment ago uh, the great contrast about what's happening in our economy between the people on top and everybody else. And I indicated that the top 400 families during the Bush presidency alone saw their income more than double, at the same time, by the way, as their income tax rates dropped almost in half. So that's what's going on for the people on top who would make out extremely well under this agreement uh, between the president and the Republican leadership. But I also talked about what's going on to the middle class and working families of this country. And that is, if you can believe it, this is really quite amazing. Since December of 1999, this is in a Washington Post article in January, since December 1999, middle in, there has been a zero net job creation. Zero net job creation. Middle income households made less in 2008 when in, adjusted for inflation than they did in 1999. And the number is sure to have declined further in 2009. What does that mean? It means that you look at a 10-year period, people work very, very hard. Uh, in many instances, you got husbands and wives, in the vast majority of the instances, husbands and wives both working, and they're still not making enough money to pay the bills, and in fact, they have less money than they used to. When I was a kid growing up, the expectation was that to be in the middle class, what happened was that one person in those days, and I know the young people will not believe this, but this is true. Years ago in the United States, before the great global economy, before robotics, before computers, one person could work 40 hours a week and earn enough money to pay the bills for the family. One person. Today, in Vermont and throughout this country, overwhelmingly, you have husbands and wives both working, and in some instances, they're working very, very long hours. And here's the rub. Today, a two-income family has less disposable income than a one-income family did 30 years ago because wages have not kept up with inflation and because health care costs have soared, cost of education has soared, housing has soared, basic necessities have soared. This is a description of a country moving in the wrong direction. 30 years ago, a one-income family had more disposable income 
than a two-income family did today. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Maybe we'll touch on them a little bit later. One of them, in my view, has to do with our disastrous, unfettered free trade policy, which has resulted in the shutdown of tens and tens of thousands of factories in this country. Under President Bush alone, we lost some 48,000 factories. We lost, we went from 19 million manufacturing jobs to 12 million manufacturing jobs. And in many instances, those were good jobs. Where'd they go? Well, some shut down for a variety of reasons, but others shut down because we have trade laws that say you got to be a moron not to shut down in America because you go to China, go to Vietnam, go to Mexico, go to a developing country, you pay workers there a fraction of the wages you're paying in America. Why wouldn't you go? And then you just bring your products right back into this country. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I did some Christmas shopping. Frankly, we went to a couple of stores. Very hard to find a product manufactured in the United States of America. And you don't have to be a PhD in economics to understand that we're not going to have a strong economy unless we have a strong manufacturing capability, unless companies are reinvesting in Colorado or Vermont, creating good jobs here. You don't have an economic future when virtually everything you're buying is coming from China or another company, country. And we're not just talking about low-end products. This is not sneakers or a pair of pants. This is increasingly high-tech stuff. So we are, we are really forfeiting our future as a great economic nation unless we rebuild our industrial base and unless we create millions and millions of jobs producing the goods and the products that we consume. We cannot continue to just purchase products from the rest of the world. Mr. President, when we talk about the collapse of the middle class, it's important to also recognize uh, the fact, as reported in USA Today last September, and let me quote, the incomes of the young and middle-aged, especially men, have fallen off a cliff since 2000, leaving many age groups poorer than they were even in the 1970s, end of quote, USA Today. Point being, for young workers, for example, when we had a manufacturing base in America in the 40s, 50s, 60s, you could graduate high school, go out and get a job in a factory. Was it a glamorous job? No. Was it a hard job? Yes. Was it a dirty job in some cases? But if you worked in manufacturing, and especially if you had a union behind you, the likelihood is that you earn wages to take your family into the middle class, you had decent health care coverage, and you might even have a strong pension. Where are all those jobs now? During the Bush years alone, we went from 19 million jobs in manufacturing to 12 million jobs, a horrendous loss of manufacturing jobs. So if you're a kid today in Colorado and you're not, or in Vermont, and you're not of a mind for whatever reason to go to college, 30 or 40 years ago, you can go out, you get a job in a factory, and you make some money. Today, what are your options? What are your options? You can get a minimum wage job at McDonald's or maybe at Walmart's. Benefits are minimal or non-existent, and that is a significant transition of the American economy. I want to tell you something else when we talk about manufacturing. Didn't get a whole lot of publicity, but it is worth reporting here. <clears throat> the good news is <clears throat> that we have recently seen, after the loss of many, many thousands of jobs <clears throat> in the automobile industry, we have seen the auto companies, Chrysler and others, starting to rehire. <clears throat> What I think has not been widely reported is that the wages 
of the new workers who are being hired is 50 percent of the wages of the older workers in the plant. So you're going to have workers working side by side where an older worker who has been there for years is making $25, $28 an hour, and then right next to him, a new hire is making $14 an hour. And if you understand that the automobile industry was perhaps the gold standard for manufacturing in America, what do you think is going to happen to the wages of blue-collar workers in the future? If all you can get with a union behind you in automobile manufacturing is 14 bucks an hour today, what are you going to make in Colorado or in Vermont? You're going to make 10 bucks an hour, $11 an hour? Is that enough money to raise a family on? Are you going to have any benefits? Unlikely. So that's what happens. <coughs> that's what happens when your manufacturing base disappears. And that, to a significant degree, in my view, is a result of a disastrous trade policy. I've got to tell you, and I think in hindsight, most people will agree I was right. When I was over in the House, and all the corporations in the world were telling us how great NAFTA would be, free trade with Mexico, I didn't buy it. I was right. And they said, oh, it's going to be even better. We've got a free trade with China. Oh, my God. Think of how large China is and all of the American products they're going to buy over there, create all kinds of jobs in the United States. I never believed it for a moment. I'll tell you a story. I was in China a number of years ago. And I walked into, uh, as part of a congressional delegation, we went to visit Walmart in China. And the Walmart store, amazingly enough, looked a lot like Walmart in America, different products, but it looked kind of the same style product, style. And you walk in there, you walk up and down the aisles, and you see all these American products. Remember, Wilson basketballs, and you got Procter & Gamble soap products. You know, there are different products there for the, you know, Chinese, but a lot of the products were American products. Looked pretty familiar. So I asked the guy who was there with us, who was the head, I believe, of Walmart Asia, the guy who's in charge of all of the Walmarts in Asia, I asked them a simple qu a question. I said, well, tell me, how many of these products, these American company products, are actually manufactured in the United States? And he was a little bit sheepish and a little bit hesitant, and he said, well, about 1%. So obviously, what you know, everybody knew is that it is a lot cheaper for the American companies to set up plants in China, hire Chinese workers at 50 cents an hour, 75 cents an hour, whatever it is, and have them build the products for the Chinese markets than it is to pay American workers $15 an hour, $20 an hour, provide health insurance, deal with the union, deal with the environment. You know, that's not a great revelation. I think anybody could have figured that one out. But uh, the big money interests were around here. They pushed it. And Congress uh, and President Clinton at that time signed it. And off, and uh, we were off and running. So when we look at why the middle class is in the shape that it's at, and it's important to make sure that everybody understands it. Because I think, you know, one of the things that happens in this world, it's human nature, I suppose, is that people feel very guilty and responsible if they are not taking care of their families. And right now, we know that with unemployment so high, this is not just cold statistics that you're throwing out. These are people who not only were earning an income that supported their families, they had a sense of worth. Every human being wants to be productive. They want to do something. They want to be part of something. They want to go to work, earn a paycheck, bring it home. You feel good about that. Do you know what it does to somebody's sense of human worth? When suddenly you are sitting home watching the TV, you can't go out and earn a living, it destroys people. People become alcoholic. People commit suicide. People have mental breakdowns because they are no longer utilizing their skills. They're no longer being a productive member of society. That's what unemployment uh, is about. And I think that one of the reasons that unemployment is so high, one of the reasons the middle class is collapsing, has a lot to do with these disastrous trade policies. And I got to tell you, as we've been talking about all day long, these policies, these tax breaks, all of this stuff emanates from corporate leaders whose sense of responsibility is such that they want themselves to become richer, 
They want more and more profits for their company, but they could care less about the needs of the American people. I remember there was one um, CEO of a, a large, one of our largest American corporations, and he said, when I look at the future of General Electric, I see China, 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 and China. And by the way, we ended up bailing out that particular corporation. He didn't look to China to get bailed out. He looked to the taxpayers of uh, this country. But the word has got to get out to corporate America. They're going to have to start reinvesting in the United States of America. They're going to start, have to start building the products and the goods that the American people need rather than run all over the country in search of cheap labor. That is an absolute imperative if we're going to turn this economy around. Mr. President, according to a Boston Globe article uh, published uh, last year, let me quote what they say. So again, I'm trying to document here what is happening to the working class of America, because I don't want individual workers, somebody who may be hearing this on, in the TV or on the radio, say, you know, it's my fault. There's something wrong with me because I can't go out and get a job. Well, you're not alone. The entire middle class is collapsing. Our economy has shredded, shedded millions and millions of jobs. And I know that there are people out there trying so hard to find work, but that work has, is just not there. That's why we've got to rebuild the economy and create jobs. This is what the Boston Globe said last year, quote, the recession has been more like a depression for blue collar workers. And this is an important point to be made here. You know, when we talk about the economy, we kind of lump everybody together. That's wrong. The truth is that right now in the economy, people on top are doing very well. Unemployment rate for upper income people is very low, very low. They're doing okay. As opposed to, as this Boston Globe article points out, what's happening to blue collar workers. And this is what they say. The recession has been more like a depression for blue collar workers who are losing jobs much more quickly than the nation as a whole. This is the working class of America. The nation's blue collar industries have slashed one in six jobs since 2007. Let me repeat that. It's just an astronomical fact. The nation's blue collar industries, manufacturing, have slashed one in six jobs since 2007, compared with about one in 20 for all industries, leaving scores of the unemployed competing for the rare job opening in construction or manufacturing, with many unlikely to work in those fields again. Again, never. Up to 70% of unemployed blue collar workers have lost jobs permanently, meaning their old jobs won't be there when the economy recovers. End of quote. That's the Boston Globe last year. So when we talk about the economy, what we have got to do is understand that blue collar workers, middle class, young workers, are really hurting very, very much. And in the context, again, of the debate we're now having, the discussion of whether we should approve the agreement reached between the President and the Republicans on taxes, the idea of not significantly investing in our economy, but rather giving tens of billions of dollars to the very rich in, few, in more tax breaks makes no sense to many of us. When we talk about why people are angry in America, why people, when asked the question by pollsters, do you think America is moving in the right direction? And overwhelmingly, they think not. Let me tell you why they think not. This is just during the presidency of, of President uh, Bush from uh, 2001 through 2008. During that period alone, just in that period, and by the way, the, the pain is certainly continuing right now. I don't mean to suggest otherwise. During those eight years of Bush, over eight million Americans slipped out of the middle class and into poverty. Today, nearly 40 million Americans are living in poverty. 
7.8 million Americans lost their health insurance, and that is continuing. I think a recent study came out that suggests that the uninsured now are about 50 million Americans. 50 million Americans have no health insurance now. We hope that health care reform is going to make a dent in that. I think it will. But as of today, without the major provisions of health care reform being implemented, 50 million Americans, 50 million Americans without any health insurance. Mr. President, during that period, and we haven't talked about this a whole lot, there's another thing going on in the economy for the working class. Years and years ago, if you worked in a manufacturing plant, you had a union, you stood a reasonable chance of having a pension, a pension. During the Bush years, 3.2 million workers lost their pensions, and about half of American workers in the private sector have no pension coverage whatsoever. The idea today of having a defined pension plan, significantly paid for by your employer, is going the way of the dinosaur. That is just not there anymore. Workers are more and more dependent on Social Security, which has been there for 75 years, which we have got to protect and demand will be there another 75 years, because right now, millions of workers are losing their pensions. I mean, I'm throwing these statistics out, and the reason I'm doing that is I want people to appreciate that if you're hurting now, stop being ashamed. It's not, yeah, we can all do better. Every one of us can do better. But you're in an economy which is contracting, especially for the middle class and working families. According to an article in USA Today, from the year 2000 to 2008, middle class men, women have done better, middle class men experienced an 11.2 percent drop in their incomes, a reduction of $7,700 after adjusting for inflation. Middle class women in this age group saw a 4.8 percent decline in their incomes as well. So they did pretty bad, but the men did even worse. So what we are seeing is an understanding of why people are angry and why people think that this country is moving in the uh, wrong direction. Um, Mr. President, I think most people understand uh, that today our country is experiencing the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, and let me, it, and it's important to say that because again, it is hard enough when you don't have a job, when you don't have income, when your dignity and self-respect is declining. But I don't want people to be banging their own heads against the wall, blaming themselves for all of the problems. Something is going on in the nation as a whole. You're not in this alone. When we talk about working class, class families all across the country seeing a decline in their incomes. It's not because people are lazy. It's not because people are not working hard. It's not because people are not trying to find jobs. What we have is an economy which is rotting in the middle, and we've got to change the economy. If there's anything that we can say about the American people, we work hard. We, in fact, work longer hours than do the people of any other country industrialized country on earth. We are not a lazy people. We are a hard-working people. If the jobs are there, people will take them. If people have to work, people have to work 60 hours a week or 70 hours a week, that is what we build this economy. We don't need tax breaks for billionaires. We need to create jobs for the middle class of this country so that we can put people back to work. Now, let me just take a few minutes to discuss how we got to where we are today and, in my view, what policies we need to move this country forward to create the kinds of jobs that we desperately need. Now, let's just take a quick look back to where we were in January of 2009. Seems like a long time ago, but just a couple of years ago. And that was the last month of the administration of President Bush. 
In that month, we lost over 700,000 jobs. That is a, an absolutely incredible number. In fact, during the last six months of the Bush presidency, we lost over three and a half million jobs, all of which was caused by the greed and recklessness and illegal behavior on Wall Street. Our gross domestic product, which is the total sum of all that our economy produces, had gone down by nearly 7 percent during the fourth quarter of 2008. That, is the, that was the biggest decline in more than a quarter century. Some $5 trillion of Americans' wealth evaporated in a 12-week period as people in Vermont and all over this country saw the value of their homes, retirement savings, and stocks plummet. And I want to say just one word again about Wall Street greed, because I think for a variety of reasons, we just don't talk about it enough. What you had was a situation in which a small number of folks at the head of huge financial institutions, through their greed, through the development of very reckless policies, through illegal behavior, through pushing out financial instruments, which turned out in some cases to be worthless, that as a result of all of that, they plunged this country into the worst recession that we have seen since the Great Depression. From January, that is at the end of the Bush administration. But it's important to understand, very important to understand, that the Wall Street crisis took us over the wall in terms of precipitating the severe recession that we're in. But we have to remember that during those eight years, as I mentioned earlier, the middle class was also shrinking. So it wasn't, oh my goodness, everything is going great. Then you got the Wall Street disaster, and now we're in the midst of a terrible recession. This trend of a middle class collapse went on long before Bush, precipitated significantly during the Bush years, but it went on before as well, but just during the Bush years. Over the eight-year period of President Bush, from 2001 to 2009, we lost 600,000 private sector jobs. We lost 600,000 private sector jobs, and only one million net new jobs were created, all of them in the government sector. So for my friends, my co Republican colleagues, to tell us that we need more tax breaks for the very rich because that's going to create jobs. That's what trickle-down economics is all about. What I would say to them, you had your chance. It failed. In case you don't know, losing 600,000 private sector jobs in eight years is not good. That's very, very bad. That's an economic policy that has failed. We don't need to look at that movie again. We saw it. It stunk. It was a bad movie. Bad economic policy. More tax breaks for the rich are not what our economy needs. In fact, what every economist will tell you, that is the least effective way to create jobs. During the Bush era, median income dropped by nearly $2,200. That means that family in the middle, over an eight-year period, saw their income drop by $2,200 during the eight years of Bush. And I say all of these things just to tell you that we are not where we are today just because of the Wall Street crisis. That took us over the cliff. That made a very bad situation much, much worse. But it has been going on for a long time. It's going on before Bush. It's going on after Bush. During the eight years of Bush, over eight million Americans slipped out of the middle class and into poverty. We don't talk about poverty in America anymore. We don't talk about the homelessness in America very much anymore. Trust me, it's there. It's there three blocks away from where I'm speaking right now with a very large homeless shelter. It's in small towns in Vermont where people tell me that for the first time they are seeing 
families, more and more families with kids needing emergency shelter because they can't afford housing. In Vermont, a lot of people don't have low-wage jobs, making 10 bucks an hour. And it is hard to find a decent apartment or pay a mortgage on $10 an hour. And that's true certainly all over this country. Homelessness is going up. During the Bush years, nearly 8 million Americans lost their health insurance. One of the issues which I will likely talk about in a little while is, is health care. It's related to everything. We are the only country in the industrialized world that does not guarantee health care to all people as a right of citizenship. According to Harvard University, 45,000 Americans will die this year <coughs> because they lack health insurance and are not getting to a doctor when they should. During the Bush administration, 5 million manufacturing jobs disappeared as companies shut down plants in the United States and moved to China, Mexico, Vietnam, and other low-wage countries. As I mentioned earlier, profound, profoundly important to understand what's going on in America. In 2000, the year 2000, we had over 17,000 manufacturing jobs in this country. By 2008, we had less than 12,000, 17,000 to 12,000 in eight years. That's the loss of 5 million manufacturing jobs, a 29% reduction, and the fewest number of manufacturing jobs since the beginning of World War II. Under President Bush, our trade deficit with China more than tripled, and our overall trade deficit nearly doubled. Again, the point that I am making now within the context of this agreement is we need agreements now that do not give tax breaks to millionaires or billionaires, that do not lower the tax rate for the estate tax, which is applicable only to the top three-tenths of one percent. We need agreements which rebuild our infrastructure, rebuild our manufacturing base, and create the millions of good-paying jobs the American people desperately want. And again, I think the point has got to be made, and I've got to make it over and over and over again, is that when you look at the economy, it's one thing to say that everybody is hurting, you know? And sometimes that happens, you know? A terrible hurricane comes, it knocks down everybody's home. Well, the hurricane that has hit America for the last 10, 20 years has not impacted everybody. It has impacted the working class, it's impacted the middle class, the people on top are doing better than they ever were. Our friends on Wall Street, whose greed and illegal behavior caused this recession, they are now making more money than they ever did after being bailed out by the middle class of this country. During the Bush years, the wealthiest 400 Americans saw their incomes more than double. Do you really think that after seeing a doubling under the Bush years of their incomes that these people are in desperate need of another million dollar a year tax break? In 2007, the 400 top income earners in this country made an average of $345 million in one year. That is a pretty piece of change. That's the average. 345 million. In terms of wealth as opposed to income, the wealthiest 400 Americans saw an increase in their wealth of some $400 billion during the Bush years. Imagine that. In an eight-year period, top 400 wealthiest people each saw an increase on average of a billion dollars apiece. And together, these 400 families have a collective net worth of $1.27 trillion. Does anybody in America really believe that these guys need another tax break so that our kids and our grandchildren can pay more in taxes because the national debt has gone up? I don't think most Americans believe that, and that is why, in my view, most Americans are not supporting this agreement. And let me also say, that when we look at what's going on around the rest of the world, what we have got to appreciate is that in the United States today, and again, this is not something that we can be proud of. 
It's something that we have got to address. We have the most unequal distribution of wealth and income of any other country on earth. I remember talking not so long ago to somebody from Scandinavia, who was Finland, and he was saying, of course we have rich people in our country, but there's a level in which they would become embarrassed. We now have a situation where the CEOs of large corporations make 300 times more than their workers. In many other countries, yeah, everybody wants to be rich, but there is a limit. You can't become a billionaire stepping over children who are sleeping out on the street. That's not what this country is supposed to be about. Enough should be enough. Mr. President, the top 1% today earns 23.5% of all income. In the 1970s, that number was 8%. In the 1990s, it was approximately 16 percent, and now it is 23 and a half percent. So the people on top are getting a bigger and bigger chunk of all income. Furthermore, it's not just the top one percent. I mean, there are economists who write, yeah, you think the top one percent is doing well. Yeah, they are. It's really the top one-tenth of one percent. If you can believe this, I just want people to digest this. The top one-tenth of one percent, I don't know how many people those are. You can do the arithmetic, 300 million into one-tenth of one percent. That top one-tenth of one percent took in 11 percent of total income, according to the latest data available. One-tenth of one percent earned 11 percent of all income in America. In the 1970s, as I just said, the top one percent only made something like 8% of total income. In the 80s, it rose to 10 to 14%. In the late 90s, it was 15% to 19%. 2005, it passed 21%. And in 2007, the top 1% received 23.5% of all of the income earned in this country. The last time, and people should be mindful of this, the last time that that type of income disparity took place was in 1928. And I think we all know what happened in 1929. And that's the point that Senator Mary Landrieu was making a while back. What she understands quite correctly is that if working people, and the vast majority of the people, don't have the income to spend money to buy products and goods and services, we can't create the jobs. If all of the money, or a big chunk of the money, ends up with a few people on top, there is a limit you know, to how many limousines you can have and how many homes you can have and how many yachts you can have. So when you hit a situation where so few have so much, it is not just a moral issue, but it is also an economic issue. A strong and growing middle class goes out, spends money, and creates jobs. Grossly unequal distribution of income and wealth creates more economic shrinkage and loss of jobs because people just don't have the disposable income to go out and buy and create jobs for their neighbors. Now also, to add insult to injury, uh, in terms of this agreement negotiated by the President and the Republicans, while the very wealthiest people in this country became much wealthier and the deficit soared, and under President Bush, the national debt almost doubled. What else happened? Well, the tax rates for the very rich went down. Rich get richer, tax rates go down. This was a result not only of the tax breaks for the rich initiated during the Bush administration, but also, quite frankly, tax policy that took place before President Bush. The result is that from 1992 to 2007, the latest statistics that we have, the effective, effective federal tax rate, what people really pay for the top 400 income earners was cut almost in half. So these crybabies, these multimillionaires and billionaires, these people who are making out like bandits, they are crying and crying and crying but their effective tax rates for the top 400 income earners in America was cut almost in half from 1992 to 2007. 
And I think the point that needs to be made is that when is enough enough? And that really is the essence of what we're talking about. When does greed end? Greed is, is, in my view, it's like a sickness. It's like an addiction. You know, we know people who are on heroin, they can't stop. They destroy their lives. They need more and more heroin. There are people who can't stop smoking. They have problems with nicotine. They get addicted to cigarettes, cost them their health. People have problems with food. You know, we all have our share of addictions. But I would hope that for these people who are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, they will look around them and say, there is something more important in life than the richest people becoming richer when we have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world. Maybe they will understand that they are Americans, part of a great nation which is in trouble today. Maybe they've got to go back to the Bible or whatever they believe in and understanding that there is virtue in sharing, in reaching out, that you can't get it all. But I think this is an issue that we have got to stay on and stay on and stay on. This greed, this reckless, uncontrollable greed is almost like a disease which is hurting this country terribly. How can anybody be proud to say that I'm a multimillionaire and I'm getting at a huge tax break and one quarter of the kids in this country is on food stamps. How do you be proud of that? I don't know. Mr. President, as I mentioned, it's not just income, it's wealth. Top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 90%. During the Bush years, the wealthiest 400 Americans saw their increase, their wealth increase by some $400 billion. How much is enough? Now, all of these things are related to the agreement that the President and the Republicans worked out because we are all concerned about the national debt and our deficit. Now, in terms of the federal budget, when President Bush first took office, he inherited a $236 billion surplus in 2001 and a projected 10-year surplus of $5.6 trillion. That's what Senator Landrieu was talking about a moment ago. But then some things happened. And we all know the 9-11 was not his fault. What happened is we went to war in Afghanistan. We went to war in Iraq. We, and the war in Iraq was the fault, I'm afraid, of President Bush, something I certainly did not support, nor do I think most Americans support. And the war in Iraq, by the time our last veteran is taken care of, will probably end up costing us something like $3 trillion, adding enormously to our national debt. So when we talk about Iraq, it's not only the terrible loss of life that our soldiers and the Iraqi people have experienced, let's not forget what it has done to the deficit and the national debt. We did not pay for the war in Iraq. We just put it on the credit card. President gave out, President Bush gave out $700 billion in tax cuts for the wealthiest 1% of Americans. $700 billion. Where was the offset? There was none. Gave them tax breaks, that's it. Adds to the national debt. President and Republicans supported a $400 billion Medicare Part D prescription drug program. I have always believed as one of the leaders in believing that we needed a strong prescription drug program for seniors. But the program that was passed was written by the pharmaceutical industry, written by the insurance companies, and nowhere near as cost effective as it could be. As the President undoubtedly knows, we are not even negotiating prescription drug prices with the drug companies at great expense and great cost to the American people, where drug prices are now much more expensive on the Medicare Part D than they are in terms of what the Veterans Administration or the Department of Defense purchased. So we passed that, unpaid for. Great idea. Just another $400 billion prescription drug program, unpaid for. And then we bailed out Wall Street. The original cost was $700 billion. A lot of that, in fact, has been paid back. But there is expense there as well. 
So you add all these things together in normal governmental growth, and it turns out that the Bush administration turned a $236 billion a year surplus into a $1.3 trillion a year deficit. And more or less, that's where we are right now. In fact, the national debt nearly doubled on the President Bush, going from $5.7 trillion to $10.6 trillion in 2009. And now we are at $13.7 trillion, borrowing huge sums of money from China and other countries in order to uh, maintain our existence. That's where we are. That's where we are. Now, have we been seeing in recent years some improvements in the economy? We sure have. There has been some job growth, nowhere near enough, but we're surely not losing 700,000 jobs a year. We're seeing some growth, but we need to do much better. And that takes me back to an issue that I feel very, very strongly uh, about, Mr. President, and one that I want to say uh, a few words on. In this agreement that uh, the President negotiated with the Republicans, there, are a substantial, there is a substantial sum of money going into uh, tax, various types of business um, tax breaks. And the theory, which has certainly some validity, is that these business tax breaks will create jobs. The problem is that right now, the business, large corporations at least, are sitting on a huge bundle of money already that they are not spending. And the reason they are not investing that money is they perceive that working families don't have the money to buy their products and their services. I think that there is, and in saying this, I'm not alone, I think most economists agree with me, that there is a far more effective way that we can create jobs in this country rather than just a number of tax breaks going to businesses. And I touched on this point before, and I, I, I want to get into a little bit more detail now. And for this, I am indebted to a very fine book written by uh, an old friend of mine called Arianna Huffington. And the title of a book, and I know why she did it, it's called Third World America, Third World America. And she used that word because basically the theme of her book is if we do not get our act together, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of education, in terms of health care, that's where we are heading. We are heading. This great country is heading in the direction of being a third world nation. And she has an interesting chapter which deals just with one very important part of what's going on in America, and that is the crumbling of our infrastructure. And she writes, from 1980 to 2005, the miles traveled by automobiles increased 94%. For trucks, mileage increased 105%. Yet there was only a 3.5% increase in highway lane miles. More and more cars, more and more traveling, we're not building roads. But you don't, she writes, you don't need these numbers to know that our roads are badly congested. Duh, anybody who lives around here in Washington, D.C. knows that our roads are congested. It takes you hours to get to work on sometimes. You see it and experience it every day. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers infrastructure report card, quote, this is an interesting point, and this is where we should be investing, not tax breaks for the rich. Americans spend 4.2 billion hours a year stuck in traffic. Think about that. 4.2 billion, billion hours a year stuck in traffic at a cost of $78 billion a year. And think about all of the pollution, all of the greenhouse gas emissions, all of the frustration, all of the anxiety, all of the road rage. People are stuck in roads because our transportation system is totally inadequate. Our roads, our public transportation. Then she talks about, uh, she talks about an interesting point as well. In studying automobile accidents, you know, when we talk about automobile accidents, what do we usually think? We think, well, somebody is driving recklessly, maybe they're drunk, and that's a serious, those are serious issues. But she says, she writes, in studying car crashes across the country, the Transportation Construction Coalition determined 
that badly maintained or managed roads are responsible for $217 billion a year in car crashes, far more than the headline-grabbing alcohol-related accidents or speed-related pileups. In other words, if you want to know why we are seeing automobile crashes, the issue of bad roads is even more significant than drunk drivers or people who are reckless drivers. I can remember, I think everybody has the same story, I was driving down a road in Vermont, whoops, huge pothole, went into it, it cost me a few hundred dollars to repair the car. So we're spending, as a nation, billions of dollars repairing our cars because our roads are not in good shape. When there's a traffic jam, people are emitting all kinds of greenhouse gas emissions, you're wasting gas, you're wasting money. If we invested in our transportation system, we could go a long way to addressing that. When we talk about transportation, and by the way, again, I bring this issue up because in the bill agreed to by the President and the Republican leadership, to the best of my knowledge, not one penny, not one penny is going into infrastructure, which is, to me, just doesn't make any sense at all. And again, Arianna, Arianna Huffington writes, America's railway system is speeding down the tracks in reverse. It is one of the few technologies that has actually regressed over the past 80 years. Regressed. Now, I'm not talking about China, where they're building all these high-speed rail lines. Our rail situation, in terms of the amount of time it goes from location one to location two, has actually gotten longer. She writes, Tom Vanderbilt of Slate.com, which is a very good website, came across some pre-World War II train timetables and made a startling discovery. Many train rides in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s took less time than those journeys would take today. Can you imagine that? In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, people were able to get on the train and get to their destination in less time than is the case today. <clears throat> For instance, in 1934, the Burlington Zephyr would get you from Chicago to Denver, to Denver, Mr. President, from Chicago to Denver in around 13 hours. The same trip takes 18 hours today. I don't know if the presiding officer is familiar with the Burlington Zephyr, which is a train that goes from Chicago to Denver. But what this writer is pointing out is that in 1934, it took 13 hours to make that trip. You know how long it takes today? It takes 18 hours. So we move it in the wrong direction. I know that in Vermont, I don't have any statistics right in front of me, but I can tell you that it, I believe very strongly that it takes longer to get from the southern part of the state to the northern part of the state than it used to. And the frequency of the trips are less than they used to be. The trip from Chicago to Minneapolis via the Olympian Hiawatha in the 1950s took about four and a half hours. Today, via Amtrak's train, the journey is more than eight hours. It used to be four and a half. So in terms of our public transportation, not only are we neglecting it, not only are we not moving forward, we're actually moving backward. At the moment, the only high-speed train in the United States is Amtrak's Acela, which travels the Washington, New York, Boston line. And I use the, and she writes, I use the term high-speed very loosely. While in theory the trains have a peak speed of 150 miles per hour, the average speed on that train is just about 71 miles per hour. Once again, I read some statistics before pointing out that China is building thousands and thousands of miles of high-speed uh, rail. And uh, here in the United States, we are moving backwards, taking us longer time for various train rides than used to be the case. But it's not just trains. It is not just our roads. It is not just our bridges. Well, it is also our bridges. Let me say a word on bridges. I think we all remember just a four years ago, I think it was, the terrible tragedy in the Minneapolis area when one of their major bridges collapsed and a number of people lost their lives. And that got the front page headlines, 
but all over this country. I know in the state of Vermont, we have closed down bridges. Uh, they are not safe to travel. Um, according to the Department of Transportation, one in four of Americans' bridges is either structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. The numbers are even worse when it comes to bridges in urban areas where one in three bridges is deficient. No small matter given the high levels of passengers and freight traffic in our nation's city. So huge amount of traffic. And in urban areas, one in three bridges is deficient. In rural areas like Vermont, one in four. Mr. President, how are these bridges going to be built, rebuilt? It is likely not going to be done by local and state governments who right now are experiencing enormous economic crises. If it is going to be done, it's going to have to be done here at the federal level. And I have to say that in Vermont, we saw some significant improvements as a result of the stimulus package. In fact, in Vermont recently, we have put more money in rebuilding our roads and bridges with very good success. I think the people of Vermont see the difference in the last couple of years directly as a result of the stimulus package. We have improved, made significant improvements on a number of bridges, but nowhere near enough. So the point that I want to make is that with our infrastructure collapsing, with the American Society of Civil Engineers suggesting that we need to spend $2.2 trillion in the next five years just to maintain where we are, we have an agreement before us which puts zero dollars uh, in infrastructure. According to uh, this book, we need to invest $850 billion over the next 50 years to get all of America's bridges into good shape. Trust me, we are not coming anywhere near that right now. But it's not just our roads, it's not just our public transportation, not just our bridges. When we talk about infrastructure, we also have to talk about dams. On March 16, 2006, the Kaloko Dam in Kalawi, Hawaii collapsed and seven people died when the Kaloko Dam breached after weeks of heavy rain, sending 1.6 million tons of water downstream. Dams are a vital part of America's infrastructure. They help provide for drinking, irrigation, and agriculture, generate much needed power, and often offer protection from floods. Yet our dams are growing old. There are more than 85,000 dams in America, and the average age is 51 years. At the same time, more and more people are moving into developments located below dams that require significantly greater safety standards, but we've had a hard time keeping up with the increase in these so-called high-hazard dams. Indeed, we are falling further and further behind. So the point here is we have a major, major agreement. People are concerned about creating jobs. We are investing zero in our infrastructure, and dams are a very important part of our infrastructure, as are levees. And I suspect that Senator Landrieu, who was here a little while ago, would have something to say about levees. All right? So we're talking about an infrastructure which is collapsing. We're talking about China investing far more in terms of the GNP into infrastructure improvement than we are. We're talking about being in the midst of a major recession where we desperately want to grow jobs, and yet this proposal does not add one cent into uh, our infrastructure. Now, again, I'm going back to the very good book uh, written by Arianna Huffington called Third World America. She writes, as bad as America's sewers, roads, bridges, dams, and water and power systems are, they pale in comparison to the crisis we are facing in our schools. I'm not talking about the physical state of our dilapidated public school buildings, although the National Education Association estimates that it would take $322 billion to bring America's school buildings into good repair. I have been in schools in Vermont and elsewhere which were old and crumbling, and I have been in schools which are new 
and state-of-the-art. And I think anyone who has seen the contrast in terms of the attitude of the students in those types of schools will understand that it is important to give these kids good places in which to learn and to grow. It means a lot to them when they see a building that is new, that has state-of-the-art equipment, as opposed to one that is crumbling. It suggests to them what we as a society feel about them. And she writes, Arianna Huffington writes, that nothing is quickening our descent into third world status faster than our resounding failure to properly educate our children. This failure has profound consequences for our future, both at home and as we look to compete with the rest of the world in the global economy. Historically, education, she writes, has been the great equalizer. And that is certainly, certainly the case. That has been the incredible virtue of our public school system. What we have taken is kids who spent, my father never went to, didn't graduate high school, my mother did, that was it, and given young people, millions of young people, the opportunity to get a good education in school and be able to go to college and use their potential. The springboard to the middle class and beyond has been education. It was a promise we made to all of our people. What we as a nation said, that regardless of your income, we're going to provide you with the best possible education in order to succeed in life. And that just, that is something extraordinary. That no matter what your income is, we're going to provide you with a great education. I, as a kid, went to public schools, and I did have a very good education. But something has gone in recent years terribly wrong, and we have slipped further and further behind many other countries. Among 30 developed countries ranked by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, that's the OECD, the United States ranked 25th in math and 21st in science. 25th in math, 21st in science. Even the top 10% of American students, our best and brightest, ranked only 24th in the world in math literacy. There was another study, I think probably just a uh, more updated uh, OECD study that came out uh, just the other day. It was reported in the New York Times where kids in Shanghai uh, were leading the world in, in these types of tests as compared to our own students. They are studied, they have better schools, better teachers, more investments in their education, and there's a culture there. There is a culture. It's not fair to blame the kids. Does anyone seriously believe that in the United States of America we take intellectual development seriously? This reading today, I don't remember the guy's name. What was it, a basketball player or a baseball player? He was just signing a contract for some untold tens of millions of dollars. And yet you have teachers starting off at $30,000, $32,000. Is anyone going to suggest in a serious way that we reward people who become child care workers or teachers? We have child care workers who leave taking care of little kids, which may be the most important job in our society, because it is the brain development that takes place between zero and three that has a large, is a large part of what a human being becomes. People leave early childhood education in order to move up the economic ladder and get a job in McDonald's, because pay is so low, benefits are so low. What are we doing as a nation? What are we doing as a nation? And she writes that a national assessment of educational progress report found that just 33% of U.S. fourth graders and 32% of eighth graders were proficient in reading, et cetera, et cetera. So I think her point is that if we are not going to become a third world nation, we have got to start investing in this country, in our physical infrastructure, in our human infrastructure, and in our educational uh, infrastructure. Let me just give you some examples of what this means in real terms. Today, unemployment in our country, the official unemployment, is 9.8%. For those without a high school diploma, it is 15.6% compared to 5.6% for college graduates. 
67% of high school graduates don't have enough of the skills required for success in college and the 21st century workforce. As many as 170,000 high school graduates each year are prepared to go on to college but can't afford that. Let me repeat that. About 170,000 young people in this country who graduate high school who want to go to college are unable to do it because they can't afford it. Are we nuts? What are we doing in wasting the extraordinary intellectual potential of all of these young people? What we're saying to them is because you don't have the money and because college is so expensive and because our federal government is more busy giving tax breaks to billionaires and fighting two wars, we are not investing in you. That makes no sense at all. When you invest in your kids, you're investing in the future of America. They are America. And if they are not well educated, how are they going to become productive members of society? How are we going to compete against China and Europe and other countries around the world that are investing in education? And here's something that we don't talk about enough. The fastest growing occupations are those that require higher levels of education and greater technical competence. So you got a problem, it's true in Vermont and it's true all over the country, that you have jobs out there, good jobs, and those jobs cannot be filled because our young people don't have the job skills to fill them. Now, how absurd is that? I remember there was a piece in one of the papers, I think it was in Ohio, where after the worst of the recession and a lot of layoffs, I think it was Ohio, they were beginning to rehire workers. And the companies, these were sophisticated, high-tech jobs. They brought workers in, and they brought them in, and they brought them in. And they couldn't come up with the number of workers they needed to fill the jobs that they had. What does that say about our educational system? Data from Alliance for Excellent Education, 2009. 1,800 Vermont dropouts cost the state $459 million of lost lifetime earnings for the state and $19.4 million in health care costs. In other words, what everybody understands, if you don't invest in your young people, they are not going to become productive, tax-paying workers, as often as not, they will get involved in self-destructive activity, drugs, crime, whatever. They'll end up in jail, and we end up spending tens of thousands of dollars keeping them in jail rather than seeing them out there as productive members of society contributing their fair share in taxes. The Urban Institute says that we can reduce child poverty, which I mentioned earlier, is the highest in the industrialized world by 35 percent if we provide child care subsidies to families with income less than 50 percent of state median. This is an issue I feel very, very strongly about. It is to me beyond comprehension that in Vermont and throughout this country it is extremely difficult for working class families to find affordable, good quality childcare. We're not back in the 1950s where daddy went to work and mommy stayed home taking care of the kids. Mom is at work as well. And you have families all over this country, middle class, working class families, are saying, you know, I cannot find quality childcare where I'm comfortable leaving my two year old or three year old. Can't find that childcare at a rate that I can afford. And in this area, again, we are far behind many other countries around the world because kids who do not get intellectually challenging early childhood education, kids who do not get the emotional support they need from zero to three to four, they will enter school already quite behind other kids. And then five years later, ten years later, they'll be dropping out of school and they'll be doing drugs and they'll be ending up in jail at great expense. How long does it take us to understand that investing in our children, our youngest children, 
is enormously important for our country, and it is a good investment. It is much better to invest in child care than in keeping people locked up in jails. Mr. President, 75 percent of American youth who apply to the military are ineligible to serve because of low cognitive cap capacities, criminal records, or obesity. I mean, this is really quite unbelievable. We're not only now talking about not being able to compete internationally because we are not bringing forth the kind of educated people that we need because of the inadequacies of our schools and childcare and so forth. This almost becomes a national security issue, if you like. 75% of American youth who apply to the military are ineligible to serve because of low cognitive capabilities, capacities, criminal records, or obesity. Mr. President, and you know, it, it, it gives me no pride, no happiness to, to bring forth these statistics. But as a nation, we're going to have to grasp these things. Either we could ignore these things, either we can run away from reality, put our heads, you know, underneath the carpet here, or we can say that we are not going to allow America to become a third world nation that we're going to turn this country around, but we're not going to turn the country around unless we rethink our priorities. And one of our priorities cannot be more tax breaks to the richest people in this country. Mr. President, from the 1960s to 2006, the U.S., the United States, fell from first to 18th out of 24 industrialized nations in high school graduation rates. Now, what happens in today's economy if a kid does not graduate high school? And if my memory is correct, about 30 percent of our kids, and I know these figures are fuzzy because it's hard to determine who is dropping out and not, but my understanding is about 30 percent of our kids drop out of high school. What happens to those kids? Where do they go? What kind of jobs do they have? How many of them end up in jail? How many of them do drugs? As a nation, I think we can do a lot better than that. We should not have gone from 1st to 18th out of 24 industrialized nations in high school graduation rates. Mr. President, dropouts are eight times more likely to be incarcerated. In other words, when kids fail in school, they are going to end up in jail, eight times more likely. 82% of those in prison are high school dropouts. States, it was funny, I'll tell you a funny experience. I was in, in Burlington last week, and I met this fellow, and he came up, and he was chatting with me, and he said, well, you know, I just got out of jail. And what really struck me is he was a well-educated young man. He was very articulate. I suspect he had gone to college, and what really struck me is how rare that is. As the statistics amply demonstrate, the people who end up in jail overwhelmingly are high school dropouts people who don't have the education to make it in the, in the world. Mr. President, when we talk about the need to substantially increase funding for early childhood education, we should understand that state-funded pre-K programs currently serve 24 percent of four-year-olds and 4 percent of three-year-olds. In other words, there are millions of families that would like to see their kids be able to access good quality child care, uh, but just can't find that in, in their states. Mr. President, again, in contrast to giving tax breaks to billionaires who don't need it and in some cases are not even asking for it, the younger the age of investment in human capital, the higher the rate of return on that investment. If society invests early enough, it can raise cognitive and socio-emotional levels and the health of disadvantaged kids. You don't need to be uh, a psychologist to understand that. If kids get off to a good start in life, uh, if they have the intellectual support, the intellectual development, the emotional support, those kids are much, much more likely to do well in school, much less likely to drop out, 
much less likely to be a burden on society, much less likely to end up in jail, much less likely to do drugs, etc. This is an investment that we should be making. Mr. President, I want to get back for a moment uh, to the uh, agreement that the President um, made with the uh, Republican leadership and why I think it is a bad agreement and why I believe we can do much better. And the way we are going to improve this agreement is when millions of people all over this country say, wait a second, wait a second, this was an agreement reached behind closed doors. There are members in the House and the Senate are upset that we didn't know about the agreement. What about the average American out there? I wonder how many people really believe that it makes a lot of sense with a with a $13.7 trillion national debt to be giving huge tax breaks to the wealthiest people in this country. And I've got to tell you, Mr. President, uh, the calls uh, in my office are coming 98, 99 percent to one uh, against these uh, agreements. Uh, people think we can do better, and our job is to do better. And the way we do better is when people all over this country um, stand up and say, wait a minute, Congress, your job is to represent the middle class, to represent our kids, and not to represent uh, the wealthiest people uh, in this country. Now, I mentioned earlier, and I think certainly one of the major objections to this agreement is that it provides tens of billions of dollars to the wealthiest people in this country at a time when the rich are already doing phenomenally well and at a time when the wealthiest people have already experienced huge tax breaks. Um, and uh, I think most people think that that does not make sense. And let me just give you an example. Uh, I, I just want to not to pick on particular individuals. That's not my goal here. But just so you know this, according to the Citizens for Tax Justice, if the Bush tax breaks for the top 2% are extended, these are some of the people who will benefit and what kind of benefits they will receive. Rupert Murdoch, the CEO of News Corporation, would receive a $1.3 million tax break next year. Mr. Murdoch, Mr. Murdoch is a billionaire. Do you really think he needs that? Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase, whose bank got a $29 billion bailout from the Federal Reserve would receive a $1.1 million tax break. Trust me, Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase, he is doing just fine. Vikram Pandit, the CEO of Citigroup, a bank that got a $50 billion bailout, he would receive $785,000 tax breaks. Ken Lewis, the former CEO of Bank of America, a bank that got a $45 billion bailout, Guys who are already fabulously wealthy would receive a $713,000 a year tax break. The CEO of Wells Fargo, these are the largest banks in America, CEOs of these banks already making huge compensation. They would get, he would get, John uh, Stumpf, who's the CEO of Wells Fargo, would receive $813,000 tax break every single year. The CEO of Morgan Stanley, John Mack, whose bank got a $10 billion bailout, would receive a $926,000 a year tax break. The CEO of Aetna, Ronald Williams, would receive a tax break worth $875,000. Now, Mr. President, I contrast that, as I did earlier, to the fact that two days ago, you and I and a total of 53 members of the Senate said, you know, Maybe we should provide a $250 check this year to seniors on Social Security and to disabled vets because they haven't gotten a COLA for two years. $250 check. People making $14,000, $15,000 a year desperately need a little bit of help. We couldn't get one Republican vote. But when it comes to the CEO of a major bank who is already a multimillionaire, we're talking about six, seven, eight hundred thousand, a million dollars a year in tax breaks. That is not what we should be doing as a nation. 
Furthermore, Mr. President, I know that President Obama and others have said, well, let's not worry because these tax breaks are just temporary, just temporary. They're only going to be given for two years. I have been in Washington long enough to know that when you give a temporary tax break for two years, you are in fact giving a long-term tax break or maybe even a permanent tax break. Because two years from now, <clears throat> the exact same arguments will be made. That if you do away with those tax breaks for the rich, you're really raising taxes. Do you really want to raise taxes? Terrible thing to do. And that same argument will be made. But there is one difference. And the difference is that when President Obama ran for president, and since he has been, been president, he has time and time and time again come out against those tax breaks. He does not believe in them, and I believe him. I know that he doesn't. But if he says, if he is the Democratic candidate for president, that elect me or re-elect me to be president because then, in the future, I'm really going to get rid of these tax breaks, I'm afraid that his credibility is not very, very high because that's what he said last time. And you could only cry wolf. Now, I guess there's a limit to how many times you can cry wolf. So I think let's not kid ourselves. If these tax breaks for the wealthiest people are extended for two years, there is a very, very strong likelihood that they will be extended for many, many years beyond these two years and perhaps even permanently, which brings us back to the Bush era nonsense of believing that tax breaks for the rich and trickle-down economics are going to help the middle class and working families of this country. But while the personal income tax issue and extending them for the top 2 percent has received a lot of national attention, uh, what has not gotten a whole lot of discussion is that that is not the only unfair and absurd tax proposal out there. The agreement struck between the President and the Republican leadership continues the Bush era 15 percent tax rate on capital gains and dividends, meaning that those people who make their living off of their investments will continue to pay a substantially lower tax rate than firemen, teachers, and nurses. So if you are a wealthy person and you earn, and I believe that the overwhelming majority of capital gains benefits accrue to the top 1 percent, you're going to be paying a tax on that income of 15 percent, which is less than you pay if you are a fireman, whether you're a police officer, you're a teacher, or a nurse. So what we are doing there is extending not only the personal income tax breaks for the very rich, but a host of other taxes as well. Mr. President, on top of all of that, and I know that many of my colleagues have picked up on this and are extremely upset, and I think it's one of the reasons why the Democrats in the House just yesterday said that they don't, do not want to bring this proposal to the floor for a vote, is that this agreement includes a horrendous, a horrendous proposal regarding the estate tax. And the estate tax, as some may know, was a proposal that Teddy Roosevelt talked about in the year, in the year uh, 1906 and uh, was eventually enacted in 1916. And here is what Teddy Roosevelt said about this issue in August of 2010, and I quote, and it's worth repeating that because what the proposal struck between the president and the Republican leader is lower the estate tax. And here's what Teddy Roosevelt said in 2010. And here's a chart with his words. He said, the absence of effective state and especially national restraint upon unfair money getting has tended to create a small class of enormously wealthy and economically powerful men whose chief object is to hold and increase their power. This is Teddy Roosevelt, who by then had served as President of the United States. No man, this is Roosevelt, no man should receive a dollar 
unless that dollar has been fairly earned. Every dollar received should represent a dollar's worth of service rendered, not gambling in stocks, but service rendered. End of quote. My goodness, this guy was pretty prophetic. This is back in 1910. Then he continues. The really big fortune, the swollen fortune, by the mere fact of its size acquires qualities which differentiate it in kind as well as in degree from what is passed by men of relatively small means. Therefore, I believe in a graduated inheritance tax on big fortunes properly safeguarded against evasion and increasing rapidly in amount with the size of the state." End of quote. Wow. Teddy Roosevelt hit the nail on the head. And that was 100 years ago. What he worried about is that a small group of people with incredible money would be able to pass that money on and that what you would create in this country is an oligarchic form of government with a few people holding not just enormous economic power, but holding uh, significant political power as well. And it is ironic that right now, as a result of this disastrous <clears throat> Citizens United decision, that what Roosevelt foretold, predicted, is exactly what's happening. You have a handful of billionaires now sitting around deciding how much of their fortune they're going to invest in political campaigns all over this country to defeat people like me who are opposed to their agenda and support other people who are in agreement with their agenda. That's what Roosevelt talked about. That is exactly what is happening. So what we are looking at is, in this proposal, we are looking at a situation where the estate tax rate, which was 55% under President Clinton, will decline to 35% with an exemption on the first $5 million of an individual's estate, $10 million for couples. Now, here's the important point that has to be made, because I think a lot of people don't understand it. And certainly, our Republican uh, friends have done a very, very good job in distorting reality on this one. There are millions of Americans who believe that uh, when they die, uh, their children will have to pay an estate tax. That is absolutely and categorically incorrect. As this chart shows, only a tiny fraction of estates from deaths in 2009 owed any estate tax. That number is about point. 24 percent, less than three-tenths of one percent of American families paid any tax on the estates that they were left. 99.7 percent of American families did not pay one cent in estate taxes. And that's the simple truth. The so-called death tax that our Republican friends talk about a whole lot is the estate tax. 99.7 percent of families don't pay a nickel on it. And the people who do pay are not the rich. It is the very, very, very rich. And let me just give you one example of the absurdity of lowering the tax rate, or even worse, of ending the estate tax as some of my Republican colleagues would like to do. And here's this chart, just to give you one example of what ending. This, this agreement does not do that, it just lowers the rates. But if they were to wipe out completely as the Republicans want to do, Walmart's owners, and that's the Sam Walton's family, the Waltons own Walmart, they are the heirs to the Walmart fortune, which is worth you know, this may be dated, maybe more, maybe less now, you know, about $86, $86 billion. That's what this family is worth. One family, $86 billion. They're doing pretty good. If we abolish the estate tax, as our Republican friends would have us do, the Walton family alone 
would receive an estimated 32.7 billion tax break if the estate tax was completely repealed. One family, 32.7 billion dollars. This is patently insane. This is insane. We have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world. We have massive unemployment. I am trying to get senior 50 plus million people a $250 check. By the way, a $250 check because we have not seen a COLA for the last two years for seniors, disabled vets. That would cost in one year about $14 billion. The Walton family itself we get more than double in a tax break what some of us are fighting for for over 50 million seniors and disabled vets. So we can't afford to give $14 billion to help some of the people in this country who are struggling the hardest, can't do that. But somehow we can afford to give $32.7 billion in tax breaks to one of the richest families in this country. If that makes sense to anybody, please call up my office. Because it doesn't make sense to me, and I think it does not make sense to the vast majority of the American people. So under this agreement, the estate tax rate, which was 55 percent under President Clinton, will decline to 35 percent with an exemption on the first $5 million of an individual's estate, $10 million for couples. And let us remember again that this tax applies only to the top three-tenths of one percent of the families in this country. And this, again, is not just a tax break for the rich, it is a tax break for the very, very rich. And again, this agreement says, well, we're only going to extend this for two years. Well, frankly, I doubt that very much. I suspect two years from now, the same argument, they will be extending it. And frankly, our Republican colleagues representing the richest people in the world are hell-bent on abolishing the estate tax completely. So those are some of the reasons that uh, I think we should be voting against this agreement. Medicare, the Barbara Canelli. Third, Mr. President, and this is an issue I have been talking about and I'm happy to hear that there is more discussion about in the last few days, and that is the uh, so-called payroll tax holiday. Uh, and what that is about is that this would cut $120 billion in Social Security payroll tax for workers. Now, on the surface, this sounds like a very good idea because the worker, instead of paying 6.2 percent into Social Security, pays 4.2 percent. But I think if you think about it for two seconds, you really, uh, really understand that it's not a good idea because this is money being diverted from the Social Security Trust Fund. And Social Security, in my view, has been the most successful federal program in perhaps the history of our country. In the last 75 years, whether in good times or bad times, Social Security has paid out every nickel owed to every eligible American. Today, Social Security has a $2.6 trillion surplus. Today, Social Security can pay out benefits for the next 29 years. Our goal and what we must do is make sure that we extend it beyond 29 years to the next 75 years. Well, if you divert $120 billion from the Social Security Trust Fund and you give it to workers today, what you're doing is cutting back and the viability, the long-term viability of Social Security. Uh, that is not just Bernie Sanders uh, raising this issue. Uh, there are many people representing millions of senior citizens who are deeply, deeply concerned about uh, this proposal, this provision in the uh, agreement between the President and the Republican leadership. Um, the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare is uh, one of the very largest uh, senior groups in America. They do a very, very good job. I know we have many seniors in Vermont who are members of this organization. And their job is to do what the title of the organization suggests, and that is to preserve Social Security and Medicare. And uh, just the other day, they sent out a news release 
And the title of the news release was, and I quote, cutting contributions to Social Security signals the beginning of the end. Payroll tax holiday is anything but. And let me quote from Barbara Kennelly, who is a former member of Congress. She's the president and CEO of the National Committee to Observe Social Security and Medicare. And what she writes is that, quote, even though Social Security contributed nothing to the current economic crisis, it has been bartered in a deal that provides deficit-busting tax cuts for the wealthy. Diverting, and that's what we're doing here, $120 billion in Social Security contributions for a so-called tax holiday may sound like a good deal for workers now, but it's bad business for the program that a majority of middle-class seniors will rely upon in the future. End of quote. Barbara Kennelly, President of the CEO. Mr. President, I think many of us should understand where this concept really originated. This is not a progressive idea. This is an idea that came from Republicans and conservatives who want to end Social Security. And I want to read you an interesting quote from a gentleman named Bruce Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett is a former top advisor for Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush. And this is what he wrote in opposition to this payroll tax cut. And this is a guy who was an advisor to President Reagan and the first President Bush. And this is what he said. He said, quote, what are the odds that Republicans will ever allow this one-year tax holiday to expire? They wrote the Bush tax cuts with explicit expiration dates, and then when it came time for the law, they wrote to take effect exactly as they wrote it. They said any failure to extend them permanently would constitute the biggest tax increase in history. End of quote for a moment. So what Mr. Bartlett is saying, and I'm going to go back to his quote in a second, what he's saying is we all know to be true, that around here in Congress, if you provide a tax break for one year, in this case a payroll tax holiday, a year from now, if you restore the old rates, which are 6.2 percent, our Republicans' friends are going to say, Democrats are raising your taxes. It ain't going to happen. This one-year extension could well become a permanent extension, and if it becomes a permanent extension, you are diverting a huge amount of money to Social Security, and you are weakening the entire financial structure of Social Security in this country, which I expect is exactly what some would like to do. Now, President Obama says, well, not to worry, it's only one year, and don't worry, that one year is going to be covered by the federal government. So for the very first time, out of the Treasury Department, money is going to come into Social Security, which has always been 100 dependent, as it should be, on payroll taxes. For the first time, we are breaking that. And around here, you do it once, it is going to continue. What Barbara Kennelly, Kennelly, the president of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare says, is cutting these contributions to Social Security signals the beginning of the end. So we should be very, very, very mindful of that. We should not support this payroll tax. It is one of the more dangerous provisions in this agreement. But let me get back now, uh, if I might, Mr. President, to what Bruce Bartlett, who was the uh, former uh, top advisor for Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush, recently wrote. And I'm continuing his quote. Quote, if allowing the Bush tax cuts to expire is the biggest tax increase in history, one that Republicans claim would decimate a still fragile economy, then surely expiration of a payroll tax holiday would also constitute a massive tax increase on the working people of America. Republicans would prefer, this is Bruce Bartlett, Republicans would prefer, prefer to destroy Social Security's finances or permanently funded with general revenues than allow a once suspended payroll tax to be reimposed. Arch Social Security hater Peter Ferrara once told me that funding it with general revenues was part of his plan to destroy it 
by converting Social Security into a welfare program rather than an earned benefit. He was right, end of quote. And once again, that quote is from Bruce Bartlett, a former top advisor for President Reagan and the first President Bush. So what he is saying, and this is maybe one of the sleeping issues in this agreement between the President and the Republican leadership is, we may be taking a huge step forward in destroying the most important program in this country, which is Social Security, by diverting now $120 billion and in the future hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars into this program so that, in fact, it will not be there for our kids and our grandchildren. Mr. President, uh, the fourth point that I want to make in opposition to this agreement, and one that I've, I've made before and read a little bit about, is, is that while some of the business taxes in this agreement may work to create jobs, uh, some of them won't, but the more important point is that economists on both ends of the political spectrum believe that the better way uh, to spur the economy and to create the millions and millions of jobs that we must create is to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. Just a few minutes ago, I read from a uh, excerpts from a, a, a very good book by a friend of mine, Ariana Huffington, uh, entitled a Third World America. And the purpose of her book was to give us a warning that if we as a nation do not get our act together in a variety of ways, including our physical infrastructure, we are headed down the pike to be a third world nation. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, we as a nation need to spend $2.2 trillion in the next five years alone in order to take care of our infrastructure needs. But unfortunately, this agreement signed by the, the, the President and the Republicans doesn't put one penny into infrastructure. So I think that if we are serious about creating jobs, if we're serious about making sure that our economy can be competitive in the global economy, uh, we've got to be watching what other countries are doing, and they're investing far, far more than we are. I can tell you, Mr. President, and the stimulus package, by the way, will help us very much in Vermont on this area. But right now, if you were to drive around the state of Vermont, and I think in many other places in this country, and you uh, took out your cell phone, uh, you would find it very hard to make calls in a number of areas of the state. A few months ago, uh, I was literally a mile and a half away from our state capital in Montpelier, uh, near Northfield, Vermont. I could not make a telephone call with my cell phone. And that's true in many parts of Vermont. That's true in many areas of America. We are lagging behind many, many other countries in terms of the accessibility of cell phone service and broadband, and broadband. So I am happy to say that in Vermont, we received a very generous grant through the stimulus package. It is going to help us. Other states did the same. But that's the area that we have got to invest. You've got to invest in broadband. You've got to invest in making sure that cell phone service is available in rural America, all over America. I talked a moment ago about our train services. There are train services today which are worse than they were 30 or 40 years ago. It takes longer to get from destination A to destination B. China is investing huge sums of money building high-speed rail at a rate that we could not even dream about. So in this agreement, we do have money for business tax cuts. Uh, but I do not think that that is the best way to invest taxpayer money if we're serious about creating the jobs that we need. Corporate America already is sitting on close to $2 trillion cash on hand. I don't know that more tax rates are going to help them very much. I think that it is a lot smarter, and I think most economists uh, agree with me, that we should be investing in our infrastructure, both to create jobs now and to improve our competitiveness in years to come. Further, Mr. President, I, I want to say a word on this. I, I mentioned it earlier today. President Obama uh, talks about this being a compromise agreement. Uh, you can't get everything you want, and I, I certainly understand that. But one of the aspects of the compromise he points to is an extension of unemployment benefits for 13 months. 
Well, let me be very clear. I think at a time when two million of our fellow Americans are about to lose uh, their unemployment at a time when unemployment is extraordinarily high, long-term unemployment is, I think, higher than at any point on record. People are, you know, looking for work month after month after month and not finding it. It would be morally, uh, morally unacceptable if this country did not extend unemployment benefits uh, for those workers for 13 months. And yet the President sees this as a great sign of compromise. I would argue the contrary. I would suggest to you, Mr. President, that for the past 40 years, under both Democratic and Republican <clears throat> administrations, uh, under Democratic and Republican leadership here in the Senate or in the House, whenever the unemployment rate has been above 7.2 percent unemployment, unemployment insurance has always been extended. In other words, this has been bipartisan policy for 40 years, and I don't want to see us seeing and accepting as a really great give on the part of Republicans, a really, you know, something that they're giving us as part of a compromise when it's been bipartisan policy for 40 years under Democratic and Republican leadership. So I don't accept that this is a great give. I think what the American people understand is you don't turn your backs on unemployed workers. People have been unemployed for long periods of time. You don't allow those people to lose their homes. You don't force these people out onto the streets. You don't take away shreds or shreds of, of dignity they have remaining. That is not what you do, and that has always been Republican philosophy as well as Democratic philosophy. This is not a great gift. So I do not accept uh, that this is uh, a, a, a compromise. <clears throat> Mr. President, let me be very clear, as I said earlier, that I do believe that there are positive, positive uh, parts of this agreement that must be maintained uh, as we move forward toward a better agreement. Um, and let me give you just some of them that, have, that make a lot of sense to me that we have got to retain and build on. Uh, the obvious one is, in addition to extending unemployment benefits, uh, it's clear that we have got to extend middle-class uh, tax cuts for 98 percent of Americans, as I've been uh, documenting over and over again uh, today. Uh, we are looking at a situation where the middle class in this country is collapsing. Under President Bush, median family income went down by $2,200. People are losing their health care, uh, and it would be asinine, it would be unacceptable if the middle class did not continue to receive uh, the tax breaks that were developed in 2001 and 2003. And that, to a large degree, what this fight is about. We've got to extend those tax breaks for the middle class, but not tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires. Further in this agreement, there are other, some, some other good provisions. You got the earned income tax credit for working Americans, and the child and college tax credits are also in this agreement, and they are very, very important. They will keep millions of our fellow Americans from slipping out of the middle class and into poverty, and they will allow millions of our fellow citizens to send their kids to college. Just talked about a moment ago that we have over 100,000 families in this country where kids graduate high school, want to go to college, can't afford to do it. This proposal will help them do that, and that's right. But, Mr. President, despite the fact that there are some good, important provisions in this proposal, when we look at the overall package, when we look at a $13.7 trillion national debt and a declining middle class, I think what we have got to say is that this package just doesn't do it. It's just not good enough. Now, the President says that he knows how to count votes, and I understand that. He says, well, you know, you had a couple of votes here to make sure that we would not give tax breaks to millionaires. And the President has been very clear. He does not want to do that. I understand that. But he says, what choice do I have? And I think the answer is, we have got to fight this issue. In my view, this solution ultimately will not be resolved here inside the Beltway, in the Senate or in the House. It will be resolved when millions of Americans get on their telephones and get on their computers and let their senators 
and their members of Cong House of Representatives know that they are profoundly outraged that at a time when the rich have never had it so good and when we have a huge national debt, that this agreement contains huge tax breaks for those people who don't need it. That's how we defeat this. I'm not sure that alone, you know, here in the debate, I'm going to turn any of my Republican or some Democratic colleagues around. But I do believe that if people all over this country stand up and say, wait a minute, how much do the richest people in this country want? I just documented a few moments ago. The top 400 wealthiest people in this country saw a doubling of their income under President Bush, a doubling of their income. Tax rates went down. When is enough, is, when is enough enough? How much uh, do they need? So I think, and I would hope, by the way, that this is certainly not just a, progr a progressive issue. I'm a progressive. This is a conservative issue. I have heard year after year, Mr. President, our conservative friends telling us, my goodness, we just cannot continue to raise the national debt. We've got to do something about this unsustainable deficit. This agreement grows, increases the national debt. What kind of honest conservative can vote to increase the national debt? And if they do, please, please, no more lectures here on the floor of the Senate. Your hypocrisy will be known to everybody. Don't tell us that you're concerned about the national debt, give tax breaks to billionaires, and raise the national debt so that our kids and grandchildren in the middle class will have to pay higher taxes in order to pay off the debt that was caused by you giving tax breaks to millionaires. Please, no more lectures on that issue. Just say, okay, rich people contributed to my campaign. I got to do what they want. That would be honest. Please, no more lectures about your concern about the national debt. Now, again, I want to reiterate this point. And that is, everybody says, don't worry, these are only two years. These are not, in my view, two years. If you do them for two years, the same old argument will be back two years from now, and we will be in the midst of a presidential election. And what our Republican friends will say, as sure as I am standing here, and I'm glad we have a gentleman putting this in the congressional record, I want people to go back to the congressional record. I am sure I will be proven right that two years from now, our Republican friends will come back and they will say, oh my word, if you repeal these tax breaks, you're going to be raising taxes. We can't do that. And what will make the situation even more difficult two years from now than today is you have President Obama, if he's the Democratic candidate two years from now, he'll say, oh, I don't believe in these tax breaks for the rich. I'm going to do my best to repeal them. But his credibility has been damaged because that's what he said in the last campaign. That's what he has been saying all along. The President does not believe in extending these tax breaks to the wealthy. I know that. Everybody knows that. But if he caves in now, who is going to believe that he's not going to do the same thing two years from now? That's the damage. And then what's even, I think, more troublesome is that once we move down this path of more tax breaks for the very, very wealthy, we are accepting the heart and soul of trickle-down economics, which has been, to my mind, a proven disaster and a failure. I would remind the listeners and my colleagues that these tax breaks have been in existence since 2001. They were in existence throughout almost all of President Bush's tenure. The end result was that we lost 600,000 private sector jobs, lost 600,000 private sector jobs, the worst job performance record maybe in the history of this country. Trickle-down economics does not work. Giving tax breaks to billionaires does not stimulate the economy. Helping working families and the middle class get decent jobs, tax breaks for people who need the money and are going to spend the money is what creates jobs, not giving tax breaks to billionaires who don't need it and who are not going to spend it. So again, the point that I want to make here is that if people think, oh, this is just temporary, this is just two years, I believe you're kidding yourselves. I believe that two years from now, the debate will be about extending them or perhaps even making them permanent. And at a time 
as I mentioned earlier, where the top 1% has seen a huge increase in the percentage of income they earn in this country, going from 8% in the 1970s to 23.5% now, where the top 1% now earns more income than the bottom 50%. It is totally absurd to be giving tax breaks to people who don't need them, and it is not good economics as well. And here's the other irony. Uh, as I also mentioned earlier, I guess by this time I'm going to be doing a little repetition here, but as I mentioned earlier, you have a number of millionaires and some of the richest people in this country who will benefit from these tax breaks. You know what they're saying? You know what Warren Buffett is saying? You know what Bill Gates is saying? You know what Ben Cohn from Ben & Jerry's is saying? And many, many other wealthy people are saying, hey, thanks very much. I don't need it. It's more important that you invest in our children. It's more important that you protect working families. We're doing just fine. Thanks. Our incomes have soared. Our tax rates have gone down. We don't need it. In other words, we have the absurd situation is that not only is this bad public policy, we are actually forcing tax breaks on people who don't need them and don't even want them. Richest people in this country, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, we don't want it. Now, here's something else. Here's something else that needs to be understood. What the Republicans are doing in this agreement is driving up the national debt. And you may think, well, that's not what Republicans really believe in. They're supposed to be conservatives. They don't want a high national debt. Why would they be giving tax breaks to the rich and driving up the national debt? Well, there is a rationale. These guys are not dumb. And I think they know what they're doing. And here's what the argument is. If you drive up the national debt and the deficit, you then come back to the floor of the Senate and you say, you know what? This national debt and, and deficit is unsustainable. And the only way that we can deal with it now is by cutting, cutting, cutting. And we are already beginning, beginning to hear what some, how some of those thoughts are going to develop. Uh, there was, uh, as you know, Mr. President, a Deficit Reduction Commission uh, appointed by the President. And I had very, when I heard who was going to be chairing that commission, or co-chairing it, and Alan Simpson, a very nice gentleman, but a very, very conservative Republican who has attacked Social Security for a very long period of time, Erskine Bowles, a conservative Democrat, I had very serious doubts about what was going to come out of that commission. Now, the good news is they needed 14 votes to pass their uh, recommendations. They, they didn't get the 14. But a lot of the ideas that uh, Senator Simpson and, and, and Mr. Bowles developed are going to be filtering around uh, this uh, institution. And what the Republicans will say is that when you have a huge debt, which they helped create, we're going to have to cut. And what are we going to have to do? As you recall, Mr. President, that Deficit Reduction Commission rec rep recommended a savage cut, over 20 percent in Social Security benefits for young workers. Major cuts. There was talk about raising the Social Security age up to, I think, 69. They're talking about cuts in Medicare, cuts in Medicaid, cuts in education. I mean, right now, is, is, I think I've documented a dozen times, uh, it is a horrendous situation when so many of our young people can't afford to go to college and the others who do go to college and graduate, they end up on average something like $25,000 in debt. These guys on the Deficit Reduction Commission were recommending that the interest uh, on that debt be accrued while students were in college. So here we have, we're slipping behind the rest of the world in terms of our percentage of graduates, college graduates. And this recommendation is on young people who don't have a lot of money, who are borrowing money, they've got to pay more to go to college. But you're going to see it. And here's the argument. I will, good, it's going to be in the congressional record. Check it out. See if I'm right. The argument will be deficit is going up, national debt is going up. We've got to attack and cut Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, veterans programs. This year, Mary Landrieu made this point. Senator Landrieu of Louisiana made the point a little while ago. She said, and I think this is roughly right, our soldiers, men and women in the armed forces, are going to get a 1.8 percent increase in their salaries this year, 1.8 percent, people putting their lives on the line to defend this country. $250 check for 50-plus million 
seniors and disabled vets. We couldn't pass it. Too much money, $14 billion. They're going to come back and cut and cut and cut in the name of trying to deal with deficit, the high deficit, which they are now increasing. And that's an issue that we must be uh, addressing. So, Mr. President, in my view, while there are some good uh, parts of the uh, proposal, uh, it is certainly one that uh, should be um, significantly improved. And I believe that the way it can be improved uh, is by um, the American people beginning to get involved in the process. Uh, I can tell you, as I said earlier, I don't know how the calls are going today in my office because I have been here, but for the last three days we have received thousands of phone calls and emails and over 98 percent of them have been against this proposal. The American people believe, people in Vermont believe, that we can do a lot better job in crafting a proposal that represents the middle class and our kids and not just the wealthiest people in this country. Mr. President, when we talk about this proposal negotiated by the White House and, and Republican leadership, again, it has to be put within the broad context of what's going on in America. And that context is not a pretty picture. Uh, that, context, that context requires us to understand that the middle class, which has been the backbone of this country for so very long, uh, is in the process of disappearing. And that context makes us understand that millions of families in this country are worried, parents are worried, not just about their own lives. They are prepared to work 50 or 60 hours a week. They are prepared to cut back on their own needs. But I think what is hurting them more deeply is the kind of future they are contemplating for their children. Uh, they are worried that for the first time in the modern history of America, their kids will get jobs which will pay them lower salaries than what the parents have earned. Uh, they are worried that unemployment will be much more likely for their kids than for themselves. They'll be worried that while they were able to scrape through, and in my case, I you know, was able to scrape through college, you know, borrowed some money and did some jobs and made it like millions of other people. They're worried that with the high cost of college education and the reduction in their real earnings, they're not going to be able to send their kids to college. And I have received emails, as I'm sure you have, Mr. President, the saddest thing in the world, where you have parents who are saying, you know, we, we have saved all of our lives. The thing that we wanted most is to be able to send our daughter or our son to college, but we can't afford to do that now. And that is the context, the overall context, that this agreement has got to be placed within. And the issue is, again and again and again, the richest people in this country do not need tax breaks. They are doing phenomenally well. They've already been given huge amounts of tax breaks. It is the middle class, it is the working families, it is the lower income people that we have got to be worrying about, and not just the wealthy and the powerful. Mr. President, when we talk about why the middle class is declining, that is a tough issue, and I'm not here to suggest that I know all of the answers. I surely don't. It's a complicated issue. Honest people have differences of opinions. But let me touch on a, a, a few areas uh, that I think will explain uh, why poverty is going up and the middle class is going down. And one of them deals with our trade policies. I can remember, Mr. President, a number of years ago, I was in the House of Representatives, and I can remember the lobbyists and the big money interests coming around and saying, well, if you guys only pass NAFTA, uh, this would create a whole lot of jobs in the United States because we would be able to ship uh, products made in America to uh, Mexico. And in fact, as I recall, and it seems almost humorous now, what they said is that if we passed NAFTA, it would solve the problem of illegal immigration because the economy of Mexico would be so strong that people would stay in their own country and not try to sneak across the border. And that is, as we look back on it, somewhat humorous that, we even, that that issue was even uh, discussed. But one of the reasons, uh, Mr. President, that unfortunately 
uh, for a variety of reasons we have not dealt with is our uh, disastrous uh, trade policy. Now that is NAFTA, that is permanent normal uh, trade relation, that is uh, trade policies which have encouraged uh, large corporations in this country to send jobs abroad because they can find workers in other countries, in low-wage countries, who are prepared to work for pennies an hour. And you know, I think we have not, not only haven't we addressed this issue from an economic perspective the way we should, and I have to tell you, Mr. President, uh, I know that uh, during campaigns, uh, a lot of members of Congress put their 30-second ads on the air saying how concerned they are about outsourcing and our trade policy. But somehow, the day after the election, I don't hear that discussion resumed on the floor of the House of the Senate. And I want to say this is true, not just of Republicans, but of Democrats as well. A lot of Democrats campaign on the need for trade reform, but it doesn't happen. Um, in fact, I've been here in the Senate now for almost four years, and I have not heard one serious, underlying serious discussion to explain how in recent years we have lost millions and millions of manufacturing jobs when those jobs were the backbone of the working class of this country, not providing not only decent wages, but decent benefits, decent health care, decent pensions. Mr. President, there was once a time in this country when a manufacturing job was a ticket to the middle class. And I've got to say something, because I remember not so many years ago, there were national leaders are saying, well, to the young people, you don't have to worry about that factory work anymore. You don't have to be involved in production because, you know what, all of the jobs in the future are going to be nice and clean in offices and on computers. And I think we demeaned and insulted the people who built the products that we consume. There is nothing wrong with a factory job if workers there earn a decent wage and have a decent benefit. Those are the jobs that built America. You know, and I remember, and we should never forget, uh, that, and, and we now have celebrated just the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, and there was a speech that uh, President Roosevelt gave a day after Pearl Harbor in a joint session of the Congress when he declared war on Japan. And I saw a video of that speech, and it was really a remarkable speech because at that moment, at that moment, the United States was not only fighting Japan, we knew the fight with Germany and Nazism was right around the corner. And at that point, we were having to fight a war on two fronts, in Asia and in Europe. Hitler was on the march, the Japanese were in China, the Japanese had just attacked Pearl Harbor. And here we were, just about to enter the war. How could we possibly win that war? And yet, Mr. President, because of the manufacturing capabilities that we had in that time, and this is an amazing story, literally in two and a half years, the war was essentially won, obviously not completed until 1945. But because of the incredible industrial capabilities in this country, the ability to transform our manufacturing center, sector from a consumer-oriented sector from automobiles into tanks, from shirts into uniforms, from hunting rifles into machine guns. Within two, three years, we had essentially won that war. It was an incredible effort on the part of workers in this country who transformed our economy into an industrial force that was able to supply our soldiers with the weapons that they needed to defeat Hitler and the Japanese. And where are we today in terms of our manufacturing capabilities? As I mentioned earlier, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I went shopping for Christmas presents, literally. It was just a plain old department store. Literally very hard to find a product not manufactured in China. Very hard to find a product a gift that we could buy that was manufactured in the United States of America. And I think people understand instinctually that this country will not be a major economic player in years to come. 
if we allow our manufacturing base to continue to decline. Again, just under Bush, we went from 17 million manufacturing jobs down to 12 million jobs in eight years of Bush. How do we survive as a strong industrial power if our manufacturing jobs disappear? Today, Mr. President, there are fewer manufacturing jobs in this country than there were in April of 1941, about eight months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Fewer manufacturing jobs today than in April of 1941. And those manufacturing jobs that are left, that are left, in many cases pay lower wages with fewer benefits than they did a generation ago. In other words, we are moving not only in a decline in our manufacturing jobs, but in the wages that our workers earn and the benefits that they receive. And I raise all of these issues to put this agreement between the President and the Republican leadership in a broader, broader context. Today, and this is just an incredible fact, and it is just absolutely frightening to the future of the middle class in this country. Today, entry-level automobile workers at General Motors and Chrysler now earn half as much, half as much as their peers made just one year ago. Instead of making $28 an hour, a middle-class wage, they are now making $14 an hour. And this is in the automobile industry, which has always been the gold standard for manufacturing jobs uh, in America. And if workers with a union in the automobile industry are making $14 an hour, what do you think workers in New Mexico are going to be making without a strong union? So what you are seeing is a dissolution of the middle class Wages are going down, and in this remarkable example, a 50% reduction. The older workers making good wages, new workers half the wages. Is this the future of America? Is this what our kids have to look forward to? That they're going to be earning half the wages that their fathers made, that their mothers made? Is that the future? And in the midst of all of that, we run up a huge national debt, send our jobs to China, and we give tax breaks to billionaires? Is that the future these kids have to look forward to? I certainly hope not. But let me tell you something. We're going to have to be tough, and we're going to have to take on some very powerful special interests to turn this whole thing around. Mr. President, you know, we often talk, and, and today I've been voting a lot of time, to our national debt, $13.7 trillion, uh, and to our deficit, which is $1.4 trillion, but we cannot ignore our trade deficit. In 2008, our trade deficit was nearly $700 billion. Last year, our trade deficit with China alone was almost $227 billion. In other words, we are purchasing a whole lot more product than we are selling. And sometimes I get a kick out of hearing the defenders of our trade policy talk about all of the product that we are exporting. Well, yeah, we are exporting a lot, but we are importing a heck of a lot more. So, Mr. President, I think what you got is a major economic issue here, and that economic issue is that we are losing millions of good-paying jobs because of our disastrous trade policies, and furthermore, the jobs that we have. On those jobs, we're seeing a decline in wages and in benefits. And I think the bottom line of this is not just, if you like, an economic issue, it's a moral issue as well. And that is when companies like General Electric and all the rest, I don't mean to be picking hard on General Electric, but I have a, I have a quote here, which I want to make. This was a few years back. I think it's important because it applies not just to General Electric. But I want people to hear this. GE is, of course, one of our major corporations. And in fact, as recent disclosure pointed out, uh, the taxpayers of this country through the Fed provided $16 billion in bailout to General Electric, General Electric during the recent crisis. 
This is what the head of CEO of General Electric, Jeffrey Inmelt, uh, said uh, in uh, 2002, December 6th. Quote, Jeff Inmelt, head of CEO. When I am talking to GE managers, I talk China, 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 five Chinas. You need to be there. You need to change the way people talk about it and how they get there. I am a nut on China. Outsourcing from China is going to grow to five billion. We are building a tech center in China. Every discussion today has to center on China. The cost basis is extremely attractive. You can take an 18 cubic foot refrigerator, make it in China, land it in the United States, and land it for less than we can make an 18 cubic foot refrigerator today ourselves. End of quote. Jeffrey Inmel, chairman, CEO of General Electric, quoted in an investor meeting on December 6, 2002. Gee, when GE recently had a couple of years ago some really difficult economic times, they needed $16 billion to bail them out. I didn't hear Mr. Inmel going to China, 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 China. I didn't hear that. I heard Mr. Inmel going to the taxpayers of the United States for his welfare check. So I say to Mr. Inmel, and I say to all of these CEOs who have been so quick to run to China that maybe it's time to start reinvesting in the United States of America. But it's not just Mr. Inmel. And I don't mean to just pick on him, it's all of them. They all see the future in China, in Vietnam, in countries where people work for pennies an hour. Now, Mr. Inmelt, Inmelt uh, came to his position in the footsteps of the former CEO of GE, uh, Jack Welch. And uh, what Jack Welch was famously quoted as saying, quote, ideally, this is the guy who was head of General Electric before Inmelt. He said, ideally, we'd have, a, we'd have every plant we own on a barge. End of quote. You remember that quote? He said, we'd have ideally every plant we own on a barge. What did he mean by that? What he meant by that, if you're on a barge, you can move your plant to any part of the world where the labor is cheapest. So if it gets too expensive in China and you've got to pay people 75 cents an hour, you go to Vietnam. If it gets too expensive in Vietnam, maybe you can go to North Korea and have people work on the martial law. I don't know. But what he was saying is, his goal was to make sure that GE would create jobs in those countries in the world where workers were paid the lowest possible wages. And former GE executive vice president, Frank Doyle, said, and I quote, we did a lot of violence to the expectations of the American workforce. We downsized, we delayed, and we outsourced. He was honest enough to admit what he did. But again, I don't mean to just pick on Jeff Inmelt or General Electric. It is, uh, it is a history of, of corporations all over America. Let me just mention um, that the uh, CEO of Cisco, uh, John Chambers, and this is what uh, he says. Then, you know, we tell the young people the future is in information technology. We want you guys to be smart, learn how to use the computers. You're not going to work in factories. This is what the CEO of Cisco, certainly one of the large IT companies in the United States, said. He said, quote, China will become the IT center of the world. And we can have a healthy discussion about whether it will be, whether that's in 2020 or 2040. What we are trying to do is outline an entire strategy of becoming a Chinese company. End of quote. John Chambers, CEO of Cisco. This was in, 19, in 2004. Furthermore, he says, October 15, 2004, this is Cisco, we believe in giving something back and truly becoming a Chinese company. Meanwhile, when Cisco needs tax breaks, they get it from the taxpayers of the United States of America. Boy, are they taking us for dummies. They outsource their jobs to China and so forth. Now, in the last campaign, 
One of the folks who ended up getting a lot more publicity, I think, than he usually does, is uh, the president and the CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a gentleman named Tom Donahue. And again, my point tonight is not to just to pick on individuals, because every quote that I'm giving you now can be multiplied 50, 100 times over. This is what corporate America believes. They believe that it is totally appropriate to throw American workers out on the street, move to low-wage countries, China and other countries, pay people a few cents an hour, bring their products back into the United States. Thomas Donahue is the President and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and he got a lot of publicity recently, especially during the last uh, election, because uh, the Chamber of Commerce became the funnel for a lot of money that went into uh, campaigns around this country. They raised tens and tens of millions of dollars. A lot of that money, I believe, was undisclosed. So all the rich folks and the billionaires gave money to the Chamber of Commerce, and they uh, were able to uh, elect candidates that were sympathetic to their point of view. So let's find out what their point of view is. This is a quote, again, going back to 2004. Thomas Damiou, CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Quote, one job sent overseas, if it happens to be my job, is one too many. But the benefits of offshoring jobs outweighs the cost. End of quote. Tom Donahue, President and CEO of the largest business organization in America. They are in favor of offshoring American jobs. They think it is a good idea because they understand that if corporations throw American workers out on the street and go to China and pay people their pennies an hour, they are going to make more profits. That's what they say. Give them credit. They're upfront about it. We don't care about the United States of America. We don't care about young people. We don't care about the future of this country. Jeff Inmel told us the future of the world is in China. And here is a quote that appeared in one of the papers. U.S. Chamber of Commerce President and CEO Thomas Donahue urged American companies to send jobs overseas. I don't know if we have a date on that quote. In 2004, we think it is. Let me repeat that in one of the newspapers. AP, an AP story. U.S. Chamber of Commerce President and CEO Thomas Donahue. This is the head of the largest business organization in America. That's where all these businesses come together to develop policy, to lobby us, to provide campaign contributions. U.S. Chamber of Commerce President and CEO Thomas Donahue urged American companies to send jobs overseas. Now, that's really patriotic. That's standing up for the United States of America. Donahue said Wednesday that exporting high-paid tech jobs to low-cost countries such as India, China, and Russia saves companies money. It is no surprise that Donahue, who tripled the Chamber of Commerce's lobbying team since 1997 and aggressively promotes pro-business policies, endorses offshoring. The three million member organizations of the Chamber of Commerce, the world's largest business consortium, champions tax cuts, free trade, workers' compensation reform, and more liberal trade policies with China. End of quote. What more do you need when you want to understand why we have lost millions of good paying manufacturing jobs, why wages are going down? What more do you need when the President of the Chamber of Commerce tells you that he thinks it is good public policy to send jobs to China? So I don't think there is, you know, uh, much that you have to, you know, discover. They're telling you this. Now, in a moment, what I'm going to be talking about is how these ideas from the big money people become implemented into policy, which has to do a lot with lobbying and campaign contributions. I want to about how the business leaders of this country feel about the workers of this country and the young people of this country. This again is a quote that I apologize, it is a few years old, about 2004 perhaps. 2004, quote, January 19th. This is from Alan Lacey, 
the CEO, who was then the CEO of Sears Roebuck and Company. Here's what he said, quote, there are four or five times as many smart, driven people in China than there are in the United States. And there's another four or five, three or four times as many people in India that are smarter or as smart or have more drive. And if technology is now going to basically reduce location as a barrier to competition, i.e., you have a worldwide web, and you could do your work in China or India, then essentially you've got something like whatever that was, seven or nine times more smart, committed people that are now competing in this marketplace against certain activities. So we're going to see, I think, this huge incentive to shift some of these more commodity-like knowledge workers' jobs offshore. So here you have our blue-collar jobs decimated, and we told the kids not to worry, you didn't want to work in a factory anyhow, we've got these good information technology computer-based jobs for you. But then you have the heads of large corporations saying, hey, why do I want to get American young people to do this? I can have Indian young people do it who will work for a fraction of the wages. And I think we all see this. I mean, it's nothing new. You try to get a plane reservation right now and you're talking to somebody in India. And please do not hear me to be anti-India or anti-Chinese. That is the furthest thing that I, I would want anyone to think. We want to work with people all over the world. But you don't have to destroy the middle class of this country to help people around the world. You don't have to be a corporate CEO to sell out your own people who built your company to run abroad. So this senator is not anti-Chinese, far from it, anti-Indian, anti-Vietnamese, not at all. I am, I guess I plead guilty to being pro-American, I don't know. Maybe that's suspect here. The former CEO of Hewlett Packard, Carly Fiorino, and this obviously, Ms. Fiorino ran for, for senator. This is what uh, she said when she was the CEO of Hewlett Packard in 2004. She said, quote, there is no job that is America's God-given right anymore, end of quote. I could go on and on and on, but I think you got the point. And the point is that when things get rough for corporate America, as they did recently for General Electric, they run, run to the taxpayers of this country in order to be bailed out. But their overall philosophy is that their goal in life is to make as much money as they can in any way they can, and therefore you run to those countries where wages are low. And what you're seeing now, and you're seeing it all of the time, and it's not just blue collar, it is increasingly white collar. You have radiologists who are able to read x-rays uh, in India. Uh, you have people you know, people behind the commuter, computer can do work in India as well as here. And, and these corporate folks have taken advantage of that and sold out uh, the uh, young people of this country and, and, and the working class of this uh, country. Uh, Mr. President, um, as you know, it is virtually impossible to find anything in, in a Walmart or other stores like that that is made in America today. Uh, this is especially true for clothing. Uh, an increasing uh, amount of our clothing uh, comes from Bangladesh. Today, there are 4,000 garment factories in Bangladesh making clothes for Walmart, Gap, J.C. Penney, uh, Levi Strauss, uh, Tommy Hilfinger, and many, many others. Uh, garment workers in Bangladesh, uh, some three and a half million of them, and that number is growing, are among the lowest paid uh, workers in the world, and they have difficulty buying enough food and shelter for their own needs. Um, as I mentioned earlier today, the good news is the minimum wage in Bangladesh was doubled. It went from 11 and a half cents an hour to 23 cents an hour. So when you buy a shirt made in Bangladesh, you have young women there coming in from the countryside who are paid now, have received a doubling of their minimum wage to 23 cents an hour. 
Is that something that our people should be asked to compete against? Should we say to the American worker, hey, we can get you jobs. We're prepared to invest in the United States. Yeah, we're an American company. You helped make us great. Thank you for the work you've done over the years. Thank you for purchasing our products. Thank you for making us strong. And if you are prepared to work for a dollar an hour, two dollars an hour, three dollars an hour, you know, we'll come back. And by the way, Mr. President, I think you know this, in the last campaign, what did we hear? What are we beginning to hear rumbles about? Abolishing the minimum wage. Abolishing the minimum wage. Minimum wage now is, what is it, $7.50? Uh, $7.50 an hour. That's what we say should be $7.25 an hour. That's what we say should be the minimum that any American worker gets. There are people out there who say, look, if I can hire somebody in China for two or three bucks an hour, and you want a job in America, and I have to pay you seven dollars, 25 cents an hour, why would I want to do that? We abolish the minimum wage? Hey, I may hire you. Now, what a wonderful prospect for our young people to think about working for four or five dollars an hour. So, Mr. President, I think if we want to understand why the middle class in this country is collapsing, why unemployment is high, why our manufacturing base has been decimated, why it is hard to purchase a product made in the United States. It has a lot to do with our trade policies, which were pushed by people like Mr. Donahue of the Chamber of Commerce and many, many uh, others. But it is not just a disastrous trade policy that has brought us to where we are today. The immediate cause of this crisis is, and, you know, just gets me sick thinking about it, and that is what the crooks on Wall Street have done to the American people. These people fought for a period of years to deregulate the banking industry. These people said to us, well, you know, if you just will do away with Glass-Steagall, if you will just allow financial institutions, commercial banks, investor banks, insurance companies, if you allow them to merge, do away with these walls, which Glass-Steagall since the Depression had established, my God, it will be just terrific. It will be good for our economy, good for the American people, good for our international competitiveness. And I remember that, those debates, Mr. President, because I was at that point in the House of Representatives. I was a member of the banking, the Financial Institutions Committee at that point, and uh, I was on the committee that dealt with that. And I remember all of the times that Alan Greenspan came before the committee and said, you know, and, and, and Robert Rubin, you had Republicans, you had Democrats, coming before the committee and saying, oh, it's what you got to do. You got to deregulate. You got to let these guys merge. Bigger is better. And against my votes, I mean, somewhere on the internet, there is a, a discussion that I had with Alan Greenspan when he came before our committee. And I made it very clear to the people of Vermont, to him and to everybody else, that I did not think deregulation was a good idea, that I thought it would lead to disaster in some place in this world. There is a quote of mine which kind of pretty much predicts what was going to happen. But needless to say, I was one vote, and majority of the members in the House and Senate voted uh, to deregulate. And the rest is unfortunately uh, history. And what we saw is that people on Wall Street, I think, you know, I may be wrong on this, but I, I think operating from a business model based on fraud, uh, based on dishonesty, understanding that the likelihood of them ever getting caught was small, that if things got really bad, they would be bailed out by the uh, taxpayers, understanding that they are too powerful to be ever be put in jail, to be indicted, uh, understanding that in this country when you're a CEO, on Wall Street, you have so much wealth and so much power and have so many lawyers and so many friends in Congress that you could do pretty much anything you want uh, and not much is going to happen to you. And they did it. They did it. 
uh, their greed and their recklessness and their illegal behavior uh, destroyed this economy. And what they did to the American people is so horrible, so horrible. So here you had a middle class which is already being battered, as we discussed, as a result of trade agreements, loss of manufacturing jobs, health care costs going up, can't afford to send your kid to college. That's going on for years. And then these guys start pushing worthless and complicated financial instruments. The whole thing explodes. The whole thing explodes. And they come crying to the taxpayers of America to bail them out. And I will never forget, never forget, uh, Hank Paulson coming before it was the Democratic caucus. I'm an independent. I'm the longest serving independent in Congress. Uh, coming before the Democratic caucus saying that uh, within a few days he needed $700 billion or the entire world financial system would collapse. And my suggestion to him at that meeting is if you need the money, why don't you go to your friends and get the money? Why don't you go to all your banker friends and your millionaire friends and your billionaire friends and get some of that money and don't go to the middle class of this country that has already been harmed? And in fact, we brought an amendment here to the floor of the Senate in one of the first amendments that I brought as a, as a senator, which would suggested, which the amendment was that the top 2 percent should pay for the bailout, not the American people. It got defeated in a voice vote. So what goes on in Wall Street is that we have seen a tremendous concentration of ownership there, another issue that we do not talk enough about. I know. Uh, Senator Brown and Senator Kaufman and I worked on a proposal to try to break up these large financial institutions. I think we got 30 some odd votes on that. Couldn't do it. So what the American people should know now is that while we bailed out Wall Street because they were quote unquote too big to fail, three out of the four largest financial institutions, all of whom were bailed out very significantly, are now larger today than they were before the bailout. Incredibly, since the start of the financial crisis, Wells Fargo has grown 43 percent bigger, J.P. Morgan Chase has grown 51 percent bigger, and Bank of America is now 138 percent larger than before the financial crisis began. Can you imagine that? We bailed these guys out because they were too big to fail, and now three out of the four largest ones are much larger than they were. How did that happen? Well, in, in 2008, Bank of America, the largest commercial bank in this country, which received a $45 billion taxpayer bailout, purchased Countrywide, the largest mortgage lender in this country, and Merrill Lynch, the largest stock, broker, stock brokerage firm in the country. That's how Bank of America expanded. They were too big to fail. Today, much bigger. In 2008, J.P. Morgan Chase, which received a $25 billion bailout from the Bush Treasury Department and a $29 billion bridge loan from the Federal Reserve acquired Bear Stearns and Washington Mutual, the largest savings loan in the country. That's how J.P. Morgan Chase, a huge bank, became even bigger. In 2008, the Treasury Department provided an $18 billion tax break to Wells Fargo to purchase Wachovia, allowing that bank to control 11 percent of all bank deposits in this country. Hear this, Mr. President, because this is just quite unbelievable. When we try to understand what's going on in the economy today, the rich getting richer, poor getting poorer, middle class collapsing. Today, after we bailed out all of these large banks, three out of four of them are now much larger than they were before. And today, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo, the four largest financial institutions in this country, hold about $7.4 trillion in assets. And that is equal to over half of the nation's estimated total output last year. Four financial institutions have assets worth more than 52 percent of our total output last year. And instead of allowing them to, uh, instead of breaking these folks up, these large institutions up, 
we let them get bigger. In fact, Mr. President, according to Simon Chase, Simon uh, Johnson, I'm sorry, the former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, quote, as a result of the crisis and various government rescue efforts, the largest six banks in our economy now have total assets in excess, he claims, of 63% of GDP. This is a significant increase from even 2006, when the same bank's assets were around 55% of GDP. You understand what this is about? Four financial institutions owning over half of the assets of America. You talk about economic power. You talk about political power. That is what we were talking about. Simon Johnson continues, he said, this is a complete transformation compared with the situation in the United States just 15 years ago, when the largest six banks had combined assets of only about 17% of GDP. So today, 15 years ago, 17%, six banks. Today, four banks, he claims 63% of GDP. In other words, Mr. President, over the last 15 years, the largest banks in this country have more than tripled in size. Now, Mr. President, not only are too big to, bail, to fail financial institutions bad for taxpayers, the enormous concentration of ownership in the financial sector has led to higher bank fees, usurious interest rates on credit cards, and fewer choices for consumers. What do you think happens when you have a few institutions, a handful of institutions, controlling mortgage lending or the ability of people, where people get their credit cards? Today, Mr. President, these huge financial institutions have become so big that according to the Washington Post, the four largest banks in America now issue one out of every two mortgages, two out of three credit cards, and hold four out of every $10 in bank deposits in the entire country. Mr. President, if any of these financial institutions were to get into major trouble again, taxpayers would be on the hook for another substantial bailout, and we cannot allow that to happen. So the whole reason for the bailout is that if any of these financial institutions collapsed, it would take down a significant part of the economy and millions of jobs. We had to prop them up. We had to bail them out. And it turns out that since we bailed them out, these handful of financial institutions are now even larger than they were before. And we now know they are enjoying very strong profits, and they are paying their CEOs even more in compensation than they did before the breakdown. In my view, Mr. President, if we are serious about understanding why the middle class is collapsing, if we are serious about really getting this economy moving again, long term, we have got to have the courage to do exactly what Teddy Roosevelt did back in the trust-busting days and break these banks up. The point that Roosevelt was making is that it is bad for the economy when a handful of entities control industry after industry. They have a stranglehold on the economy. You've got to break them up. And yet, I have heard very little discussion. I know there was an amendment from Sherrod Brown and Ted Kaufman, and I introduced legislation on this issue to start breaking them up. But frankly, their lobbyists and their money are such that it becomes very difficult to do that. But that is exactly what we should be doing. The legislation that I introduced last year, S-2746, the Too Big to Fail, Too Big to Exist Act, would break up these large financial institutions. That legislation would require the Secretary of Treasury to identify every single financial institution and insurance company in this country that is too big to fail within 90 days. And after one year, the Secretary of the Treasury would be required to break up these institutions so that their failure would not lead to the collapse of the U.S. or global economy. 
I think that that is pretty obvious. We passed a financial reform bill, which I supported and got a major provision in there asking for disclosure of the Fed and an investigation of conflicts of interest at the Fed and an audit of the Fed during the financial crisis. But overall, I by no means think that that legislation went anywhere near far enough. I think it was a modest piece of legislation, and I think that's an issue we've got to revisit. In my view, Mr. President, and I worry very much about the future because I have the feeling in my stomach that that day is going to come around again when these huge financial institutions are tottering, when they're going to go running to Washington and they're going to say, hey, you've got to bail us out. In my view, if an institution is too big to fail, it is too big to exist. Let us break them up so that we do not have to go through another bailout of Wall Street. Furthermore, I believe that when you have that kind of concentration of ownership, when you have four large financial institutions holding half the mortgages in this country, controlling two-thirds of the credit cards, and amassing 40 percent of all deposits, this is not good for a competitive economy. We're supposed to be living in free market capitalism, real competition. This is not free market competition. This is a huge concentration of ownership where a few people have enormous power over the economy and with their wealth, the political life of this country. No single financial institution should be so large that its failure would cause catastrophic risk to millions of American jobs or to our nation's economic well-being. No single financial institution should have holdings so extensive that its failure could send the world's economy into crisis. We were there two years ago, and in many ways, despite the passage of the financial reform bill, we are even more there now. The big, huge financial institutions that we bailed out are bigger, more huge today. And interestingly enough, on that issue, Mr. President, it is not just progressives like myself who hold that view. There are some pretty conservative folks who are honest conservatives. Is concentration of ownership in a handful of entities, is that a conservative proposition? Not in terms of my understanding what conservatives are about. I don't think so. You have at least three Federal Reserve Bank presidents that support breaking up too big to fail banks. <clears throat> James Bullard, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, President and Chief Executive of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, Kansas City, <clears throat> Kansas City Fed President Thomas M. Honig, and Dallas Fed President Richard W. Fisher. These guys don't have my political views. I am a proud progressive. My guess is they're conservatives. But anybody with an ounce of brains in your head understands that four large financial institutions that have assets that are more than half of the GDP of the United States of America places us, A, in a very dangerous position in terms of too big to fail, and B, it is just bad for a competitive economy. Is there any wonder why people are paying 25 or 30 percent interest rates on their credit cards? That's because these guys issue two-thirds of the credit cards in America. Is there any reason why they were issuing fraudulent mortgage packages to people? Because there is not the kind of competition that should be there. But this is not just Bernie Sanders' point of view. This is, here is what Kansas City Fed President Honig said, and I quote. Sorry, I don't have the date on that. But I think it was fairly recently. Last year, this is uh, Kansas City Fed President Honig, quote, I think they should be broken up. I think there's no reason why, as we've done in other instances, of finding the right mechanism to break them into their components. And in doing so, I think you'll make the financial system itself more stable. I think you will make it more competitive. And I think you will have long-run benefits over our current system which mixes it and therefore leads to bailouts when crises occur. End of quote. This is Tom, Thomas uh, Honig, uh, the head of the 
Fed, uh, Kansas City Fed. Right? Very simple statement, and he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. But, and I'm going to get to the reason why in a little while, we've not been able to do this. We've not been able to do this because Wall Street sends their lobbyists down here in droves, and Wall Street provides zillions of dollars in campaign contributions, and Wall Street fights like the Dickens to make sure that any strong provisions that some of us might bring up is defeated. Here is what the uh, president of the Dallas Fed, Mr. Fisher, said, quote, based on my experience at the Fed, the marginal cost of too big to fail financial institutions easily dwarf their purported social and macroeconomic benefits. The risk posed by coddling too big to fail banks is simply too great. Winston Churchill said that, he was quoting Winston Churchill, in finance, Everything that is agreeable is unsound, and everything that is sound is disagreeable." End of quote. That's from Churchill. And uh, Mr. Fisher continues, I think the disagreeable but sound thing to do regarding institutions that are too big to fail is to dismantle them over time into institutions that can be prudently managed and regulated across borders. And this should be done before the next financial crisis because we now know it surely cannot be done in the middle of a crisis, end of quote. And that's Dallas Fed President, uh, Mr. Fisher. Mr. President, uh, they are already in the process of breaking up big banks in England. According to the Washington Post, the British government announced Tuesday, and that is not this Tuesday, it's way back last year. The British government announced a while back that it will break up parts of major financial institutions bailed out by taxpayers. The British government, spurred on by European regulators, is forcing the Royal Bank of Scotland, Lloyds Banking Group, and Northern Rock to sell off parts of their operations. The Europeans are calling for more and smaller banks to increase competition and eliminate the threat posed by banks so large that they must be regulated. They must be res rescued. Uh, they must be rescued by taxpayers, uh, no matter how they conducted their business, in order to avoid damaging uh, the global financial system. Mr. President, very interesting development occurred on October 15th of last year. On October 15th, and as I mentioned earlier, Alan Greenspan, who was the chairman of the Fed before Mr. Bernanke, and I had our run-ins. Mr. Greenspan, along with uh, Mr. Rubin and others, were the chief proponents, Larry Summers in there, were the chief proponents of deregulation of financial institutions. And Mr. Greenspan and I had more than a few arguments. But on October 15th of last year, Alan Greenspan, who admitted that his views on deregulation were wrong, and I give the man courage for at least admitting that he was wrong, did a heck of a lot of damage, but at least he had the courage to admit that he was wrong. He was quoted in Bloomberg News as saying, and I quote, if they are too big to fail, they are too big. In 1911, we broke up Standard Oil, so what happened? The individual parts became more valuable than the whole. Maybe that's what we need to do, end of quote. Alan Greenspan, the architect of deregulation, citing the fact that in 1911, we broke up Standard Oil. So here you have Greenspan who helped cause this crisis, at least having the courage to understand that now is the time to begin breaking up these big financial institutions. They have enormous power over our economy. They have enormous power over our political life. Their lobbyists are all over this place. And you can't walk down the hall without bumping into some of their lobbyists. So we've got to start breaking them up, and the American people have got to be prepared for a major fight to take on these huge financial institutions. <sighs> Mr. President, former Fed Chairman Paul Volcker, who has advised the Obama administration, supports breaking up big banks so that they no longer pose systemic risk to the entire economy. According to a recent article in the New York Times, Volcker said, and I quote, People say I'm old-fashioned, and banks can no longer be separated 
from non-bank activity. That argument brought us to where we are today, end of quote, Paul Vocal. I couldn't agree more. That's what I'm talking about. You've got to start breaking up four financial institutions which led us into the economic disaster we're in right now that remain much too big to fail, that we're going to have to bail out again and again and again, and that today have a stranglehold on our economy. The New York Times said that under Volcker's plan, quote, J.P. Morgan Chase would have to give up the trading operations acquired from Bear Stearns. Bank of America and Merrill Lynch would go back to being separate companies. Goldman Sachs could no longer be a bank holding company. End of quote. That's exactly what needs to be happening. The reality is, and I come from a small state, we have community banks. Here's the irony, Mr. President. The banks in Vermont, in the midst of all of this financial disaster, they did just fine. They are small, locally owned banks. They know the people they lend money to. The CEOs are not making hundreds of millions of dollars in profit. They know their community. They know what loans made sense. Now, I may be old-fashioned, like Mr. Volcker, but I think that's what banking is about, to lend out money to people in the productive economy the business community that can use the money to expand, create jobs, to homeowners that need that money to buy a home, not to be living in your own world, engaged in a huge gambling casino, producing and selling worthless products that nobody understands. The function of a bank is to be a middleman between people who need money and are producing real products and helping them get that money and people who are investing in the banks. It is not supposed to be an island unto itself. But in recent years, what we have seen incredibly, incredibly, 40% of all profits in America went to the financial institutions. Small number of people working there, relatively small. 40% of the profits because they live in a world. It is a huge gambling casino. We need financial institutions to go back to the way banking used to be. And the job of banks is to provide affordable loans to the productive economy so that we can produce real products, real goods, and we can create real jobs when we do that. Robert Reich. Uh, President Clinton's former Labor Secretary has said, quote, no important public interest is served by allowing giant banks to grow too big to fail. Wall Street banks should be split up and soon. We've got a lot of people, some conservatives, some progressives, are saying the same thing. If we're going to rebuild the middle class, the way to do that is, among other things, to change our disastrous trade policies to make it clear to corporate America that they cannot continue to sell out the workers of this country by moving to China, other low-wage countries. And we also have got to have a much more competitive economy, one in which four large financial institutions do not own assets of more than half of the GDP of this country. And on that point, I find it very interesting that it's not just progressives like myself or Robert Reich but you have some conservative bankers, people who are heading uh, Fed banks around this country who are saying pretty much the same thing. Now also, Mr. President, when we talk about banks, I want to get back to a point that I raised earlier, because it's an issue really I've been working on for years and years. And that is this issue of usury. And I mentioned earlier that if you read the religious tenets of the major religions throughout history, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and others, what you find is almost universal objection and disgust and a feeling of immorality in terms of usury. When we talked about usury in the United States, what we usually talked about were thugs, gangsters, working on street corners, 
who lent out money at outrageously high interest rates to workers, and when that money was not repaid back at the interest rates asked for, the thugs would beat the workers up. In fact, I'm thinking now about the first movie of Rocky. Mr. President, I don't know if you, you saw the first movie of Rocky with Sylvester Stallone. And before Rocky became a successful fighter and the heavyweight champ of the world in the movie, that's what he was. Big, tough guy, and he beat up people who did not pay back the gangsters, the high interest rates that they were asking. Well, the world has changed. And now the people who are committing usury are not the gangsters on street corners all over America. Their place has been taken by the CEOs of Wall Street financial institutions who are lending out money to desperate Americans at 25 or 30 percent interest rates. That, my friends, is called usury, according to every religion on earth. That is immoral. What you're doing is going up to people who are desperate, people who are hurting, and you're saying, you desperately need money, we're going to give you money. But there's a string attached. You're going to be charged an outrageous amount of interest on that money. So here's the irony. The people who are hurting the most pay the highest interest rates. The people who need the money the most, need the money the least, are paying the lowest interest rates. So the Fed lent out billions and billions of dollars to the largest financial institutions of the General Electric, often at less than 1%. That's American taxpayer money. Large corporations, less than 1%. But if you are a worker today and you're having hard times, maybe you're unemployed, you're going to pay 25 or 30% interest rates on your credit, and sometimes more. You have this payday lending where people are paid outrageous sums of money. I think that's immoral. I think we have got to stop that. And it disturbs me very much that especially at a time when we bailed out these large financial institutions, that they are still able to charge our people 25 or 30 percent. People who bail them out get hit the second time around by having to pay 25, 30 percent interest rates. And right now, it's not even 25 or 30 percent. As a matter of fact, the tenth largest credit card issuer in this country, an entity called Premier Bank, is now offering a credit card with a 79.9 percent interest rate and a $300 credit limit. What do we make of that? Finan tenth largest credit card issuer in this country charging 79 percent interest rates, and we allow that to go on? These are crooks. These are no different than the gangsters who beat up people on street corners when they didn't get payment back, except now the gangsters are wearing three-piece suits and sitting in some fancy suite on Wall Street. <coughs> Mr. President, today over one quarter of all credit card holders in this country are now paying interest rates above 20 percent, and as I indicated, as high as 79 percent. Mr. President, let's be clear. When credit card companies charge over 20 percent interest on credit cards, they are not engaged in the business of making credit available. What they are involved in is extortion and loan sharking. Nothing essentially different than gangsters, except they dress a lot better. That's all it is. It's thievery, and we tolerate it, and we bail them out. And, Mr. President, it's interesting uh, in terms of these high interest rates, because for many, many years, we have had states, including the state of Vermont, saying that you're not going to charge outrageously high interest rates. For example, between uh, establishing a usury law is not a radical concept, which is what we've got to move it. We've got to put a cap on interest rates. In fact, between 1978 and today, over 20 states in America had laws capping credit card interest rates. In Alabama, the legal maximum rate of interest is 8 percent. 
In Alaska, it's 10.5%. Arizona, 10%. Idaho, 12%. Kansas, 15%. State of Vermont, my own state, the legal maximum rate of interest is 12%. But what happened with all of those state interest cap rates disappeared under the 1978 U.S. Supreme Court decision known as the Marquette case, which allowed banks to charge whatever interest rates they wanted if they moved to a state without an interest rate like South Dakota or Delaware. So all these companies moved to South Dakota, they moved to Delaware, no interest rates, and they charged the people in Vermont or Hawaii or any place else 25 or 30 percent interest rates. So, Mr. President, getting back to the original agreement, which I strongly disagree with, that the President and the Republican leadership agreed to, if we are going to save the middle class, and I think that agreement significantly helps the upper income people by lowering the tax rates for millionaires and billionaires, by lowering the interest rate on the estate tax, by providing some business loans which are not the kinds of investments that can best create jobs. One of the things that we have got to do to protect the middle class today is have a cap on interest rates because otherwise all the people are doing is getting a paycheck, they're going into debt, and then they're paying 25 or 30 percent on their interest rates, money which is going to a handful of banks on Wall Street. Now, I have introduced legislation to put a cap on interest rates, and it ain't a radical idea. Right now, credit unions in this country, by law, are not allowed to charge more than 15 percent except under extraordinary circumstances. And by and large, that's worked for about 30 years. So if you get a credit card through a credit union, you're not going to be paying, in almost every case, no more than 15 percent. And that was developed by federal law. And you know what? I talked to the credit union people in the state of Vermont, people all over the country. Credit unions are doing pretty good. They're doing just fine. They're not the ones who came begging the American taxpayer for a huge bailout. So for 30 years, they have survived just fine on a 15 percent cap. But our friends on Wall Street who caused this recession, our friends on Wall Street who needed a welfare check from the American people in order to survive, our friends on Wall Street who today are earning more money than they did before the bailout, we don't have any cap on the interest rates that they can charge. In my view, if the credit unions have survived and survived well with a 15 percent max interest rate cap, most they could charge, work for credit unions, it could work for the private banks as well, and that is what we have got to do. According to a recent article, this is not so recent, this is a year ago, an article in the Los Angeles Times, quote, Chris Culver, a legislative and regulatory analyst for the California Credit Union League, said that a rate cap hasn't hurt business for the nearly 400 credit unions represented by his organization. It hasn't been an issue, he said. Credit unions are still able to thrive. So here's my point, Mr. President. Middle class is hurting, unemployment outrageously high, poverty increasing, 50 million people, no health insurance, gap between the very rich, everybody else, manufacturing collapsing, jobs going all over the world, China, Mexico, India. We have got to start protecting the middle class of this country. A number of things that we've got to do, but I think one simple thing that we've got to do is tell the crooks on Wall Street, and I use that word advisedly, history will prove that they knew what they were doing, they were dishonest, their business model is fraudulent. You know, there are honest people who occasionally make a mistake, it happens all the time. But there are other businesses which are based on fraud and assume that they're never going to get caught, or when they do get caught, the penalty they have to pay is so little that it's worth it. Because you end up getting caught one out of ten times, you make a whole lot of money, so you pay a fine, somebody goes to jail, maybe, very rarely, for a year. And that's what I think you're seeing on Wall Street. So I think if it's worked very well for the credit unions, uh, I think it can work for the uh, private banks 
uh, as well. <clears throat> Mr. President, uh, you know, in the financial reform bill, did we address this issue? Yeah, we did. No, we didn't. What we said is that we, the credit card companies have got to be clearer and uh, more honest about uh, their interest rates and how much uh, borrowing money will actually cost. Because before what they did is they simply lied. They would say zero interest rates, 2% interest rates, but most people didn't read the small print on page four which said that they could raise their interest rates at any, at any time. And we have made some progress in at least being honest with the American people about uh, what their credit card cost will be. But that ain't enough. That's not enough. Uh, what we have got to do is put a, uh, put a cap on interest rates. It has worked uh, for the uh, credit unions, and uh, I believe it can and should work for the, uh, for the um, big banks as well. Mr. President, what I wanted to do now is just give you some examples about um, yeah. you know sometimes here and I'm, I'm guilty of that as well uh, we talk in big numbers you know a billion here and a <clears throat> trillion there and it adds up but uh, I think it's also important to look at the flesh and the blood that's out there the real suffering that people are experiencing. And a while back, what I did was I uh, sent an email out to people in the state of Vermont. And it was a very simple email. It said, you know, tell me, in your own words, what's going on in your family? What's going on, what, what's going on in your lives in the midst of this terrible recession? Because again, it's important to get beyond, yeah, we know that unemployment is 9.8, we know that real unemployment is 16%, we know that 50 million of people don't have any health insurance, it's, we know that median family income has gone down, poverty has gone up, 25% of our kids are on food stamps, we know all that stuff. And it's important to know that stuff. But behind all of those statistics are flesh and blood and good people who are doing everything they can to survive with a shred of dignity in their lives. So what I did, it was last year, I sent an email out to my constituents in the state of Vermont and I said very simply, write back to me. Tell me in your own words what is going on in your lives. And I promised them, and we received, I was just, I can't remember how many we received, but they were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of responses. It really quite amazed me. And frankly, Mr. President, it was hard to read these letters from decent, good people about what was happening to their lives. And what I said to them, if it's okay with you, what we'll do is publish uh, what you have written to me. We won't use your names, of course. I don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, and uh, we will read some of these stories right here on the floor of the Senate. And that's what I did. Didn't read them all, but I read some of them. Because it's important for us, sitting here inside the Beltway, not to forget what's going on in the real world, whether it's Hawaii, Vermont, California, any place. And here's a letter from two mothers in Vermont. The first is from a woman in a rural area. The second is from a single mother uh, in a small city. In Vermont, frankly, we don't have too many big cities. In my very, very beautiful state, where I expect the weather is very, very cold today, uh, our largest city is all of 40,000 people. That's Burlington, Vermont, and I was honored to have been the mayor of that city for eight years. And then we have most of our people living, certainly the vast majority of our people living in towns of less than 1,000, towns of 500. I spent, uh, lived for a while in a town of standard Vermont, way up in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, which has probably 150 people in it. Uh, and that's not uncommon in Vermont, a lot of small towns. So, Here's what we, here are the two letters that we received. One from a woman in a rural area. She says, my husband and I have lived in Vermont our whole lives. We have two small children, a baby and a toddler, and felt fortunate to own our own house and land. 
But due to the increasing fuel prices, we have at times had to choose between baby food and diapers and heating fuel. Now in Vermont, I don't know about Hawaii, but in Vermont, heating fuel gets up there when the weather gets 20 below zero and you're buying oil. It's an expensive proposition. We've run out of heating fuel three times so far, and the baby has ended up in the hospital with pneumonia two of the times. We try to keep the kids warm with an electric space heater on those nights, but that just doesn't do the trick. My husband does what he can just to scrape enough money for car fuel each week, and we've gone from three vehicles to one just to try and get by without going further into debt. We were going to sell the house and rent, but the rent around here is higher than what we pay for our mortgage and property taxes combined. Please help. That was what she asked of me and her government. Please help. She didn't ask me to lower taxes for billionaires. She is speaking for tens of millions of people in this country who are in desperate need of help. Here's another letter that comes from a woman who lives in a, in a larger town. I am a single mother with a nine-year-old boy. We lived this past winter without any heat at all. And that is not a good position to be in, in Vermont in the winter. Fortunately, someone gave me an old wood stove. I had to hook it up to an old, unused chimney we had in the kitchen. I couldn't even afford a chimney liner. The price of liners went up with the price of fuel. To stay warm at night, my son and I would pull off all the pillows from the couch and pile them on the kitchen floor. I'd hang a blanket from the kitchen doorway and we'd sleep right there on the floor. By February, we ran out of wood and I burned my mother's dining room furniture. I have no oil for hot water. We boil our water on the stove and pour it into the tub. I'd like to order one of your flags and hang it upside down at the Capitol building. We are certainly a country in distress. And Mr. President, what I will without doubt assure you is that those stories in different forms, I know that it's different in big cities than it is in a rural state like Vermont. I know that it is in different in Hawaii where you come from than it is in Boston, Massachusetts. But I am absolutely sure that millions of people in one way or another are telling the same stories. These are great Americans. These are people who want to work, people who want to do the best they can by their kids. And they're simply not making it right now. Here's people. This is the United States of America. Year 2010, people are going cold. People are going cold. People don't have enough food. People are homeless. And my friends here are talking about huge tax breaks for billionaires. My friends here are talking about lowering rates on the estate tax for the top three-tenths of 1% of the American people. What are we talking about? What kind of priorities are those? Here's another letter. Here's another letter. It comes to me from Vermont. As a couple, and this is not a woman who's in desperation. Those folks I just read, they're in desperation. This is a, a she says, as a couple, married couple with one child, earning about $55,000 a year, which is for, in Vermont fairly decent wages. We have been able to eat out a bit, buy groceries and health insurance, contribute to our retirement funds, and live a relatively comfortable life financially. We've never accumulated a lot of savings, but our bills were always paid on time, and we never had any interest on our credit card. Over the last year, even though we've tightened our belts, not eating out much, watching purchases at the grocery store, not buying extras like a new TV, repairing the washer instead of buying a new one, doing all those things, we find ourselves with over $7,000 of credit card debt and trying to figure out how to pay for braces for our son. I work 50 hours per week to help earn extra money to catch up, but that also takes a toll on the family life. Not spending those 10 hours at home with my husband and son makes a big difference for all of us. My husband hasn't had a raise in three years, and his employer is looking to cut out any extra benefits they can to lower their expenses, which will increase ours. Now, how many millions of Americans 
you think are saying exactly the same thing. Let me read another story that comes from Vermont. My 90-year-old father in Connecticut has recently become ill and asked me to visit him. I want to drop everything I am doing and go visit him. However, I am finding it hard to save enough money to add to the extra gas I'll need to get there. I am self-employed with my own commercial cleaning service, and money is tight, not only with gas prices, but with everything. I make more than I did a year ago, and I don't have enough to pay my property taxes this quarter for the first time in many years. They are due tomorrow. Here's another letter that I think deserves to be read. And frankly, you know, Mr. President, I think it wouldn't hurt this body if every member of the Senate, and I know we all get letters like this, if every member of the Senate came down here and we spent a couple of days talking about what's really going on for working families in this country. Sprouting statistics is good. And dealing with, you know, tax deals of 900 billion is fine. But I think we should, you know, re reacquaint ourselves with the reality of life uh, in America today. And this is what another constituent of mine writes. <clears throat> My husband and I are retired and 65 years of age. We would have liked to work longer, but because of injuries caused at work and the closing of our factory to go to Canada, we chose to retire earlier. Now, with oil prices the way they are, we cannot afford to heat our home unless my husband cuts and splits wood, which is a real hardship as he had had his back fused and should not be working most of the day to keep up with the wood. Not only that, he has, ha he has to get up two or three times each night to keep the fire going. So in other words, what she's talking about in Vermont, a lot of people heat with wood, increasingly uh, with pellets. It's a, a, an important source of fuel in the state of Vermont. What she's talking about is her husband, who is 65, with a bad back, has to go out and cut wood, and in their cases, being old, has got to get up two or three times in the middle of the night to stoke the furnace and keep the house warm. And again, I remind people that in Vermont, it occasionally gets 20 or 30 below zero. She continues, we also have a 2003 car that we only get to drive to get groceries or go to the doctor or to visit my mother in the nursing home three miles away. It now costs us $80 a month to go nowhere. We have 42,000 miles on a five-year old car. They can't afford to even use the car. You know, we forget it. I don't know what the price of gas is in Hawaii, Mr. President. In Vermont, it is now over three bucks a gallon. A lot of the people in my state have to travel long distances to get to work. Their car needs repairs, cars break down. Cars require in Vermont insurance, compulsory insurance. You've got to spend a whole lot of money just getting to work. I think we forget about that here. We don't need tax breaks for billionaires. We need to pay attention to these people. And she continues and concludes, I have Medicare but I can't afford prescription, drug, prescription coverage unless I take my money out of an annuity which is supposed to cover the house payment when my husband's pension is gone. We only eat two meals a day to conserve. This is not some third world country. This is the United States of Vermont, the United States of America, and this is my state of Vermont. And Vermont is better off today than a number of states around this country. You have these stories and multiply them by 10 in every area of this country. Here's another story. Yesterday, I paid for our latest home heating fuel delivery. And again, I'm focusing now on the cost of fuel because in Vermont, where I come from, it is a big deal. So she writes, yesterday, I paid for our latest home heating fuel delivery, $1,100. $1,100. I also paid my 2000 plus credit card balance, much of which bought gas and groceries for the month. The point here, and I'm going to continue her letter, is a lot of people use credit cards not, you know, isn't it nice? Shopping, I'm going to use my credit card. I will pay it off at the end of the month. What a nice thing. 
People are using their credit cards to buy food, to buy gas, to buy the basic necessities of life. It is their only line of credit open. And then, as I mentioned earlier, they're charged 25 or 30 percent interest rates uh, on what they owe. She continues. My husband and I are very nervous about what will happen to us when we are old. Although we have three jobs between us and participate in 403B retirement plans, we have not saved enough for a realistic post-work life if we survive to our life expectancy. As we approach the traditional retirement age, we are slowly paying off our daughter's college tuition loan and trying to keep our heads above water. We have always lived frugally. We buy used cars and store brand groceries, recycle everything, walk or carpool when possible, and plastic our windows each fall. What that means is in Vermont, if you don't have good storm windows, you put plastic up there. It's a way of keeping the wind out, keeping your homes up. I know about that because that's what I used to do. Even so, if and when our, sons, our son decides to, to attend college, we will be in deep debt at age 65. Please, and here she ends this, P.S. Please don't use my name. I live in a small town, and this is so embarrassing. So embarrassing. We should be embarrassed, Mr. President, not her. We should be embarrassed that we are for one second talking about a proposal which gives tax breaks to billionaires while we are ignoring the needs of working families, low-income people, and the middle class. We should be embarrassed that we are not investing in our infrastructure, that we're not breaking up these large financial institutions, that we're not putting a cap on interest rates, that we are the only country in the world that does not have health care for all of their people of major countries. We should be embarrassed, not this wonderful woman who is trying to maintain her dignity. Another letter from the state of Vermont. I too have been struggling to overcome the increasing cost of gas, heating oil, food, taxes, etc. I have to say that this is the toughest year financially that I have ever experienced in my 41 years on this earth. I have what used to be considered a decent job. I work hard, pinch my pennies, but the pennies have all but dried up. I am thankful that my employer understands that many of us cannot afford to drive to work five days a week. Instead, I work three 15 hours, three 15 hour days. I've taken odd jobs to try to make ends meet. This winter, and that was last winter, not this winter, after keeping the heat just high enough to keep my pipes from bursting, one of the problems you have when you live in a, a rural state and it gets cold, is your pipes can burst, and then you've got to spend the fortune getting them repaired. She says, this winter, after keeping the heat just high enough to keep my pipes from bursting, the bedrooms are not heated and never go above 30 degrees. What happens in Vermont, if you have a home in the wintertime, you don't have a whole lot of money, you kind of close off rooms in the house, because you, you can't afford to, feed the whole, to, to heat the whole house, so people live in a smaller area. She said, this is what she said, she continues, I began selling off my woodworking tools, snow blower, pennies on the dollar, and furniture that had been handed down in my family from the early 1800s just to keep the heat on. Today I am sad, broken, and very discouraged. I am thankful that the winter cold is behind us for a while, but now gas prices are rising yet again. I just can't keep up. Now, that's the story from one person in Vermont, but, Mr. President, that is a story for, for millions and millions of Americans. Another story. And, and, and the reason I'm reading these stories, and I appreciate my staff bringing this booklet down here, is this puts flesh and blood and real life into statistics. The statistics are frightening enough. But this tells us what happens when the middle class of this, cla this country collapses. It tells us what happens when people lose decent paying jobs. It tells us what happens when the government is not providing the kind of basic support system that it should for people in need. Here's another letter. As a single parent, I am struggling every day to put food on the table. 
It's the United States of America. And people are talking in my state of Vermont and all over this country about struggling to put food on the table. You know, Mr. President, what comes to my mind now is there have been, I don't know if you saw them, some articles in the papers that um, because of uh, the bailing out of Wall Street and, and the fact that Wall Street is now again profitable and the fact that the executives there are now making more money than they made before the, before the bailout, these guys are going to restaurants and they pay thousands of dollars for a bottle of wine, pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars for some fancy dinner. And in my state and all over this country, there are people who are wondering uh, where their next meal is coming from. Then she continues, she says, our clothes, our clothing all comes from thrift stores. I have a five-year-old car that needs work. My son is gifted and talented. I tried to sell my house to enroll him in a school that had curriculum available for his special needs. After two years on the market, my house never sold. The property taxes have nearly doubled in 10 years. And by the way, let me pick up on that point. You know, Mr. President, we don't deal with property taxes here. I did when I was a mayor. But if we are not adequately funding education, if we do not adequately help cities and towns all over this country in terms of fire protection, in terms of police protection, in terms of housing, a lot of that burden falls on the very, very regressive property tax, which in my state of Vermont is very high. And you find it referred to time and time again. Property taxes are going up. The property taxes have nearly doubled in 10 years, she writes. And the oil to heat is prohibitive. To meet the needs of my son, I have left the house, sit, and moved into an apartment near his high school. I don't go to church many Sundays because the gasoline is too expensive to drive there. She writes, I don't go to church many Sundays because the gasoline is too expensive for me to drive there. Every thought of an activity is dependent on the cost. I can only purchase food from dented canned stores. Does anybody in Congress know what a dented can store is? Do you know that many, many people buy their groceries and they get them cheaper because the cans are dented? Most members of the Senate and the House, most governors, do not get their meals from dented cans. But huge numbers of Americans do. And then she concludes, I am stretched to the breaking point with no help in sight. And by the way, the letters that I received when I asked for letters came not just from the state, but most of them came from Vermont. Some of them came from, from other areas. So I'm going to read another letter from Vermont and one from rural Pennsylvania, from Vermont. Due to illness, due to illness, my ability to work has been severely limited. I am making $10 an hour, and if I am lucky, I get 35 hours a week of work. Let me just pull away from the letter. That is not an unusual wage in the state of Vermont. That is not an unusual wage all over America. That's what people earn. $10 an hour times 40 hours. He doesn't get 40 hours. He makes $350 a week. 10 times 40, 400 times 50, $20,000 a year. $21,000 a year. Shock of all shocks. That's reality. That's what people are trying to live on. Those are the people that we should be helping not the CEOs on Wall Street who will get a million dollars a year in a tax break if this deal goes through. Not the people, the top three-tenths of 1% that our Republican friends want to help by repealing the estate tax, which will cost us a trillion dollars in 10 years. Maybe we should concentrate on helping people who are trying to get by eating food from dented cans, or people who can't afford to drive to church on Sunday because they can't afford the price of a gallon of gas. Maybe we should remember who sent us here and who made this country. She writes, I'm making $10 an hour, and if, I lucky, if I'm lucky, I get $35, 35 hours a week of work. At this time, I'm only getting 20 hours, as it is off-season in Stowe. What you, Stowe is, Stowe, Vermont, is a beautiful, beautiful town. Hope everybody comes to visit us up there. Great skiing. But it's a resort town. Big time in the winter. We're doing better in the summer there. But it's a resort town. And resorts uh, get more business in the winter and the summer, less uh, time elsewhere. So what she's talking about is that it's off-season up there, and she's only getting 20 hours a week, 
of work at 10 bucks an hour. It does not take a mathematician, she writes, to do the figures. How are my wife, I'm sorry, this is a man, not a woman. How are my wife and I supposed to live on a monthly take-home income of less than $800 a month? We do it by spending our hard-earned retirement savings. I am 50 and my wife is 49. At the rate we are going, we will be destitute in just a few years. The situation is so dire, it is all that I can think about. Soon, and this is from a 50-year-old gentleman, soon I will have to start walking to work an eight-mile round trip because the price of energy is so high that it's either that or going without heat. 50-year-old guy, 10 bucks an hour, 20 or 30 hours a week. His choice is either walking eight miles to and from his job in Stowe or else not heating his home. And then he concludes, and this happens in Vermont all of the times. It's quite unbelievable. <laughs> she says, he, he says, as bad as our situation is, I know many in worse shape. We try to donate food when we do our weekly shopping, but now we are not able to even afford to help our neighbors eat. What has this country come to? I, I don't know about other parts of the country. I'm sure it's the same. But in Vermont, if you go to a grocery store, there's often a bin out there in front where people buy food and they you know, drop a can of peas or a can of corn or something into it. So here is a family. Here is a guy who is now faced with the reality of having to walk eight miles to and from work, and he's upset at himself that he can't, doesn't have the money to buy food for his neighbors, who he thinks are even worse off than he is. That's the good people of Vermont and America. They're all over, all over this country, good and decent people who do worry about their neighbors. And then you got the lobbyists here representing the largest corporations in the world where the CEOs make tens of millions of dollars a year, and their job is to squeeze the middle class and these families harder and harder, cut back on their benefits in order to give tax breaks to the richest people in this country. What a difference in attitude. A poor man, a poor man faced with the choice of either walking eight miles to and from his job or losing his heat, worried about his neighbors, and you got the lobbyist here worrying about the richest people in the world, and winning, and winning. Then I got one, a letter that comes not from Vermont, comes from rural Pennsylvania. I am 55 years old and worse off than my adult children. I have worked since age 16. I don't live from paycheck to paycheck. I live day to day. I can only afford to fill my gas tank on my payday. Thereafter, I put $5, $10, whatever, whatever that I can. I cannot afford to buy the food items that I would. I am riding around daily to and from work with a quarter of a tank of gas. This is very scary. It's like I, I can see myself working until the day that I die. And trust me, the gentleman is talking about getting older, worrying about working till the day that he dies. We are already seeing this. You go to grocery stores in Vermont, you see old people who should be sitting home with their grandchildren. You know what they're doing? They're packing groceries. And then we have some geniuses on this Deficit Reduction Commission, people who made their money on Wall Street, they've got a brilliant idea. Let's raise the Social Security age to 68, 69 years old so that people like this will have to work, in fact, to the day they die. He says, he continues, I do not, have, this is not from Vermont, this is from Pennsylvania. I do not have a savings, no credit cards, and my only resources are through my employment. I have to drive to work as there are no buses from my residence to work. I don't know how much longer I can do this. I am concerned as gas prices climb daily. I am just tired. The harder that I work, the harder it gets. I work 12 to 14 hours daily, and it just doesn't help. I'm not saying, Mr. President, that every person in America is experiencing these stories. They're not. A lot of people are doing fine. They have good jobs. 
Their kids are doing well. They're taking care of their parents. A lot of people are doing just fine. But we would be fools and dishonest not to understand the reality of what's going on in this country. And it breaks my heart, and I know that it breaks the hearts of millions of people in this country to see what is going on in this great nation of ours. That so many people are hurting, that so many parents, I don't know if I have that letter here or if it's in another booklet, but I'll never forget one letter that I, 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 that I received, and that is these people, you know, my parents never went to college. My father never graduated high school. And they wanted their kids to get an education. That's what they wanted. And we did. And it was very important. And how proud my mother was of that. And we get letters from people who say, you know, I dreamed that my kid, my daughter, would go to college. She's not going to go to college now. Not going to go to college. And, you know, you know, it, it, it's, just, uh, it's just painful to, to even talk about and to think about what this country, the direction in which this country is moving. Uh, so, Mr. President, I, I want to now take a break from reading these letters. I, actually, the truth is that when these letters came in a year ago, I couldn't read more than a half a dozen at a time. They really just took too much out of me. Uh, they, 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 they really take something out of you to hear people that you know, and I, good people, honest people. You know, I hear some of my colleagues here that these people are lazy. My God, people work so hard in the state of Vermont. We have, I don't know how many thousands of people who are not working two jobs, three jobs, they're working four jobs. It's not just Vermont, it is all over this country. Whatever you may say about the United States of America, the people of our country are not lazy. That's one thing you can say about them. In fact, according to all of the bloodless statistics, our people today work longer hours than do the people of any other major country on earth. Do you know that? I don't know that a lot of Americans know that. It used to be Japan. Japanese are very hard-working people. And now it turns out that our people work harder, longer hours, than do the people of any other industrialized world. It's funny, you know, when you think about that, when I think about the books that I read when I was in elementary school, I remember there were pictures up there. Mr. President, I don't know if you remember these pictures. There were pictures up there where workers were demonstrating, and they said, we want a 40-hour work week. Remember seeing those pictures? We want a 40-hour work week. That was back in the early 1900s. Today, 100 years later, people still want a 40-hour work week because they're forced to work 50 or 60 hours a week. They're working two jobs. They are working three jobs. So, Mr. President, what I want to do now, before I get back to why I'm on the floor today and why I've been here for a few hours, which is to say that the agreement negotiated by the President and the Republican leadership is not a good agreement. It's an agreement that we can improve upon. It's an agreement that the American people can improve upon. And what I'm asking the American people is to stand up, let your senators, let your congressmen know how you feel. Do you really believe that millionaires and billionaires who have done phenomenally well in recent years need an extended tax cut at a time when their taxes have been lowered substantially in recent years? Do we really need to give tax breaks to the rich in order to drive up the national debt so that our kids and grandchildren will pay higher taxes in order to pay off that national debt caused by tax breaks for the rich? If you don't believe that, if you don't think that's right, let the President of the United States know about it, let your Senator know about it, let your Congressman know about it. We need a handful, seven or eight, members of the United States Senate to hear from their people, to say, wait a minute, don't hold my kids hostage. Don't force them to pay higher taxes in order to give tax, rate, tax breaks to the very, very rich. If the American people stand up and by the millions, let their senators and congressmen and the president know, we can win this thing. We can win this battle. It's not too late yet. And that's what I hope will happen. Now, Mr. President, you know, when we talk about why things go on the way they are here in Washington and why so many people back home 
whether they're Democrats, Republicans, I am an independent, whether they're conservatives, progressives, moderates, whatever they are. There is a huge feeling of anger and frustration, and in fact, disgust at what goes on here in Washington. You know, I've just read some letters from people, and you can multiply those letters by a million, and people are saying, don't you hear us? Don't you know what's going on in our lives? Don't you know the worries we have for our kids, for our parents? Aren't you listening to us? And in many ways, I'm afraid the United States Senate is not listening to them, nor is the House, nor is our government. And one of the reasons why, and what worries me so much about this growing concentration of wealth and income in this country, is that when the rich get richer, they don't just simply put their money under the mattress. They don't simply go out and buy yachts and planes and 18 homes and all the things that rich people do. They do that, but they do something else. What they say is, I'm not rich enough. I need to be richer. What motivates some of these people is greed and greed and more greed. There is no end to that. So what they do is they do things like hire lobbyists who are all over Capitol Hill. These lobbyists, sometimes former leaders of the Republican Party, former leaders of the Democratic Party, former hotshot lawyers, bright people, and their job is to make sure that the legislation that we pass, such as this major tax bill, that this legislation benefits not ordinary Americans, not the people whose letters I have just read, not those people, but the wealthiest people in this country and the largest corporations. And I want to just mention something. A very good friend of mine, and I do a radio show with him uh, every Friday afternoon. I, I, I'm afraid I missed it today. And that's Tom Hartman. And Tom is the author of a number of wonderful books. Uh, and uh, in his latest book, which is called Rebooting the American Dream, 11 Ways to Rebuild Our Country, uh, Tom writes, he, he talks about uh, lobbying, which is an issue we have got to deal with in this country. He says, and I quote, page 104, given how lucrative lobbying is as an investment, it's become a huge business. In other words, what he is talking about is if you got a good lobbyist, and that lobbyist changes a few words in a bill, your company or you as an individual can end up with huge amounts of money, just changing a few words. In this case, the language that we're working on now is whether or not we extend the Bush tax breaks for the top 2% for many millionaires and billionaires. Some lobbyists representing the rich and the powerful are determined to keep that language in there. So it's an investment. So you spend a few million dollars, an organization spends a few million dollars on a lobbyist, but if you ended up getting back hundreds of millions of dollars in tax breaks or corporate loopholes or, or other benefits, it's a very good investment. That's what Tom Hoffman's writing about. He says, given how lucrative lobbying is as an investment, it's become a huge business. In February 2010, the Center for Responsive Politics laid out which industries had invested how much in Congress the previous year. Overall, overall it found that in 2009, the number of registered lobbyists who actively lobbied Congress was 13,694, and the total lobbying spending, get this, total lobbying spending in 2009 was $3.47 billion, a 240% increase since, two, since 1999, 10 years, more than tripling, I guess. In 2009, the law, company spent $3.47 billion in lobbying. Now, Mr. President, we have 100 members of the United States Senate you have 435 members of the House, and listeners or the viewers can get out their calculating machine, and you divide it up. How much money the big money interests are spending trying to influence Senator Inouye or myself or the other 98 members of the Senate or 435 members of the House? They are flooding this institution with money. Let me give you just a breakdown of where that money is coming from. 
what they call miscellaneous business, that's retail and manufacturing, etc., 558 million in one year, 2009. Healthcare, 543 million. Now, by the way, that was before healthcare reform. My strong guess, I would be very surprised if that number did not double. If you are a healthcare lobbyist this year, trust me, you are doing very, very well. They are all over this place, making sure that we did not pass a really strong health care bill, for example, a Medicare for all single payer program, which I support. On top of that, you got the finance, insurance, and real estate industries combined spent $465 million. And again, that was before we dealt with financial reform. I suppose, Mr. President, that the recent legislation that we dealt with health care reform and financial reform was a real boon to the lobbyists around here, because they really could go out and earn their money. But that was before that. Finance, insurance, and real estate only spent $465 million in one year to influence 100 members of the Senate and 435 members of the House. Energy and natural resources. Well, as I mentioned earlier today, ExxonMobil last year made 19 billion, paid nothing in taxes, got a $156 million refund. ExxonMobil and other companies are putting all kinds of money into phony organizations, telling us that global warming isn't real and we don't have to transform our energy system. Cost a lot of money to do that. The energy and natural, natural resources companies spent $408 million in 2009 alone. This is one year, folks, one year. Communications electronics, right now, I'm working on an issue which deals with the merger of Comcast and NBC. I think it's a bad idea. Comcast is the largest provider of cable services in America, huge role in the internet. NBC is one of the largest media conglomerates in America. And what they're trying to do right now is to merge these two huge companies. I think the problem in America is we have too few companies controlling what goes on. We have too much of a concentration of ownership, and that merger is bad. Well, I can assure you, know for a fact, that you got all these lobbyists from the media industry, from communications, they're right here rallying, trying to do their best to make sure this merger, other type mergers, take place. $360 million from the communications electronics industry. Then we have other types of, of uh, organizations as well. Bottom line, in the year 2009, we spent, they spent $3.47 billion almost three and a half billion dollars on lobbying. And you know what? You get what you pay for. And that's just lobbying. We're not talking about campaign contributions. We're not talking about the huge sums of money it now takes to run for office in the United States. And we're not talking about where that money comes from. And we're not talking about the Citizens United horrendous decision reached by the Supreme Court, which allows billionaires and all of these companies and their executives to put money into campaigns and not even have to be identified. We're not even talking about it. This is just lobbying, just lobbying. So if you wonder why we are having a serious discussion about whether or not we should give tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires while the middle class is collapsing and tens of millions of people have no health insurance and we have the highest rate of child in poverty and we have the most unequal distribution of wealth and income of any country, if you're wondering how we would consider for one minute talking about more tax breaks for the rich, then you don't know much about what goes on here in Washington. And you don't know about campaign contributions and the degree to which big money buys and sells politicians. Mr. President, what I want to review again, because the reason I am, I'm down here today, and I've been here for a few hours, 
is to voice my very strong opposition to the agreement that was reached between the Republican leadership and President Obama. I think that the American people don't like this agreement. All I can tell you, and I don't know what's going on in your office coming from Alaska, Mr. President, but I can tell you that in the last three days, between phone calls and emails, we've probably gotten 5,000. Uh, we've heard from about 5,000 people, many from Vermont and some from out of state as well. The opposition to this agreement is, is probably 99%. People cannot understand why in a million years, with a $1.7 trillion national debt and a $1.4 trillion yearly deficit, we would be thinking for one second, for one second, about giving tax breaks to the richest people in this country who are already doing fabulously well. So, Mr. President, I'm down here today, and I have been for a few hours, to urge my colleagues, and more importantly, the American people, to say no to this agreement. If we stand together, if the American people write or email or call their senators and their congresspeople, I think we can turn this thing around. I think we can come up with an agreement that makes us all proud rather than one that we have to be ashamed of. I know there was an editorial back in, in the state of Vermont that I saw. I don't remember the exact title, but something to the effect, this agreement stinks, it's odious, but it's better than nothing. Well, I don't think that has to be the choice awful or better than nothing. I think the choice can actually be a good agreement. And I think if the American people stand with those of us who are opposing this agreement, we can pull this off. We can defeat this agreement and come up with a much better one. One that does not force our kids and grandchildren to pay higher taxes in order to provide huge tax breaks for the richest people in this country. So Mr. President, in talking about the reasons that I am opposed to this agreement. One of the other reasons is that while the President and the Republican leadership say, well, you know, this is just a temporary uh, extension, just going to be for two years, just temporary. You know and I knew, know that when you talk about temporary here, it becomes long-term and then perhaps becomes permanent. If we extend these tax breaks for the top 2% now, my strong guess, and I hope I'm wrong, and I certainly hope that this proposal is defeated, but if we extend them for two years, my strong guess is they will be two years from now extended again. And depending on the politics of what goes on here, they could be extended permanently. Our Republican colleagues, as you well know, wanted to extend them for 10 years at a cost of $700 billion increase in our national debt. Our Republican friends are fighting hard to completely repeal the estate tax, which would cost us a trillion dollars, one trillion dollars in 10 years in increased national debt. So the point that I've got to make, and I want to emphasize this point, is that when people talk about these things being short-term, being temporary, uh, take, that, take those thoughts with a grain of salt. Maybe, maybe that's the case. I don't think it is. So I think once you move over the cliff and make that decision to extend these tax breaks, they're going to be extended long-term. And here's the reason why. I mean, you have right now the dynamic here is the president campaigned against these tax breaks. The president does not believe in extending these tax breaks to the rich, but he felt he had to make a compromise. I thought he made a bad compromise. But our Republican friends are saying over and over again that if you rescind end these tax breaks to the rich, you are raising taxes. Two years from now, in the midst of a presidential campaign, when President Obama, if he is the Democratic candidate, says, don't worry, I'm going to oppose these extensions of tax breaks to the rich, his credibility has been severely damaged, and the American people know it. Can they trust him? That's what he told them then, 
And that's what he'll tell them in two years. Is he going to be believed? I don't think so. So these tax breaks, while ostensibly for two years, uh, may in fact be for a lot longer than that. Mr. President, I would also say that while we have talked about uh, primarily uh, the discussion has centered around extending tax breaks, personal income tax breaks for the very rich, there are other tax breaks in this proposal equally odious. Uh, what this proposal, this agreement between the President and the Republican leadership does – take a drink of water here – it is it extends uh, – it, 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 it extends the Bush-era 15 percent tax rates on capital gains and dividends, meaning that those people who make their living off of their investments will continue to pay a substantially lower tax rate than firemen, teachers, and nurses. So think about that. You're a big-time investor. You make most of your income off of capital gains or dividends, and you're paying 15 percent tax rate. But if you're a worker doing something with your hands, or you're a teacher, or you're a fireman, or you're a cop, or a nurse, doctor, you're paying tax rates that are higher than that. We are extending those 15 percent tax rates on capital gains and dividends. And then on top of that, Mr. President, this agreement includes a horrendous proposal regarding the estate tax. And uh, the estate tax was initiated, enacted in 1916. And it was a proposal strongly supported by Teddy Roosevelt, who believed very strongly that it was not healthy for America to have an ongoing and evolving concentration of ownership. And here's what Teddy Roosevelt said in 1910, 100 years ago. The absence of effective state and especially national restraint of, upon unfair money getting has tended to create a small class of enormously wealthy and economically powerful men whose chief object is to hold and increase their power. How's that? hundred years ago, that's what he said. I would say that he got it right, that what he said then is even more true today. And then he says, no man should receive a dollar unless that dollar's worth of service rendered, unless that dollar represents a dollar's worth of service rendered, not gambling in stocks, but service rendered. The really big fortune, the swollen fortune, by the mere fact of its size acquires qualities which differentiate it in kind as well as in degree from what is passed by men of relatively small means. Therefore, I believe in a graduated inheritance tax on big fortunes properly safeguarded against evasion and increasing rapidly in amount with the size of the estate." End of quote. Hence the estate tax. Unfortunately, under the agreement, unfortunately, under the agreement reached by the President and the Republicans, the estate tax rate which was 55 percent on the President Clinton, when the economy, by the way, was a heck of a lot stronger than it is today, will decline to 35 percent with an exemption on the first $5 million of an individual's estate, $10 million for couples. Now, Mr. President, I made this point earlier, but I think it has got to be made over and over again. Our Republican friends have renamed the estate tax into the death tax. And the implication of what they are saying and what many Americans believe is that if I have $100,000 in the bank or $50,000 in the bank and I die that my kids are going to have to pay a hefty estate tax on what I left them. But that is absolutely and categorically not the case. The estate tax applies only to the top 
three-tenths of one percent. This is not a tax on the rich. This is a tax on the very, very, very rich. And under this proposal, which benefits only the top three-tenths of one percent, the President and the Republicans agreed to lower the tax rate on the estate tax to 35 percent with an exemption on the first five million dollars. That is just wrong. And Mr. President, let me give you an example. One more. Okay, let's, let me give you an example of, of, of who the folks are who will benefit from this from doing this. Many of my Republican colleagues have been pushing very hard, not just to lower the tax rate, and by the way, this 35 percent is lower, I think, than they had ever dreamed they would get with a $5 million exemption. What they really want, and ultimately I suspect will continue to fight for, is a complete repeal of the estate tax. So just to give you one example, I don't mean to pick on the Walton family, but just as a flesh and blood example. Sam Walton's family, and the Waltons, of course, are the heirs to the Walmart fortune. They are worth, and this may be a little bit wrong, this is a couple of years old, but give or take $86 billion. That's a lot of money. That's one family, $86 billion. The Walton family would receive an estimated 32.7 billion-dollar tax break if the, estate, if the estate tax was completely repealed. Does anybody in their right mind believe that when this country has a national debt of $13.7 trillion and when we have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world and our unemployment rate is 9.8 percent, can anybody for one second fathom Members of the United States Senate saying that we want to give a $32 billion tax break to one family. So in terms of the estate tax, what we have done is made it even more regressive. We have given substantial help to exactly the people who need it the least. And that, to me, is not what we should be doing. Our job here, I know it's a radical idea, I admit it, should be to represent the vast majority of the people in this country, the middle class, the working families of this country, and not just the top one or two percent. So under this proposal, this lowering of the estate tax, which will cost our government substantial sums of money because the revenue is not going to come in, this will benefit only the top three-tenths of one percent. And again, if some of my Republican colleagues are successful in their desire, and they're moving down the path, if we repeal the estate tax entirely, which is what they want to do. I know it's hard to believe, and some of the listeners out there think that I am kidding, but I am deadly serious. They want to completely remove the estate tax, which would drive up the national debt by a trillion dollars over a 10-year period. So, Mr. President, that is this lowering of uh, estate tax rates and raising the exemption is clearly an onerous, uh, clearly an onerous provision. And it is not just the Walton family of Walmarts who benefits. According to Forbes magazine, there are 403 billionaires living in this country with a combined net worth of $1.3 trillion. That's not shabby. That's pretty good. 403 billionaires are worth $1.3 trillion. Anyone lucky enough to inherit this extraordinary wealth would benefit the most from repealing the estate tax. As Robert Frank wrote in his book, Richestan, the wealthiest people in this country accumulated so much wealth that they have been competing to see who could own the largest private yacht, who could own the most private jets, who could own the most expensive cars, 
jewelry, artwork, etc. In 1997, for example, Leslie Wexner, the chairman and CEO of Limited Brands, the company that owns Victoria's Secret, and none of us know what Victoria's Secret is, I, I know that, paid a German shipmaker to build what was then the largest private yacht in the United States. It's called the Limitless. And uh, there is a photo, I guess this is the photo, it's a nice boat. Uh, it stretches 315 feet and has 3,000 square feet of teak wood and a gym. Got a gym. According to Forbes magazine, Mr. Wexler is one of the wealthiest 400 people in this country, worth an estimated 2.3 billion. Permanently repealing the estate tax would allow Mr. Wexner's two children to inherit all of his wealth without paying a nickel to help this country deal with the enormous problems that we have. So I wish Mr. Wexner, and I don't know him, I hope he is alive and well, and I wish him a long life. Uh, but I believe very strongly uh, that in this country, if we are going to see the middle class survive and our kids do well, uh, we cannot repeal the estate tax and we cannot lower uh, estate tax rates. Mr. President, I want to get to another issue which I've talked about earlier, Robert Kennelly, um, which I think there is some misunderstanding. And I know, Mr. President, you raised this issue, and I'm glad you did at a recent meeting that we had. You know, all over the country, people say, isn't it great? Uh, we are going to lower the payroll tax on workers. We're going to go from 6.2%, which workers now pay down to 4.2%. Uh, people are going to have more money in their pocket, which certainly is a good thing. It's going to cost us $120 billion in Social Security payroll tax. Here's the point. Yes, we do want to put more money in workers' pockets. That's why many of us in the stimulus, in the stimulus package supported a $500 or a $400 a year tax break for every worker, virtually every worker in America. That's what we said. We want people in these difficult times to be able to have the money to take care of their families. And when they have that money, they go out spending it. And when they spend it, they create other jobs because people have got to provide goods and services for them. It has a good stimulus impact. Yes, we do want workers to have more money in their pockets. But while this idea of lowering the payroll tax sounds like a good idea, in truth, it really is not a good idea. And Mr. President, I don't know if you know this, but this idea originated from very conservative Republicans whose intention from the very beginning was to destroy Social Security by choking off the funds that go to it. Do you have that other quote from the guy who gave it? Oh, yeah. And this is not just Bernie Sanders' analysis. Uh, Mr. President, uh, there was recently, and I, I distributed it recently at a meeting that we held, uh, a, a news release that came from the National Committee to Preserve Social Security, and Medicare. And the headline on that press release is, Cutting Contributions to Social Security Signals the Beginning of the End. Payroll tax holiday is anything but. And what the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, which is one of the largest senior groups in America, well understands is that there are people out there who want to destroy Social Security, and one way you do that is you divert funds into the Social Security Trust Fund, and they don't get there. Now, what the President and others have said is, not to worry, this is just, this is just a one-year program, just one year. And in fact, they say, the General Treasury, the General Treasury will pay the difference. So the Social Security Trust Fund is not going to lose funding. Here's the problem. The problem is that historically, and the reason we have a $2.6 trillion surplus today in Social Security, reason why Social Security is good for the next 29 years to pay out all benefits, is because it comes from the payroll tax. It is not dependent upon the whims of Congress and the Treasury. 
Now, the president, Republicans say, well, this is just a one-year program. Don't worry. I do worry. I worry that once you establish this one-year payroll tax holiday, that next year our Republican friends will say, oh, you want to end that? You're going to be raising taxes on workers. And enough people will support that concept. And this one-year payroll tax holiday will become permanent. And when you do that, you're going to be choking off over a period of years trillions of dollars that we need to make sure that Social Security is viable and is there for our kids and our grandchildren. But don't listen to me. Listen to somebody who knows a lot more about this issue than I do. Barbara Kennelly is the, a former congresswoman from Connecticut. She's the president and CEO of the National Committee to preserve Social Security and Medicare. And this is what Barbara Canelli says. She says, quote, even though Social Security contributed nothing to the current economic crisis, it has been bartered in a deal that provides deficit-busting tax cuts for the wealthy, diverting $120 billion in Social Security contributions for a so-called tax holiday may sound like a good deal for workers now, but it's bad business for the program that a majority of middle-class seniors will rely upon in the future. End of quote, Barbara Canelli. The headline, Cutting Contributions to Social Security, signals the beginning of the end. This is not a good approach. Providing and figuring out a way that we can get more money into the hands of working people as we did in the stimulus package, does make a lot of sense. Going forward with a payroll tax holiday is a backdoor method to end up breaking Social Security, and it's not anything that we should support. Mr. President, let me just mention and quote from a gentleman who understands this issue very, very well, and he understands the politics of what's going on here. His name is Bruce Bartlett. He is a former top advisor for Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush. And he recently wrote the following in opposition to this payroll tax cut. And this is what Mr. Bartlett wrote. What are the odds that Republicans will ever allow, ever allow this one-year tax holiday to expire? They wrote the Bush tax cuts with explicit expiration dates, and then when it came time, right now, for the law they wrote to take effect exactly as they wrote it, they said any failure to extend them permanently would constitute the biggest tax increase in history. If allowing the Bush tax cuts to expire is the biggest tax cut in history, one that Republicans claim would decimate a still fragile economy, then surely expiration of a payroll tax holiday would also constitute a massive tax increase on the working people of America. Republicans, this is Bruce Bartlett, who I'm quoting, as a former advisor to Ronald Reagan and the first President Bush. Republicans would prefer to destroy Social Security's finances or permanently fund it with general revenues, switch the revenue base from the payroll tax to general revenues, than allow a once suspended payroll tax to be reimposed. Arch Social Security hater Peter Ferrara once told me, and, and again, this is Bruce Bartlett, former advisor to Presidents Reagan and, and Bush one. Peter Ferrara once told me that funding it with general revenues was part of his plan to destroy it by converting Social Security into a welfare program rather than an earned benefit. He was right, and quote. In other words, what this issue is about is breaking the bonds that we've had since the inception of Social Security, where Social Security was paid for, paid for by workers. You pay for it when you're working and you get the benefits, 
when you're old. That's the deal. There is no federal money coming in from the general treasury. And, and this gentleman, Mr. Bartlett, uh, thinks, and I suspect he is quite right, that, um, that this is the beginning of an effort to destroy uh, Social Security. And I would say that Social Security, you know, the real debate about Social Security, Mr. President, is not one about finances. There has been a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there. I hear from some of my friends on the Republican side that Social Security is going bankrupt. It's not going to be there for our kids. And that is absolutely not true. Social Security today has a $2.6 trillion surplus. Social Security can pay out every benefit owed to every eligible American if we don't start diverting funds for the next 29 years, at which point it pays out about 78 percent of benefits. So our challenge in 29 years is to fill that 22 percent gap. That's it. Can we do it? Sure we can. President Obama, when he was campaigning, and I think has repeated since, a very good suggestion that instead of having a cap in terms of which people contribute into the fund at $106,000, what we should do is do a bubble, go up to 250, and people 250,000 or more should contribute into the Social Security Trust Fund. If you did that and nothing else, you have essentially solved the Social Security problem for the next 75 years. Very easy. It is done. So what this payroll tax holiday is doing, in my view, is pretty dangerous. I don't think enough people understand that. And I think that is one of the strong reasons uh, why this agreement uh, should be opposed. Now, Mr. President, another reason that I believe uh, that this agreement is not as good an agreement as we can get is that it provides tens and tens of billions of dollars in tax cuts for various types of businesses. And I'm not here to say that these tax cuts cannot do some good. I suspect that they can. But I think that there is a lot better way to create the jobs that we need than providing these particular business tax cuts. Frankly, I think economists from almost all political spectrums, conservative to progressive, understand that if we are serious about creating the kinds of jobs that this economy desperately needs. And if we want to do that as rapidly and as cost effectively as we possibly can, the way to do that is not to provide business tax cuts because right now, right now, corporate America is sitting on close to $2 trillion cash on hand. They have a ton of money. The problem is that the products that they are creating are not being bought by the American people because the American people don't have the money to buy those goods and services. So if we are serious, Mr. President, in creating the jobs that we need, I think that what we have got to do is start making significant investments in our crumbling infrastructure. And that is, that is rebuilding our bridges, our roads, our water systems, broadband, cell phone service, public transportation, our rail system, dams, in every single one of these areas. We are seeing our infrastructure crumbling. And the point is, that if you simply ignore a crumbling infrastructure, and I say this as a former mayor who dealt with this issue, if you simply ignore a crumbling infrastructure, you know what? It doesn't get better all by itself. And I know many mayors and governors would very much like to think that they could turn their backs on the infrastructure because it's not a sexy investment. It's not a sexy investment. But the reality is that if you don't pay attention to it today, it only gets worse and it costs you more money. You know, it's like having a cavity. You can get your cavity filled, you neglect it, as I have, 
and you end up doing root canal far more expensive. That's what it's about. Do we maintain our infrastructure? Clearly, we are not. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, we can, should be spending about $2.2 trillion in the next five years in order to maintain our infrastructure. Now, I don't know about Alaska, don't know. Spent a very brief time in your beautiful state. But I do know that in Vermont, we have bridges all over our state that are in desperate need of repair. It is fair to say that the stimulus package has been very, very positive for my state. We're spending more money on roads and bridges, but we have a long, long way to go. So we're putting money into our roads and bridges. We're hiring people to do that work. That's what we should be doing all over the country. But, Mr. President, it is not just roads and bridges. It is water systems. I told this story, I guess, a few hours ago now, uh, about a mayor, the mayor of Rutland, Vermont, which is the uh, second largest city in the state. And I was in his office, and he showed me a pipe. And the pipe was in pretty bad shape. And he said, you know, this pipe was laid by an engineer, was developed, uh, who then, after he did this, went off to war. And he said, what war do you think he went off to fight? And he said it was the Civil War, the Civil War. So this was pipe laid in Rutland, Vermont, which is still being used, which was laid, I'm guessing, in the 1850s, maybe 1860s. And it's not just Rutland, Vermont. Uh, when I was mayor of Vermont, we had to spend, mayor of Burlington, we had to spend $50 million back then, 20 years ago, I think, rebuilding our wastewater plant and making sure that a lot of pollution and, and filthy water didn't get into our beautiful lake, Lake Champlain. It's an expensive proposition. But right now, we're going to have to invest in that. It's our water systems, our dams, our levees, our roads, our bridges. I mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier uh, and contrasted what was going on in infrastructure in the United States as opposed uh, to uh, China. And uh, I quoted from a book uh, called um, Third World America, written by Arianna Huffington, who tells us essentially that if we don't get our act together, that's what we will become, a third world. And she points out that compared to uh, countries like China, our investments in rail is absolutely pathetic and inadequate. Uh, in China right now, that country is investing billions and billions of dollars in high-speed rail, building thousands and thousands of miles of high-speed rail, they're building over 100 new airports. And what are we doing? So, Mr. President, one of my many objections to the proposal struck between the President and the Republican leadership is I think we can do better in job creation than in business tax cuts. There is a time and a place for business tax cuts, and I am not against them. But I would say that at this particular moment in American history, in this particular moment, it makes a lot more sense to create, over a period of years, millions of jobs, rebuilding our rail system, our subways, our roads, our bridges, and our water systems, and many other aspects of our infrastructure. There are places in Vermont and throughout this country where people cannot today get decent quality broadband service, can't get cell phone service. In that area, we, would be, we are behind many other countries not wealthy countries around the world. When we make those investments in infrastructure, we not only create jobs, but we make our country stronger and more productive, and we enable ourselves to compete effectively in the international economy. Mr. President, another one of my objections uh, to this proposal and why I think we can do a lot better is that I was really quite disturbed to hear uh, that uh, the President and others who defend this proposal uh, talk about one of the quote-unquote compromises that was struck 
was to extend unemployment benefits for 13 months. Now, to my mind, as, I, as I've said earlier, at a time of deep recession, at a time of horribly high unemployment, it would be absolutely wrong and immoral for us to turn our backs on the millions of workers who are about to lose their unemployment benefits. If we do that, it's hard to imagine what happens to those families, many of, for many of whom this is their only source of income. What do they do? Do they lose their homes? Do they move out onto the streets? Do they, how do they take care of their kids? I don't know. There are parts of this country where it is very, very hard to get a job. Extended unemployment is at the highest level I think we have ever seen. You can't turn your backs on those families. But I get upset when I hear that the Republicans' willingness to support an extension of unemployment benefits for 13 months is a major compromise. I would tell you, Mr. President, and I think a lot of the American people don't know this, that for the past 40 years, 40 years, four decades, under both Democratic and Republican administrations, whenever the unemployment rate has been above 7.2 percent, above 7.2 percent unemployment, and today we're at 9.8 percent, always, whether the Democrats were in control, the Republicans were in control, President was Democrat, President was Republican, what people did is say, we have got to extend unemployment benefits. It's kind of common sense. It's not partisan. So when you have a program that has existed for 40 years in a bipartisan effort, it sounds to me that it is not much of a compromise for the Republicans to say, okay, we will do what Democrats and Republicans have done for 40 years. What a major compromise. It is not a compromise. It is just continuing existing bipartisan policy, which is sensible. It's sensible from a moral perspective. You can't leave our fellow American families out high and dry. And it is good economics because what the economists tell us is the people who will spend that money quickest are people who receive unemployment compensation because that's all they got. They're going to go out and they're going to buy. And when they buy from the neighborhood store, they create jobs. So it's good economics and it is the moral thing to do. But frankly, Mr. President, in my view, uh, this is not much of a compromise. This is just continuing four decades of existing uh, policies. Mr. President, as I've said earlier, uh, there are very clearly uh, positive parts of this agreement. Uh, no question about it. I think almost every American will tell you that it would be totally absurd. I know there are some who disagree, but I think the vast majority of Americans believe that in the time when the middle class is collapsing, when median family income has gone down, when unemployment is high, that it would be a real horror show if we did not extend the Bush tax breaks for the middle class for 98 percent of the American people. 98 percent. That's what we want. You know, we could have crafted it much tighter, couldn't we? We could have said nobody above 100,000, nobody above 150,000. That's pretty generous. We said 200, a family earning $250,000 should get an extension of these tax breaks. That is 98 percent of the American people. That's not good enough for our Republican friends. They are fighting tooth and nail to make sure that the top 2 percent, the millionaires and billionaires, the CEOs, earn tens of millions a year. They are fighting. It's like they're at war. They are so engaged to make sure that these fabulously wealthy people receive at least a million dollars, in some cases, for people who are making a million a year, they're going to receive, on average, on average, $100,000 a year in tax breaks. For the very, very wealthiest, it could be over a million dollars a year. You know, Mr. President, I know you joined me uh, just two days ago in saying that at a time when 
senior citizens in this country and disabled vets for two years in a row had not received any COLA, that maybe it was the right thing to do because we know that health care costs and prescription drug costs are soaring, that maybe we provide a $250 check to those seniors and disabled veterans one time, one time. I could not get one Republican vote in support of that proposition. We won uh, 53 to 45, but around here, it doesn't take 50 votes to win. It doesn't take a majority to win. It takes 60 votes. We couldn't get one Republican vote. So here you have every Republican voting against a $250 check for a disabled vet or a senior citizen who's living on $15,000, $16,000 a year. Can't afford it. But we can afford a million dollar a year tax break for somebody who's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, somebody may understand that rationale. I don't. I really don't. I can't understand that. I can't understand asking our kids and grandchildren to pay more in taxes as the national debt goes up in order to provide tax breaks for the richest people in this country. So, Mr. President, while there are some good provisions in this bill, and certainly extending the tax breaks for 98 percent of our people, for the, for the broad, very broad middle class, I think if the American people demand it in our democracy, we can do better. Now, I don't know if you or I alone will be able to convince some of our Republican friends or maybe some of our Democratic friends to make this into the kind of proposal we need for the working families of this kitchen and for our children, for our next generation. I don't know that we can do it inside this beltway. As I said earlier, I think that the way we win this battle, the way we defeat this proposal and come back with a much better proposal, is when millions of Americans start writing and emailing and calling their senators, their congresspeople, and say, wait a second, are you nuts? Do you really think that millionaires and billionaires need a huge tax break at a time when this country has a $13.7 trillion national debt? What are you smoking? How could you for one second think that that makes any sense whatsoever? And I'll tell you something, Mr. President, I don't know what my phones are doing today in my office right now, but in the last three days we have gotten I'm guessing 5,000 phone calls and emails, and about 99 percent of them are uh, in disagreement uh, with, um, with, that, with this proposal. Well, I'm looking at a chart here, and we've gotten 22, 2,100 calls that just came in, I'm informed today. So the overwhelming people who are calling me, I don't know what kind of calls other members of the Senate are getting. Uh, but certainly, um, those are the calls uh, that I am getting. Now, also, Mr. President, and this point cannot be made strongly enough, what our Republican friends want to do, and they've been pretty honest and upfront about them, especially some of the extreme right-wing people who have been running for office, and, and in some cases have won, they have been honest enough to say, that they want to bring this country back to where we were in the 1920s. That their ultimate aim is to basically repeal almost all of the provisions that have been passed in the last 70 years to protect working people, the elderly, and the children. They believe in a Darwinian-style society in which you have the survival of the fittest, that we are not a society which comes together to take care of all of us, that you take care of me in need and I take care of you and your family in need, that we are one people. And their strategy is pretty clear, I think. They want to ultimately destroy Social Security. And what we are beginning to hear more and more of is why don't we raise the retirement age to 68 or 69 
that Deficit Reduction Commission, which I thought was the people on that commission, were, you know, were bad appointees by the president. You could have put together some good economists to say, how do we in a fair way, in a fair way, address the deficit and national debt crisis? That wasn't what that commission did. So these folks are talking about major cuts in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. They want, at a time when it is so hard for young people to afford to go to college, they want to raise the cost by asking our young people while they're in college to be accruing the interest on their loans. So I think that if the president believes that if this agreement is passed, that the Republicans are going to come to the table and we're all going to live happily in the future. We're going to all work together in a nonpartisan way. I think he's not understanding the reality. These people are going to come back, and they're going to come back very aggressively for major cuts in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, environmental protection, education, child care, Pell Grants, you name it. Because their belief is I don't quite understand it, that it is somehow good public policy to give tax breaks for the wealthiest people in this country, who in many ways have never had it so good, while you cut programs that the middle class and working families of this country uh, desperately depend upon. So I would suggest that this big debate we're having right now on whether or not we should accept the proposal agreed to by the President and the Republicans is just the beginning, just the beginning of what's coming down the pike. And if we surrender now on this issue, we can expect next month and the following month another governmental crisis, another threat of a shutdown, unless they get their way. So I think rather than asking the working families of this country to have to compromise, instead of asking our kids to pay more in taxes, to bail out billionaires. Maybe, I know this is a radical idea, but maybe we should ask a handful of our Republican friends to join us. Maybe a handful of honest conservatives over there who have been telling us for years their great concerns about deficit spending and a huge national debt, maybe they should be prepared to vote against a proposal which raises the national debt and our deficit by giving tax breaks to some of the richest people in the world. Now, I quite frankly don't think that I'm going to be able to convince them. I don't know that you're going to be able to convince them. But you know who I think can convince them? I think their constituents can convince them. I think the American people can convince them. And I think, as I said earlier, that if the American people stand up that we can defeat this proposal and that we can create a much, much better proposal. Clearly, we must extend tax breaks for the middle class. Clearly, we must make sure that unemployed workers continue to get the benefits that they desperately need. But equally clearly, we must make sure that we are not raising the national debt, which, as sure as I'm standing here, will result in cuts in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, education, other programs, by passing if this proposal uh, is passed. So, Mr. President, this is not only an important proposal unto itself. $900 plus billion, even in Washington, is nothing to sneeze at. But it is an important proposal in terms of the direction in which our country goes into the future. If we accept this proposal of a two-year extension for the richest people in America, I believe that will eventually become either a long-term extension or a permanent extension. If we accept the proposal that lowers the rates on the estate tax, which benefits only the top three-tenths of 1 percent, 99.7 percent of Americans get nothing. But if we give them what they want, I believe 
that over a period of years, it will lead to the complete abolition and ending of the estate tax, which will cost us a trillion dollars over a 10-year period. So I would hope that this issue is not one that just progressives or moderates feel strongly about. I would hope that honest conservatives who in their heart of hearts believe that this country is seriously endangered when we have unsustainable deficits and a huge national debt, that they will tell their elected officials here in Washington not to pass a legislation, piece of legislation, which increases the national debt significantly and, in fact, will allow for the permanent over years, in my view, extension of these tax breaks. So that is what this debate is about. It is about, fundamentally, whether we continue the process by which the richest people in this country become richer at a time when we have the most unequal distribution of income and wealth of any major country on Earth. And as I've said earlier, Mr. President, this is not an issue that is discussed. I don't know, well, I do know why, you know. Uh, it, it's just not an issue that, that people feel comfortable talking about because they don't want to give a front to their wealthy campaign contributions, contributors or take on the lobbyists uh, that are out there. But that is the reality. Throughout the entire world, the United States has the most unequal distribution of income, top 1%, earning 23.5% of all income. That, Mr. President, is more than the bottom 50%. And that is not just immoral, it is bad economics. Because if the middle class gets crushed entirely, who is going to be buying the goods and services produced in this economy? So this piece of legislation, as important as it is unto itself, and it is very, very important, is equally important in terms of what it says about where we are going into the future. Are we going to protect the middle class and working families of our country? Are we going to make sure that every young person in America, regardless of income, has the ability to go to college, or are we going to allow college to become unaffordable for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of bright young people, or else force them to leave school deeply in debt? Are we going to create a health care system which guarantees health care to all of our people, high quality health care, or are we going to continue a situation where 45,000 Americans die each year because they don't have access to a doctor? Are we going to invest in our energy system so that we break our dependence on foreign oil? We spend about $350 million a year importing oil from Saudi Arabia and other foreign countries, almost a billion dollars a day, which should be used to make this country energy independent, which should be used to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel into energy efficiency and sustainable energy, technologies such as wind, solar, geothermal, and biomass. So Mr. President, and by the way, none of that is, has been addressed, as I understand it, in this proposal. So my point here is not just that this proposal is a bad proposal as it stands before us now, but it is going to move us in the future in a direction that I do not believe this country should be going. I, I mentioned earlier that my own personal family's history is the history of millions and millions of Americans. My father, as it happened, uh, came to this country uh, at the age of 17 without a nickel in his pocket worked hard his whole life, never made very much money. But he and my mom, my mom graduated high school, she never went to college. But they had the satisfaction, a very significant satisfaction, of knowing that their kids got a college education. My older brother, Larry, uh, went to law school. Uh, and I graduated from the University of Chicago. And 
I think what's going on in this country and why the anxiety level is so high is not just that people are worrying about themselves. Parents worry more about their kids than they do about themselves. And what parents are sitting around and they're worrying about now is they're saying, will for the first time in the modern history of this country, my kids have a lower standard of living than their parents? Will my kids earn less income? Will my kids not have the education that I have? Will my kids not have the opportunity to travel and, and, and learn and grow as I have done? Are the best days of America behind us? That's really what the question is about. And I don't think that has to be the case. But I will tell you, as I mentioned earlier, if we are going to change the national priorities in this country, if we're going to start devoting our energy and our attention to the needs of working families and the middle class, we have got to defeat this proposal. We've got to defeat similar type proposals which come down the pike. When this country has a $13.7 trillion national debt, it is insane, nothing less than insane, to be talking about huge tax breaks for people who don't need them. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier, ironically, you got a lot of these millionaires out there who apparently love their country more than some of the people in this chamber. You have some of the richest people in America, Bill Gates, and all the good charitable work he does, Warren Buffett, and many others who are saying, you know what? I'm doing just fine. I'm a billionaire. I'm a multimillionaire. I don't need your tax break. I'm worried about the fact that we have the highest rate of childhood poverty. Invest in our kids. I'm worried that our infrastructure is encumbering. Invest in our infrastructure. I'm worried that 45,000 Americans are dying this year that don't have access to health care. Invest in health care. I'm worried about global warming. Invest in transforming our energy system. These are patriotic Americans. They are rich. They love their, they love their country. And now what they are saying to us is we don't even want it. We are giving people money who in some cases don't even want it. And I know, I do know, that there are others out there who do. And I think, Mr. President, if there is one issue that we as a Congress and as a government have got to address, and that is the extraordinary level of greed in this country. We have got to stand tall and draw a line in the stand and simply say enough is enough. How much do you want? How much do you need? How many yachts can you own? How many homes can you have? Isn't it enough that the top 1% now earns 23.5% of the income of this country? How much more do they want? Do they want 30%, 35%? Isn't it enough that the top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 90%? How much more do they need? Mr. President, I mentioned earlier when I talked about the situation that got us into this horrendous recession, and that is the collapse of Wall Street. And I talked about what I think most Americans understand very well, and that is the incredible greed and recklessness and dishonesty that exist on Wall Street. We must not allow ourselves to encourage and continue the kinds of greed that we have seen in recent years. It is an abomination that the people who caused this economic crisis, the worst recession since the Great Depression, that the people who caused it on Wall Street are now earning more money more money than they did before we bailed them out. Earlier today, I was reading some emails that came to my office from Vermonters who were struggling to keep their heads above waters. And they were just terribly painful and poignant stories about honest and good and decent people who are now choosing about whether or not they should put gas in their car or buy the food that they need or buy the prescription drugs they need. Not just a Vermont story, it is an American story. And that is the reality out there for tens of millions of Americans. 
So in my view, we can negotiate a much better agreement than the one that President Obama and the Republican leadership did. There are some good parts of that agreement which obviously should be retained and perhaps even strengthened. And those include, of course, making sure that we extend unemployment benefits to those who need it, and of course that we extend tax breaks for the middle class. And there are other, some very good other provisions in there which I think are, are very worthwhile. But I think if the American people stand up and agree with those of us who say no more tax breaks for the very wealthiest people in this country, we can defeat this proposal and we can come up with a much better one that is fairer to the middle class of this country and is fairer to our young children. I do not want to see our young kids, my children, my grandchildren, have a lower standard of living than their parents. That's not what America is about. So, Madam President, what I think we have got to do is defeat this proposal. I think we have got to urge our fellow Americans to stand up and say no to tax breaks for those who don't need it. I think we have got to work in a very serious way about creating the millions and millions of good-paying jobs that this country desperately needs. I personally believe that far more effective approach than giving the variety of business taxes that were in this proposal at a time when corporate America is sitting on $2 million of unused cash. They've got the money. I think a much better approach, as I said earlier, is investing in our crumbling infrastructure. I think that makes us healthier and stronger as a nation for the future and in the global economy. And I think it creates jobs quicker and in a more cost-effective way than these tax cuts. I think also, Madam President, that it is high time, high time that the American people uh, move, they want us to move in an entirely new direction in terms of trade. Uh, I am always amazed how Republicans and Democrats alike, and I speak as the longest serving independent in Congress, come election time, I see these ads on television, oh, we've got to do something about outsourcing. We've got to do something about our trade policy. But somehow the day after that election, when corporate America continues to throw American workers out on the street, moves to China, moves to other low-wage countries, somehow that discussion ceases to exist and that legislation never seems to appear. So it seems to me, Madam President, that we have got to defeat this proposal uh, that in defeating this proposal, we are going to tell the American people that there are at least some of us here, some of us here who understand what our jobs and our obligations are, and that is that we are supposed to represent them, the middle class of this country, and not just wealthy campaign contributors or bow to the interest of the lobbyists who are all over this place. You know, Madam President, when I talked a moment ago about the need to invest in our infrastructure as a way to create jobs being more cost effective than some of these business tax breaks, I'm looking right now at a Wall Street Journal article, uh, December 9th, 2010. And here's what the article says. Companies, headline, companies cling to cash. It's the headline. Companies cling to cash. Coffers swell to 51-year high as cautious firms put off investing in growth. It's a story by Justin Lahart. Here's the story. It makes the point that I've been trying to express here. Corporate America's cash pile has hit its highest level in half a century. Rather than pouring their money into building plants or hiring workers, non-financial companies in the United States 
We're sitting on 1.93 trillion in cash. I said 2 trillion, I stand corrected. 1.93 trillion in cash and other liquid assets at the end of September, up from 1.8 trillion at the end of June, the Federal Reserve said Thursday. Cash accounted for 7.4 percent of the company's total assets, the largest share since 1959. The cash buildup shows the deep caution many companies feel about investing in expansion while the economic recovery remains painfully slow and high unemployment and battered household finances continue to limit consumers' ability to spend. Well, what have we been talking about all afternoon? This is the Wall Street Journal, frankly, not my favorite paper, but that is what they are saying, is that the way you're going to get the economy moving again is to put money in the hands of working people who will then go out and buy the goods and services that these companies produce. I have my doubts about whether or not these tax breaks will, in fact, have the desired result. But as I said earlier, and we'll say again, I think the most effective way to create jobs, the most important way to create jobs, is to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. And that is our roads, our bridges, our rail systems, our water systems, our wastewater plants, our dams, our levees, the need to improve broadband, to make sure that every community in America has access to good quality broadband, has access to cell phone service. Unfortunately, as best as I can understand, uh, there has not been one nickel, uh, one, nickel one nickel appropriated uh, in this piece of legislation, uh, this proposed legislation, which would go to um, infrastructure improvements. So, Madam President, I think that this proposal should be defeated uh, because it is not a strong proposal for the middle class. It is a proposal which gives much too much to people who don't need it. And it is a proposal which I think sets the stage for similar type proposals down the pike. And I, I apologize to anyone who has been listening for any length of time, and I, I know that I've been, to say the least, a bit repetitious. Uh, but the concern here is that when the President and some of my Republican colleagues talk about some of these tax breaks being temporary, we're just going to extend them for two years, talking about this payroll tax holiday being just one year. I have been in Washington long enough to know uh, that that assertion just doesn't fly, that what is temporary today is long-term tomorrow and is permanent the next day. So I fear very much that this proposal is bad on the surface. I fear very much that this proposal will lead us down a very bad track in terms of more trickle-down economics, which benefits the tricklers and not the ordinary Americans. So I think that it is a proposal uh, which should be defeated. But, Madam President, uh, the point that I want to make is that is not just my point of view. I think it should be defeated. I think we can do a lot better. But I've got to tell you that the calls that are coming in to my office are – here's what we got today, I guess uh, – 2,122 calls oppose the deal, and I think um, 100 calls are supportive of the deal. So you can do the arithmetic on it, but that is at least 95 percent of the calls that I got today are saying this is not a good deal, we can do better. And I know that in the last uh, three or four days we've gotten probably now six or 7,000 calls that say this. And this is not just Vermont. Uh, and some of the, many of those calls come from out of state, by the way, not just from Vermont. Uh, but I think that is true all over uh, this country. Um, so, Madam President, um, let me conclude, and it has been a, a long day. Uh, let me simply say, 
that I believe the proposal that was developed by the President and the Republicans are nowhere near as good as we can achieve. I don't know that we are able ourselves to get the handful of Republicans that we need to say no to this agreement. But I do believe that if the American people stand up, and by the way, it may not just be Republicans, there may be some Democrats as well. If the American people stand up and say, we can do better than this, that we don't need to drive up the national debt by giving tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires, that if the American people are prepared to stand and we are prepared to follow them, I think we can defeat this proposal. I think we can come up with a better proposal which better reflects the needs of the middle class and working families of our country, and to me, most importantly, uh, the children of our country. And with that, uh, Madam President, I would yield the floor.